Um, those of you, thank you, Sunday. Those of you who were listening to the radio today know that there was a meltdown on radios all over New York City with the panelists who uh, stepped forward into our microphones today. At one point, I had to check to see if it was still on the air because they were going down some very serious business. And it's some business that deals out of a dimension that relates to what I call the information age. I've made a statement that many of you have heard before that in the information age, what you don't know can kill you. And what we're beginning to see is that there are people who understand that in the information age, what you do know can build you. And as we begin to build this pyramid of consciousness, people are getting very upset. They're getting extremely upset. I saw a phenomenon take place before I went to Kemet with Dr. Ben, where an eight-page article came out on me in a magazine called Harper's. This is a magazine that you really only see if you happen to be in your business office. And that's the only way you would ever read it, you know, basically. Because it's not a magazine directed to our community at all. If you were in your doctor's office or your dentist's office, you might happen to see it and you might pick it up by accident. So this was an eight-page piece in which they attempted to analyze my show. At one point, the writer said that I had the unique ability to make people angry without ever raising my voice. <laughs> he, he called it the only radio show with an ideology that life is a Darwinian struggle for racial advantage. It is, and he was right. We understand that. We're very, very clear about that. Life is a Darwinian struggle for racial advantage. There are things that people have not wanted us to know. They are scared to death that we know now. Today on our broadcast, at one point, you know, when I'm, when I'm in the middle of that thing and I'm sharing my thoughts and I'm in the middle of it, it has a, it, it, it's, it's, it's like lightning bolts that are going on, you know, and the brothers are gnawing and I, oh man, you see that one, you know? And what's great is, is that I can see the brothers and sisters because we have the live audience and I, I see them get short. Many of us have experienced. I've been the beneficiary just as many of you have over the last several years of a tremendous amount of information that has changed me, it has changed my life, it has transformed my consciousness. Uh, we are approaching the 21st century. Why should we think that we're going to operate with the same information as brothers and sisters who preceded us? It is our obligation to surpass them at all that they do, at all that they do. But we can only do it through the efforts of brothers and sisters who somehow manage to figure out in their life survival plan how to put the kind of concentration together that ultimately results in the books, ultimately results in the lectures and the dialogues and so forth, that when we hear them, we find that we can listen to them for whether it be 30 seconds or 30 minutes or three hours and literally have our consciousness completely transformed. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the names that we have here tonight. Dr. John Hendrick Clark, Dr. Yeah. Amos Wilson, and of course, Attorney Alton Manners. I've had a lot of reporters come to me lately. I started seeing, oh, this is the same show we've been doing, you know, the past seven years or so, you know, and I've been to New York now. I, I found out recently, which was interesting, I have the longest running black radio program in the history of New York in 22 years. And, um, I always have to tell people in terms of Reverend Sharp, and that's the last letter when I was five, you know, so, <laughs> just a young brother, right? Um, but what, what has happened is, and what we're beginning uh, to observe and beginning to see, is that radio as a medium can be used in ways that we haven't used it before. I was a DJ for a number of years. And when I attempted to start doing the things that I was doing on the radio at that time, I did them because I just wasn't satisfied. I couldn't keep playing 22 minutes of music in a row and 58 minutes of this and that. So we 
got to do something because this is too valuable a tool. I've been very blessed and very fortunate that because of brothers and sisters like yourself, I've been able to maintain that kind of position. 1971, when I was in danger of losing my position for doing some of the same things that I do today, it was H. Rap Brown who called the general manager of the radio station. It was the Black Panther Party who called it until they burned the station down. <laughs> So I, I know how I'm there. I know why I'm there, and I made a very specific. Thank you. My dedication is to my community. My dedication is to the global black experience. And that is what we are doing. Now, you know, I had these. I had. Uh, let's see. Ooh. 60 minutes sent over, three reporters. I said, who? <laughs> 60 minutes? Huh. What are they here for? No cameras, what is this? They wanted to just sit, hang out <laughs> at the radio show. They were just there to hang out, they said. They just wanted to just kind of suck it all up or something, you know. Governor Cuomo called in the middle of the broadcast that they came. And Paul called with Reverend Sharpton, sitting right next to me. And they were having a conversation. And you know me and I like to talk. So we just talking back and listen. Somebody had me to me for him to do this. Oh, Reverend Sharpton, um, uh, Gary, the governor is on the line. He wants to come on back to talk. This is right in the Crown Heights situation. So I said, hey. okay. So I just said, Reverend Al, I said, uh, you down with this? And he said, Sure, no problem. It's okay. I said, well, tell the governor he can join us in the conversation at one o'clock right after the news. So the message came back to me, and as this message was being given to him, it walked Reverend Herbert Daughtry and then turned into Colin Ball. Now, they look at Colin, you know, they were just coming to hang out, you know. <laughs> and so I said, well, let's send a Another message to the governor to let him know that my other guests are Reverend Herbert Daughtry and Attorney Colin Moore and Reverend Sharp, and he can come on and he can talk and say what he has to say. And I would like to tell him. The governor said that he didn't want to have a conversation with them, he just wanted to talk to me. <laughs> you come into my living room, I have members of my family, not guests. And you say you want to just talk to me and not the members of my family? No kind of disrespect like that. Not today. Not today with who we are. Not this time. But, but the point I make here, though, is, is that the divide and conquer tactic was at work in the moment. Now, CBS came to ask me these questions, and where did this show come from? From out of space somewhere. The next day after CBS came, Peter Jennings' World News Tonight called. They sent a camera crew. Two weeks after that, the New York Post article came out. Harper's, CBS, ABC, the New York Post. So now I know what that means. We're talking about target practice. But I want them to understand I'm protected by a much higher force than they've ever come to understand. <laughs> I began to try to put together, going into the Crown Heights situation, what was our experience? What was our person? Why did people think that it just happened at Crown Heights? Why did they think it was one single incident that, that made the black community say, enough is enough? Why were we saying no justice, no peace? Why did we keep saying that? So when the reporters kept asking, I said, you know, I need to write something, you know? And I wrote a little something, which will introduce our program for this evening because it deals with the very subject that we're going to talk about, which is global white supremacy. This is no justice, no peace. Just a bit of it.
see your face in the crowd. Yo, brother, man, you looking proud. Sister love, you got it too. I wish they all could be like you. We are people with a job to do. Struggle to us is nothing new. It's going running through our minds with images of every kind. Cowboys and Indians, we all rooted for them to win. Hells, we were proud to fight, but they never did try to treat us right. Hair had to be like theirs, thin no blue eyes, and oh so fair. School, where there was no book with people who looked like you. Time and time again, there were those who tried to do us in, but survived with it. And here we are, we had to come from very far. And now we say that this must cease. With no justice, there is no peace. We say, no justice, no peace. Check it out. Racism must cease. Then he say, no justice, no peace. We got to take it to the streets. Now check this out. No other people around the world have had their family stolen girl across the land or over the sea. The branches of our family treat me too. Have a homo cost and millions gone were killed and lost. They didn't come by invitation. They were brought here to build the nation. We slave and work this land. I'm talking about the Africans. The ones their ships went out to raid. The ones of those land never paid. Now we, the children of the sun, are the new generation under the gun. We watch today on TV news as groups of angry and sick Jews storm into a police station, suffer no kind of retaliation. For a single black man in that situation, and he be dead by a vaccination. No justice. We say racism shall cease. We say no justice, no peace. Indeed, it's time to take it to the streets. And that's what it's about, brothers and sisters. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. And when we say racism must cease, we are talking about global white supremacy. Let's begin our program tonight by introducing our very distinguished panel. They are all very honored brothers. We start with the first, who is our honor elder, Dr. John Henry Clark. Yeah. Yeah. In relationship to uh, what took place today and what we began to do, with, most of you know the format. Our programming today and this evening is going to deal with this particular subject of global white supremacy uh, from three different perspectives the historical perspective, the psychological perspective, and the legal perspective. They are all very much tied together. We'll begin the proceedings this evening with Dr. John and Ricard on the historical issue of global white supremacy. Thank you very much. One of the main reasons we don't understand is that we don't understand white people and we don't understand how old we were when we discovered the in the world that identified itself as being white. We had already built enduring civilizations. The pyramids already there. Now that is civilization already there. There was peace. There was no wrong. Before 
before we knew that there were people called white. For years, no people in the world were identified by a color. White people as white by identification is the creation of the 15th and the 16th century. I don't mean they began to exist then, but they began to identify themselves by color then. Yellow people were not identified as yellow. Black were not identified as black. And the first inkling of intelligence we know came out of Europe about 1250 B.C. A piece of folklore, the Odyssey of the Iliad, written by a person named Homer. We're not too clear whether Homer was man or woman. <laughs> Living in those caves, the caves are kind of dark. Yeah. They would develop a gender situation different from a tropical people. Who live out into the light. Right. So now, <laughs> my point is that if you built enduring civilization before you knew he existed, they the basis of the world religion, the basis for science, the basis for social thought, built systems more pleasant than anything called socialism, built social order better than anything he later called Christianity, built it without a dogma and without a book. You didn't proclaim it to be so. You just built it out. Once you proclaim something to be so, I suspect you don't believe it. <laughs> now, so the African never said, in his, in his spiritual way of life, I am my brother's keeper. He just kept it. That people had no state. That people had no specific name. That people being raised in cold and ice developed a temperament. A temperament that would later threaten the whole world. An icebox temperament. <laughs> Just like the Arab developed a sand temperament. <laughs> Slave traders. We will not deal with this. And I'm not dealing with it tonight, but I'm saying that there are too many closed doors in history. We got to open an exam. <laughs> What interfered with this African peaceful way of life? Well, there was no jail because no one had ever gone to one. No orphanage because no one had ever thrown away children. That's right. No old people's home because no one ever threw away grandma. <laughs> what happened with the country of farm? I'm trying to deal with now his discovery of us and what he discovered about us is something we still do not know about ourselves that fastens him on our back and makes him distrust our nation 
our family life, our individual relationship, one to the other. We have always been, and we still are, the world's richest people. There have always been people coming from state, stingy climate who wanted to take what we had without paying for it. <laughs> and so to take what we had without paying for it, they've got to establish a rationale to say that we are less than other human beings deserving less consideration. These same people will adopt a religion and say, God is good, God is kind. But they will solicit their God to assist them in oppression, therefore making God ungodly. Because all organized Western religion, and that includes Judaism, Christianity and Islam, a male chauvinist murder code. They've always used religion as a rationale for taking away the freedom of other people, infringing upon their up the rights of other people in the name of their God. Therefore, taking the godliness from their God and making him a partner in that crime. Right. Right. Now, the same people came out of scarcity, and the ice people came out of scarcity. They would launch an assault on a some people who had plenty because nature had favored them. <laughs> they would create concepts. The concept of the chosen by God. And if you say God chose you to do something for another people over and above or other people, then God is a bigger. <laughs> <laughs> then if you say, if another one say, I will declare a holy war on you because you don't belong to my faith. That everything within my faith is in a board of peace, and everything outside of my faith is in a board of war. Then you see, God is a cutthroat and a thug. came among a people who had a different way of life. This may pain, may be painful to you to know this, but I say to the everlasting credit of African people, they gave the world no religion. <laughs> people gave the world is higher than religion. They right. gave it universal spirituality. <laughs> all religion, no exception, all religion were taken from the universal spirituality created by the God. The anger 
is against the poor use they made of these religions. Right. There was nothing basically wrong with creating these religions. There's something wrong with what they did with it. Because all of them indulged slavery. Exactly. No child. No child. If God is grace and God is love, then God is not an endorser of slavery. Right. Now, how then did he come out of this ice box and in his much he had? Organized religion, organized society in Western Asia, North Africa, great city states down the coast of East, East Africa, organized cities in inner Africa, the Sudan, coal mining. We read so few pages of a book, and they just read a whole book once in a while. <laughs> just read, just pick up one of Shakespeare's ideas of books and read from cover to cover. J.C. DeGrasse Johnson's little book, African Gold, you can read that in one evening. <laughs> and Professor Joseph Harris took Africa in there. His African people in that history, you can read that in a good long evening. So no one's hiding this information from you. And I'm not telling you anything that I didn't get from books and documents gathering dust and library that's open to you as well as me. Now I'm trying to put this in some kind of sequence. At what point in human history did we see someone who would later call themselves European? I maintain that the Greeks and the Romans have no just claim for being European and that Europe assisted them in no way in coming into being because at the time of Greece and Rome, there was no Europe. There was a single European organized state. Yet every Scandinavian schoolboy can claim Greece and Rome as part of his intellectual heritage. Egypt stretches 4,000 miles into Africa because it is a Nile Valley civilization and not an Egyptian civilization. Yes. All right, all right. And if people came from the south, because the Nile Valley was a great culture highway, and Egypt is physically in the body of Africa. So the dispute about Egypt not being African and being white makes no sense in the part of global white supremacy because this inactive, insecure man who hadn't thought out from the icebox must claim things that didn't belong to him. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now, let us, for the sake of conversation, say that Egypt was white. <laughs> <laughs> Egypt stretches 4,000 miles in the Come on. Egypt emerged when the, when the ice age was just thawing out in Europe. While these Europeans come from under the ice, go all the way to Africa, build the pyramids, go back into Europe under the ice. <laughs> before they build a shoe for themselves. It don't make sense. So if Egypt was white, 
It got it working from the south. It got a lot of material from the south. And the interaction between these white Egyptians and these black Africans going on 3,000 years, could they still be white? <laughs> Just for a conversation, I make them white. <laughs> and even that don't make sense. <laughs> My main point is that with the emergence of Rome and Greece, you better stop thinking about Rome and Greece as being part of Europe. Because there wasn't no Europe before it to be part of. There was no function in Europe. Rome and Greece began to appear at the time the ancient African world was about over. Europe was not a part of the ancient world. Europe emerged at the beginning of the present modern world. And if you read a work called Europe in the, in the Modern World, Coltson and Palmer, they said there was no Europe in ancient times. Now, who was there to feed Rome and Greece? The Mediterranean nations got their impetus from islands in the Mediterranean, Crete, Menons, Western Asia, and from Egypt. And finally, they got themselves together. And once they got themselves together, just at the time, Africa, after nearly 10,000 years of civilization, was in decline. They got hungry. And like a spiteful child, turned on its intellectual mother and father. Now, global white supremacy started with the smug nets and the arrogance of the Romans and the Greeks. They were better intellectually, but while saying better intellectually, they were still sending their children to African school. Right. After Rome, after Greece got it underway, Africa had several suffered several invasions from Western Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East. And one of the last of these terrible invasions, 550 BC, the Africans cried out, oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show mercy. <laughs> now, when the young Alexander knocked at the door, Weary of Western Asia conquerors and having no concept of race or color as part of that culture. He walked right in. He was a conqueror like all conquerors. He was a raider like all of He raided the greater of Egypt. And while there, the first thing he noticed is that Africa was the home of the Greek god. Zeus and Apollo came from that. He wrote his mother, at last I've come to the home where Greece started. He recognized it, said, put it now and began to steal from the African library and send it to his schoolmaster, Aristotle. Right. Aristotle took, rearranged these books and put his name on it and said they have to lay the basis for Greek philosophy. Right. Now he's called the Greek stealing white supremacy through the colonization of other people's culture and calling it their own. Right. They would do the same thing with countries. Finally, Alexander 
and his group loses power after beginning something which we have not discussed. It is disaster among us sometimes, but we don't even talk about it. Bastardization. Begin to bastardize, blacken down, lighten up the complexion, create a generation with a confusion between whether they, be, whether they should be loyal to their mother's people or their father's people. We still got them around. Don't know the way home, go knock at their father's door and say, you don't belong to me. <laughs> he sighed you, but no, got no home in your father's house. They come among us and expect special privileges. And most of the time they get them. We're not too clear sometimes as to who's loyal to who. Now I'm not dealing with, when I deal with bastardization, I deal with the physical bastardization, but I also deal with the mental bastardization. I know blacks who are black as tar, who are stone traders. Wow. You can mutilate the mind, you can mutilate the body. One is as bad as the other. Now, the Roma came into Africa in an act of genocide the destruction of Carthage. No reason has been given in history for the destruction of Carthage other than the fact that the Romans wanted to control this great commercial city. Now we see the projection of this uh, supremacy in the Mediterranean. This is almost the rehearsal for global white supremacy. The Romans finally began to talk among themselves. Carthage must be destroyed. Yes, Carthage must be destroyed. Good morning, Roman. Good morning, Roman. Carthage must be destroyed. Roman said, yes, Carthage must be destroyed. Good night, Roman. Carthage must be destroyed. Yes, Carthage must be destroyed. Ain't nobody said why. <laughs> finally, when they pushed Hannibal back and destroyed Carthage, they had to have Carthaginians to try to help rebuild it. They'd never seen a city like this. They'd never seen Vardar, water preserved. And the Romans not only destroyed the city, they put salt in the land, plowed salt in the land to keep the crops from growing. The Romans so accustomed to killing people, start killing animal life. This drove the elephants in the all the animal life, titan, lion, out of North Africa. They had to go deep into Africa to find lions for the arena. The Romans began to laugh at people, <coughs> practicing the basis of an early religion called Christ early European formation called Christianity. Now you have to separate Christianity as practiced by the Africans 3,000 years or more before the coming of Christ. And you're eventually going to have to get up enough nerve to separate Islam from Africa and Arabism and make a clear distinction between Islam and Arabism. A whole lot of people didn't make that distinction. The Arab is a racist dog. That's right. <laughs> and a slave trader. That's right. yeah. White wannabe sometimes are worse than whites. Yeah. <laughs> we got to deal with other white wannabes. Right. Because every white wannabe tries to improve his condition with the white by proving to them they can hold us in check. Right. Right. Certain ethnic groups are assigned to hold us in check. 
and they get that brownie point with white to the extent they can do that. Now, these Romans began to persecute people called Christians. They began to have fun, entertainment, killing these Christians. Then finally one day, a Roman emperor looked down in the arena and saw his uh, uncle be among the Christians going to be killed. Was he, well, he's crazy anyway, let him go. <laughs> <laughs> the next Saturday, he looked down at his wife and son was like, uh -oh. stop this show. <laughs> <laughs> they had joined the religion. Constantine, a degenerate, right. exactly. made Christianity the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire. Now you you got such, if you're so sacred now, thin skin, I'm trying to prove to you that a lot of white, global white supremacy came through the religions of the world. Judaism, Christianity, and a special, and a special rationalization for slave trade came through Islam. Exactly. I'm saying that none of these three religions have proven to be our friend. <laughs> in their invasion of Africa, in their influence in Africa, they misinterpreted the African interpretation of their religion. Instead of affecting a wedding between themselves and Africa's interpretation of the same religion, they turned on the African interpretation exactly. and enslaved his mind and subsequently enslaved his body. Exactly. Everybody that came into Africa did Africa more harm than good. Right. <laughs> the African never understood these people. Didn't understand them then, don't understand them now. When Christianity became the religion of the Holy Roman Empire, Rome declared war on the African Christian for the control of the church. It's a little known war in history. My point is that global white supremacy manifests itself in that no matter what they believe and say they believe religiously or politically they are going to be in charge All right. All right. and that racism does not stop at the door of communism or socialism or Christianity or Islam or Jewish. I'm not asking you to discard any religion that you belong to. I'm telling you to convert everything that you belong to into an instrument of liberation or throw it into the ash can of it. As the major sufferers of racism, you should not belong to racist institutions or rationalize about any of it. Now, after the Roman mismanagement of this church reached the point of disgrace until the African Christian turned on the Roman Christians, there were more Africans killed in the arena, in the amphitheaters of North Africa than in the arena in Rome. You know about 
the arena in Rome because Caesar B. the Mills have told you about it. <laughs> but nobody made any great movies about all the murder of the African Christians. Wow. Right. Wow. Now, after this period and the corruption and the fight, the internal fight within the Christian church in North Africa, Byzantium, Southern Europe, and Western Asia, the African grew disenchanted over the mutualization of a religion he had created. A camel boy delivering goods for his uncle began to grumble and talk to other camel boys. He was not a great reader now. Most people do not know that most of our gods could not read and write. Buddha might have been an exception. But I didn't say he wasn't brilliant. A whole lot of brilliant people can't read and write. And then he asked for reform. Had he gotten reform, he might have been satisfied. Failing to get reform, he called for a new religion. This new religion was Islam. Africans saw that Islam, a new force, would help them get the Romans off of their back. They were right. Islam got the Romans off of the Africans' back, but replaced the Romans on the Africans' back. And yet, the African was the military arm of that religion almost for the first 1,000 years of its existence. It was an African general that would take them into Spain, Jabarao Tarak, a Tarak Benazak, with two Africans, Zaid bin Harik, the first military man of the faith, Bilal, the first Mazum, a the caller of the prayer, who the prophet wanted as his successor. How different this religion would have been had this Ethiopian taken over the faith. Now, the Africans and the Arabs had pushed the European out of the Mediterranean. He's going to block the European into that Mediterranean for the next 800 years. Founded as grumbling within Europe itself. They are hungry. And it's all beat. Peter the Hermit began to complain about the Arabs preventing them from going to the holy places, see the holy grail. So they're going to rescue the holy grail. But the holy grail itself, which is another myth, was in danger. Now was it lost? <laughs> Now the basis of the crusade is this. The Catholic Church, in raising money for those big cathedrals and all that gold piping where the priests live like gods, were fleecing the people. And they created something called purgatory. <laughs> Grandma is not in hell. Grandma is in purgatory. So you give them so much money, they're going to pray grandma from purgatory into heaven. <laughs> it was a religious racket. <laughs> and when it pinned up, when the pulse pinned up inside of Europe to, to, to turn on the church for it, the crusades came and Europe had a drain off. So the Pope let them march. And they go marching across Europe and they forget their case. This might be a stereotype, but it's almost like a black man sometimes when he gets angry with you, I say, avoid him 24 hours, he might forget about it. <laughs> but we're passion killers. <laughs> we don't kill you in a hurry, we might forget about it. <laughs> now, this crusade.
crusades, these crusades, mostly raping parties, the famines and the plague left Europe drained, left Europe hungry. They had forgotten longitude and latitude. They would learn this from the University of Salamanca where the Africans and the Arabs had preserved the maritime skill coming out of China. The Europeans would take this information, build ships again, and turn on the people who preserved it. They were on their way to Asia and discovered big Africa in the way. They would begin the sanction of the slave trade. Now, a little known sailor said that for 23 years I sailed up and down the Guinea coast. What Christopher Columbus doing up and down the coast of West Africa for 23 years? Before, before 1492, he was in the Portuguese slave trade. The Europeans came down the coast of West Africa taking slaves, taking, trading in commodities at first, then slaves. But it wasn't much for the slaves to do between the time they entered in 1438, the time they took the first large number of slaves out in 1442, after 1492, it would get on the way. But 1455, in the dispute between Spain and Portugal, after the Africans had lost a great part of Spain, Africans and the Arabs, the Pope would say to Spain and Portugal, you are both authorized to reduce the servitude all infidel people. Now we see the church sanction of what's going to become global white supremacy. Most of the infidel were black. They came down the coast of West Africa looking for an emperor called Prester John. An African Christian who they thought would help them. Having not found them, they would turn on the very Africans that they said in their early journals was as civilized to the mark of their bones. Now this dirty trade is getting underway. The slave trade would rescue the economy of Europe and install white, global white supremacy. All right, all right. It would introduce the plantation system in the Caribbean island. Its brutality would start the revolt in the Caribbean island. It would start a concept of scientific racism. They would again turn to the scriptures to justify racism. Most of the sea captains were not only racist, but they were Christian races who get a load of ships and pray for a good wind to take them away. And one of the famous hymns in the church, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sound, was written by a slave man, a, a slave captain. Now you can see now how Christianity was recruited to justify the partnership between the European and his religion and the enslavement of the African. You can see how the chosen people concept was a rationale for the Hebrew corporation with the trade. The rationale is to clear your consciousness. Right. It's like the Mormons said that we have no souls. So if something's done to you, if you have no soul, then no, no guilt. There's no guilt to declare you a people without a soul. 
and to create a rationale that I'm doing this to spread enlightenment. <clears throat> Many of the Catholics would sprinkle them. Now my point is that after 1600, the world would never be the same again. England had entered the trade. The Pope had justified the trade from the point of view of the Catholic Church. Scholars had began a concept of scientific racism. The European continued the racism started by Rome and Greece. And this would continue until the fight against slavery was not a fight against slavery for benevolent reasons, but because it became unwieldy and everybody who could afford one had one. And they were breeding them in any way. England was never sincere in this uh, regard. In the United States, Slavery was basically a New England business. The South had no ships to send to go bring back any slaves. The Yankee Clipper outran the British ship, and this is the basis of the War of 1812. <coughs> now, I'm going to try to sum this up because I feel the Baptist preacher and me getting the best of it. <laughs> 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 we do not idly take any of this. In the United States, we had a hundred years of slave revolts. In the Caribbean island, they had more than a hundred years of slave revolts. Only their revolts were more successful than ours because they had a culture continuity. You might not think it looking at Caribbean people and listening to Caribbean people today. They have a great revolutionary heritage when they're running to other people's bloodstream. In the United States, we fought longer and harder. But there was no victory for us because we were surrounded all the way. Of all the Africans away from home, this black American had the hardest fight and still have the hardest fight and have the least understanding. <laughs> and have the least understanding from other African people of his plight. We have to rise each morning and beg for the right to live to the end of the day. <laughs> Europe dumped its human garbage can into the new world. Right. The worst of that garbage can was dumped into the United States. Right. But at the end of the 19th century, slave, 100 years of slave revolt in the United States, 100 years of rebel revolts in the Caribbean island, 100 years of anti-colonial revolts in Africa, the African world began to come together at the end of that 19th century. H. Sylvester Williams began to develop a concept of pan-Africanism. The Caribbean island began to demand a some form of constitutional government. The great literature of solidification and self-identification was coming from a large number of Caribbean scholars. They had been coming to the United States since the early 18th century. <clears throat> they did not identify themselves as Caribbean scholars. We did not call ourselves names. We did not identify islands. We stopped boasting about where the slave ship put us down because all of us were sure of where the slave ship took us from. <laughs> All of us came fighting and bleeding and hoping from that magnificent 19th century into the 20th century. And while we have not understood ourselves as well as we should in the 20th century, that we have not understood that 19th century that was the basis of pan-African nationalism. I see no hope 
of overcoming global white supremacy for African people except a world union of African people throughout the world. and a third dealing with uh, European diagnoses. But our main magnus opus will bear, as it, at this point, the working title, Educating the African-American Child for the 21st Century. And that's a working title. We're going to offer you about five or 600 pages of real working advice for getting our generation ready to end white supremacy. I want you also to look forward to some communications, flyers from the Pan-African Research and Development Foundation and its subsidiary organization called, uh, for now, the African Scholarum. We have just uh, acquired a new space on 138th Street in the Bronx. And from there, we will enter a phase of economic development. And we will discuss and develop theories and approaches in terms of international economic development military strategy, and other very practical and real political means of overcoming the situations that we are in. 
We're going to ask you in the future then to join with us over there to develop, to build a loan fund and an economic fund. Brother uh, Maddox anticipated me today when he talked about the central bank. <laughs> we were already uh, moving in that direction and the whole bit. So uh, stay tuned. We are very much, we at the Pan-African Research and Development Foundation are very, very much concerned with combining scholarship, combining research with very practical results. And those of you who have an interest in, in putting your knowledge to work, I hope then you would look forward to working with us. We're gonna talk a bit today about the effects of white global supremacy. And as I mentioned this morning, we are now dealing here with what I might call the effects of white galactical supremacy in that the European has entered the space race and is expecting to duplicate in space what he's done on this globe to colonize space itself and to carry his racist orientations into the very universe. I've often talked about this phase of European development in terms of what it means for Africans and what African and an Afrocentric education must be about. The European of Star Wars, we have a situation here today. With all types of exotic weaponry. We spoke this morning about psycholinguistics. And it's interesting that the European calls Star Wars strategic defense initiative. And this has deceived many people. Against whom is the European defending himself in space? <laughs> what, what we really must recognize here is a strategic offense, offensive initiative. The European placing weaponry so far above the earth that no other nations can meet him there and destroy those weapons. It means then that the European will place himself in a position to rain weapons on the African continent and of African people with impunity. African flying jet planes and so forth will not be able to stand up against this type of warfare. This is why I've often urged people to understand that the education of our children and the education of ourselves goes beyond preparing for jobs. It speaks to the defense of our very lives. And therefore, African education and Afrocentric education must take us into the space age, where we must get, again prepare to fight a battle of liberation. We see here, and some years ago, I saw magazines called Commercial Space, the European already exploring the commercial uses of space, the mining of planets. I've told people if you're in the transportation business, you should already be planning uh, transportation to and for from the moon and other planets. If you're in the trucking business, you have to now start thinking about trucking uh, merchandise, people and other wares to the planets. If the European is able to find minerals and other kind of wealth on the planet, he will not, on other planets, he will not even have to pay the African for the wealth that he steals from him today. We are seeing here then a situation where the European is seeking to gain supremacy over the total universe. 
His drive for total control has not been subdued by any means. He is seeking to control life itself. If you read the New York Times this week, Monday, October 21st, 1991, you'll see on the front page, U.S. seeks patents on genetic codes, setting off furor. Health agency bypasses normal procedure of waiting until Gene's role is known. So here people want to patent the very sources of life themselves, the genes. And to make people pay for licenses to uh, derive benefits from their functioning. It states here, in a move that has set off an international scientific furor, the federal government is seeking to patent hundreds of human genes be knowing, before knowing what role they play in the body. <laughs> so just as they are planting the bag on the moon, before they know what it contains, they now want to plant a flag on the very basis of human life, the genetic codes, before they know what they are all about. And it goes on to talk about courts having allowed researchers to patent human genes, which means, of course, in essence, the European wants to create new forms of life and old patents on those new forms of life. But until now, researchers have applied for patents only after they have determined a gene's role in the body and its potential commercial uses. In a sharp departure from the pra that practice, officials of the National Institute to some Health applied in June for a patent that would cover rights to 340 pieces of genetic code, most of which have yet to be deciphered. Officials said they may soon apply for a second patent that would cover an additional 1,500 se uh, sequences. Although genes are products of nature, the courts have ruled that a gene may be patented if it has been isolated and purified in a way that is not found in nature. <laughs> a very interesting situation here. But top scientists in the United States and Europe say they fear that the move could start a scientific version of a land rush. So you see again how history just repeats itself in new forms and new shapes. But the basic orientation continues. With billions of dollars at stake, for the same motives, <laughs> billions of dollars at stake, in which governments and companies race to claim territory on the sets of genes that govern everything in the body before actually unraveling the secrets of this human genome. <laughs> so what do we have? The United States and Europe still trying to claim the bodies of all people and, and claim the very basis of life itself. As they say, the French say, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And we see it going on and on again. What is white supremacy? We'll look quickly in, in, in the light of our time situation here to George Fredrickson's definition viewing white supremacy as referring to the attitudes, ideologies, and policies associated with the rise of blatant forms of white or European domination over non-white populations. It's very, uh, very important that we understand the nature of this thing we call white supremacy. Related to that definition, of course, is the one dealing with racism, I think best expressed by David T. Wellman in his book, Portraits of Racism. Racism can be seen to systematically provide, and this is why it is not going to pass away until we destroy it ourselves. It, cannot be, it can be seen to systematically provide economic, political, psychological, and social advantage for whites at the expense of blacks and other people of color. The determining feature of race relations is not prejudice toward blacks, 
but rather the superior position of whites and institutions, ideological as well as structural, which maintain it. We don't have time to explain this particular definition, but I think it's very interesting uh, in that it speaks to an issue we often get caught up on, and that is one of viewing racism as an expression of attitudes, as an expression of stereotypes. But racism moves far beyond stereotypes. Whites can refuse to express stereotypes and, and racist attitudes in public and still maintain their positions of supremacy. In fact, as they secure their institutions, as they secure economic control, as they secure technologically superior, technological superiority, they reduce quite often their racist invective. However, their supremacy and control over the lives and destinies of African people continues, if not really increases in its potential. Therefore, we cannot waste a lot of time in looking at racism as mere expressions of attitudes and mere expressions of stereotypes. We must look at the very organization of European society itself as the basis for white supremacy. The very structure and functionality of European institutional structures and legal systems and other ideologies and our believing in those ideologies and our believing that we must submit ourselves to those laws that maintain supremacy. For we'll find, as I have warned audiences before, that white racism at some point will appear to be faceless and that it will not be immediately obvious, but it will still continue to operate. Racism is most more effectively analyzed as a strategy for the maintenance of privilege than as prejudice. If we view racism as a culturally sanctioned, and I'm still reading Wellman here, rational response to struggles over scarce resources. And this is the thing I wish we had time to talk about today. And I talk about this often in terms of what it means to be a man and what manhood means and what men are developed for and the role of men in the world. Because we have to recognize the fundamental fact that people have to struggle over resources, and men must be prepared to win those struggles for their people. Right. Yeah. And we have to keep that in mind. And we can account for its widespread character and avoid the inconsistencies and meaningless distinctions that arise uh, when it is viewed as prejudice. In other words, Racism is about the distribution of wealth. It's about the First, I want to kind of give an account of myself for not being here next week and to let you know that I won't be loafing <laughs> because I don't even know how to loaf. In fact, I need a lesson in knowing how to rest, let alone loaf. I will be in Durham, North Carolina 
delivering a lecture on a panel. This is the 20th anniversary of the publication of Hal Cruz's book, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. And I will deliver a paper on the crisis that Hal Cruz neglected. Because Hal Cruz wrote a very interesting book, a very personal book, but he did not deal with the real crisis of the black intellectual. The real crisis of the black intellectual started a long time ago and it's still there. The crisis of uh, not studying the intentions of other people toward us. The crisis of welcoming in future conquerors without knowing they are conquerors. The crisis of making bad alliances and uh, no alliances at all. And the crisis of letting other people come into his house and take down the good things about him, his religion, his culture, and sometimes his wife, and get away with it. We've been all too kind to people. Hal Cruz writes about the 20th century. I start at the 18th century, B.C., and work straight up. We made a whole lot of mistakes in choosing friends and in choosing religions that were ours in the first place. People take the basis of religions from us, go away and dress them up and come back a few hundred years later and sell them to us as something new. We don't know it was ours in the first place. You should really read St. Augustine in his comments after the conference at Nicaea, when the Europeans took over Christianity and began to whiten it up. He said the whole thing made him laugh. These people are trying to give us a religion we had 3,000 years ago. And we had not only one Christ, we had many Christs, many deities. And I want to deal with the inability of a lot of African scholars to really deal in depth with the Hebrew entry in the Bible itself, a Jewish survival book, a book of wisdom. I'm not doubting that, but a book that the creators deserted because they dare not have the temperament to obey what's in the book. We might yet be the last humanitarians in the world because we were the first humanitarians in the world. We have a crisis around integration. We should have asked for justice and let integration take care of itself. Had we asked for justice and been selective we would not have integrated ourselves out of existence in so many different places. Many of the black colleges are being taken over in the name of integration, especially the black state schools. The black state schools are being overrun with inept white teachers who can't teach any other place, and they go into black schools and do no teaching and get paid for it. We misunderstood what it meant to be with them. We quite forget that some of us are far more competent than some of them, especially in some areas where we've been the masters in the field of teaching and in the fields of sciences, in the field of basic mechanics. I think this is a subject that needs to be dealt with because there's a reoccurring crisis. There's a crisis of ideology in our life. We always choose in other people's ideologies and neglecting our own. This is why Ghana is not the great example nation that it could have been. 
not the great beating heart of Africa that it could have been. I'm a great admirer of Nkrumah, but he chose too many outside ideas and outside advisors, and he neglected the advice of his great school teacher, schoolmaster, Joseph B. Danqua, who kept telling him, you can have a modern state, but you need a traditional African state, and you need traditional African values. And he kept saying that um, as for socialism, there's only scientific socialism. Nothing is scientific that fails to work for you, no matter what, who, who people call, what people call. Now, one thing our intellects have not learned that nothing the European mind ever devised was meant to do anything but to facilitate European control over the world. The European wastes no time in humanity or sympathy. He wants to control and he will control by any means necessary or he will destroy. He shares nothing with nobody. He never enters into partnerships with other people. And if you think that he's going to enter into a partnership with you, no matter what he calls himself, capitalist, Marxist, or socialist, or anything, he came to control. Under any guise, he must control. And once you understand that, you have to understand, no matter what religion I belong to, no matter what denomination I belong to, no matter what political ideology I follow, my people must always be in charge of themselves. They must be the masters of themselves. And any ideology, any religion, anything that fails to serve that purpose is a waste of our time. All our energy needs to be converted into that. And this is the confusion of what we call our intellects. The role of the teacher, the intellect, the preacher, the role of any kind of leader is to make sure his people know the time of day, the political time of day, the emotional time of day, and the historical and cultural time of day. Make sure his people are trained and how to face reality. And if you face reality right now, you will realize that you are living in a society that is dying. The society is not only dying, the society intends for you to die with it. They'll take you down with it that you have within your own mind and within your own body the ability to make a whole new world. But you have to stop answering to stupid names like Negro and uh, minority. You ain't no minority. There's only two people on the face of this earth that might have a billion people, the Chinese and us. When you count all of us, including those millions in the Pacific, millions throughout South America, the Caribbean Island, the United States, and Africa, we might have a billion people. Somebody say, minorities. Answer to minorities every time somebody's going to give away some money. <laughs> Anytime they're going to give minorities something, you become a minority, get the money. After that, <laughs> go ahead and be the majority that you are, because that's what you are. All right, now, didn't mean to digress that long, but in as much as those other people don't own me, I figure you do. And I have to... <laughs> <laughs> So I have to kind of let you know what's happening to me when I'm acting. I'm not copping out. Because when I had a stroke a few years ago, 
from 82, I turned to African people and I got from my sisters and brothers the strength to pull myself together, get out of that bed and get back on the road again and to fulfill my mission as a teacher. I never want to be called leader because I have a hard time leading my two teenagers when they were teenagers. <laughs> Only 122 right now. I sure have never led my wife. So that's, that's out. <laughs> so, I'll, so I'll confess my failure as a leader. But as a teacher, as a community activist, I think I've inspired a few students to do some good because from my classroom it's come, has come three ambassadors, almost 20 doctors, three doctors in Harlem Hospital right now, former students of mine, the night uh, um, uh, chief of pediatrics at hospital in Syracuse, one of my girl students came up to me at Hunter College and says, Professor Clark, I was in your class in the 70s. I said, yes, ma'am, what are you doing now? I thought she was some little mouse housewife. <laughs> and she said that <laughs> I'm a chief of pediatrics at hospital in, uh, in Syracuse. Another student of mine is chief of abdominal surgeon, surgery at Denver General Hospital. So I was sent out there a whole lot of people with their minds pretty straight who rendered some, some service. And so I don't mind being the property of a people because I think service, especially to your own people, is the highest calling. And to be a teacher. <laughs> So I don't mind you asking me, well, if you're not going to be here, well, what are you going to be? <laughs> That's your responsibility. <laughs> Ain't hanging out now at your age, are you? <laughs> Give an account of yourself. What are you, where are you going to be? That's family. Yeah. And the other folks ask me, I get insulted. But you ask me, I feel you just interested enough and care enough to want to know where I am. All right, let's get into the lecture on the Civil War and its aftermath. Let's look at the period that we're talking about. We're talking about the middle of the 19th century, the 1850s. This is the period that we're talking about. This nation that failed to get a rebirth during the constitutional conferences have now been offered a chance to straighten itself up and be born again. Slavery and immigration is spreading to the western part of the United States. And some of the poor whites who didn't benefit from slavery are saying, we don't want that out here. And not because they love blacks, because they didn't, but they didn't see any benefit for them in having slavery. So they said that as we move to the West and make new nations in the West, we'd rather do it without slavery. And besides, we can do our own labor. They were poor people. They couldn't afford slaves anyway. And so when they opened up Kansas, the poor whites of Kansas began to fight, began to fight against slavery because they did not want to create still another slave state. And they call it bloody Kansas. And a lot of blacks went into Kansas 
because they thought that they wouldn't be slaves. But some of the slaveholders and those with the power to enforce their will had gone into Kansas and had set up shop there trying to create a new slave state in Kansas. These are blacks who went into Kansas, it was called exodusters. They did not exit from the United States, but <coughs> they exited from their homes within the United States. Now, among us, we had not settled the problem of whether we would or would not stay in the United States. This was the period of Martin Delaney, the period of Robert Campbell, the period of blacks sending delegations out to Africa to look for a place for settlement. It was a period of another shift in population. After the American Revolution, it was discovered that over 5,000 blacks had fought against the United States with the British. And they became unpopular when the British lost the war. So the British had to get them out of here. The British had sent them to an icebox called Nova Scotia. And they, the part of that community is still there. But some of the blacks rebelling against this cold climate asked to be sent elsewhere. So they went to Sierra Leone in West Africa. Liberia is just being open, and so many blacks from the Caribbean, some from the United States, are now going to Liberia. Liberia was officially opened 1847. Now what we're trying to look at are the events in the African world on the eve of this war. In South America, the two great states brought into being by slaves, especially in Brazil, had now been more or less broken up or fragmented by the Portuguese, Palmeiras and Bahia. At Palmeiras, they had fought, and not only fought lo so long, and it started before the American Revolution, blacks had discovered a republic. And no blacks preached about anything called democracy, but when the whites came into Palmeiras, when they agreed to let them in, they treated them with democracy. They didn't say, here, look, my mom treating the white man like with democracy. They just went and treated him with democracy. See, we don't preach about something. If you believe something, you don't have to announce it. You just do it. And they just did it, and ultimately, one of those whites would betray them, and the rest of Palmeiras was destroyed. Now, Uz, uh, um, Bahia, the other state, had been beaten to its knees and surrendered. That, that is still a predominantly black area of Brazil. In the West Indies, especially Jamaica, the pivotal state island in the West Indies, the pivotal political island in the West Indies, two islands, Jamaica and Haiti. These are the islands that literally determine the direction of the totality of the Caribbean. Jamaica was not at a standstill but the rebels in Jamaica had fought for many years. Haiti was already free, having 
been free in the set begin in the 1700s in that 20 year period became free but i'm saying that africans in the whole of the world were inspired by the haitian revolution the haitian revolution over now and the mulattoes who were to ruin Haiti with a French constitution in power now. But blacks still remembered there was a time when blacks drove out whites and established a republic. And except for the offsprings of the whites, that republic might have endured, but no one impressed them with an African mode constitution but with a French constitution. Now what you need to read here, if you read French and part of it's been translated, the Rochambeau papers. Rochambeau came into Haiti so called tame the blacks. And Rochambeau had played up to them, but he hated both the mulattoes and the blacks. And in a fight against him that he won after the mulatto generals favored the French, hoping the French would give them favors over the blacks, Rochambeau played a trick on the mulatto generals. He had a ball and he invited the wives of all these generals. And at the end of the ball, he escorted them into a room to stand by a box. I got a present for you. And they opened the box and the heads of their husband was in each box, which proved that no one gains with the internal struggle by thinking you're going to lighten your load by betraying the others. Now, finally, a black general drove out Rushambo. But Haiti fell again into the hands of the offsprings of the French. While the Haitians spoke a language that is Creole, part French, part everything, there was a group of human beings called Creoles who were Haitians and black. Now, Haiti, by the middle of the century, is no more as a vibrant inspiration to the African world because their constitutions are so mangled, and those who had been educated in France spent so much time trying to be French. They couldn't be African. Now, 1850, in, Haiti, in Jamaica, the Jamaican Colors has an excellent book on it. Uh, Mavis Campbell, who's also just given us a recent book on the Maroons. And who, she's really one of Jamaica's finest woman writers one of the finest writers, period. Uh, great researcher. Not the easiest person to get along with because she's a, really a black English woman. <laughs> and her values are that of an English woman. But she is a master researcher. She'll trace a fact down like a hound dog until she find out what the beginning and the end of it. And when she come up with it, ain't nothing left to be found that she, don't, <laughs> she hasn't got. She's been working five years on this one book on the Maroons. She even called the Maroons my Maroons. 
she owns them. <laughs> oh, no. But now, 1850 in Jamaica, we're dealing with the period that led to the Civil War all over the world. In Jamaica, that group tried to make a deal with the English that if you favor us and give us certain basic privileges, you won't have to worry about the blacks because we will protect you from the blacks. The British didn't give them the deal. Then the British had some second thoughts about it because many of them now joined the blacks and began agitation with the blacks. By 1865, the Jamaicans understood that their emancipation was a phony, that you be emancipated, now you're free man. You got to take care of yourself, your clothing, your family, and everybody else. All the things now you got to do for yourself. You got no job, no other island. You got no other island to go to. So you have to go back to the same farm where you were a slave to get a job. The planters got the best of the deal. Now this caused more anger. And this anger would reach fruition around 1865 in the Moret Bay confrontation. But my point is, on the eve of the Civil War and as an aftermath of the Civil War, African people were consistently in revolt. Now in Africa itself, the Zulu Wars had started, having started early in the 1800s. Chaka had lived and died, having died in 1828. Chaka's successor, Dingong is now in power. Dingong, you, people think of Chaka, the great Zulu, as opposition to the whites. That means you misread history. Chaka never fought in the whites. Chaka fought blacks to consolidate blacks to save the country for the blacks. Had he won, there'd been no South African problem because there wouldn't be nobody in South Africa but black. But he didn't win. And his successor and assassin, half-brother, took over. And he began the opposition to the whites. The Dutch, who wanted to move away from the coast and to find a separate republic on the other side of the Vale River called Transvaal. They did establish the Republic, it's still in existence. But before that, they had to defeat Dengang, who had stopped them three times. Now the British realized that if any African defeated any whites, all whites were in danger. Now, the British hated the, the guts of the Dutch then and now, but the British came to the defense of the Dutch against Dingong. And Dingong met them on the Bell River, gave a splendid account of himself, but shields and spears are no match for cannons. But Dingong butchered so many bodies and threw them in the river until the river streaked with blood and they renamed it the Blood River. But now, with the help of the British, the Dutch defeated him, drove him into exile, 
1838, and he died 1840. So now, with the death of Dingon, the British would bring to power a puppet, M. Pande. M. Pande violated all the rules used to govern a Zulu king. He married into, into families, wasn't designated for the king. The king had to marry to a certain family. Certain goods raised from birth to be wise of the king. He didn't marry them. He married other women and he changed them regularly. He was a fat beer drinking slob. <laughs> and he was so ignorant, the British made out his death warrant and put it before him and he signed it. But in the 1870s, this weakling produced a strong son, and his people overthrew him in favor of the son. His name, Ketchewayo. It was Ketchewayo that reorganized the Zulus into a fighting force and met the British, literally defeating them in one of the decisive battles for the control of South Africa, the Battle of San Helvina, made the mistake many Africans make. He went to England after that to see the Queen. <laughs> and while he was in England seeing the Queen, the British broke his country up into 13 different parts, and he couldn't communicate with them after that. He subsequently died. The main point is to point to events in the African world on the eve of the Civil War in the aftermath of these events. The British in Ghana, then called the Gold Coast, decided that they would uh, take the religious ornament of the Ghana, the most sacred of all, the golden stool, brought by a great priest, a Kumfu Enochi. But the British decided they would take it because they said the spirit of the Ghanaian people rests in the stool. And the priest told them, if you lose the stool, you lose your soul and the people will die. The British hearing of this legend decided the best way to break the spirit of the Shanty people is to take the stool. Now, they had tried first in 1805. A young governor named, named McLean decided he would go up and show the British he can take the stool. The king, Osara Tutu Kawamine, sent word back, if you come up here, I will send your head back to the coast on a silver platter. So the fool kid did come to Kumase, the headquarters of the Santi people, and Kwamene did cut his head off and send it to the coast on a silver platter. He expected war. And this was the beginning of the Asante Wars that lasted through the exile of Prempe where the British burned down Kumase twice and still could not defeat them. But the last in the series of wars did not end until 1901, led by a woman, Ye Asantiwa. She held the British at bay for nine months, asking no quarter, giving no quarter. She laid the basis for modern Ghana because once she was exiled, having been defeated by the famous Caribbean regiment, called the, then called the West Indian Regiment, she wasn't defeated, but when she saw them, she thought her brothers were coming from the West to help her. 
So she told her soldiers, oh, our brothers from the West coming to help us at last, none too soon. <coughs> she didn't know that they were in the pay of the British and they were soldiers of the British. So one flank opened fire under a white lieutenant and another flank refused to fire so we didn't come here to fight our own people. But after this she gave up. The British exiled her to Seashell Islands in the Red Sea to join her cousin Prempe. But the, a young Ghanaian politician, Casey Hayford, started a campaign for the return of the exiled kings and queens. And out of this campaign, he converted it into a campaign for independence. In 1931, when he died, he called for his successor. This is a custom in Africa to train your successor. He called for JP, that's John, Joseph B. Donqua. Joseph B. Donqua is the man that trained in Kruma originally. And the one who sent in Kruma money to London to come home when he found that the student was graduated to colleges, and, but he was broke in London. He's the one that sent in Kruma money to come home, Joseph B. Dunqua. Joseph B. Dunqua had built the political party out of which Nkrumah would take the CPP. That's a bigger story, and there's other time to tell it, but Nkrumah really took the young people out of the convention, out of the Gold Coast Convention, United Gold Coast Convention, and formed the Convention People's Party. That angered his schoolmaster. All right, now, <coughs> In North Africa, another drama unfolding, the results of the Ottoman occupation of Egypt had left Egypt saddled with a royal family of Armenian and Turkish descent. And among the outstanding leaders, outstanding or famous but not righteous, a man named Muhammad Ali. That was his name. Same as the fighter. When I brought this up to Muhammad Ali, I said, do you know you've taken the name of, of an Arab, of a, of, a, of a slave trader? He said, well, Elijah Muhammad gave me the name. Elijah Muhammad needed to read some history. <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad Ali was a slave trader and the man that tried to destroy all of the old objects of Egypt. Don't give me no old bones and stone. Give me something new. Had no respect for the ancient history of Egypt. Egypt then had invaded the Sudan where the Muslims of the Sudan of another Muslim group told the Egyptians, your dogs and running dogs of imperialism and that you poor Muslims, ally will strike you dead. You know, that you violated our faith because no one Muslim is supposed to turn on another Muslim. And you've done the sacrilegious thing by coming down here trying to conquer the Sudan. Ultimately, the, the, the Egyptians got stuck in the Sudan and the British had to rescue them and subsequently the British ended up ruling the Sudan. So all over the world, we are fighting. Wrongly or rightly, but we are fighting. In the West Indies, in this country, in Africa, nobody is sleeping doing this 
period. Nobody slept during this century. This was a century of greater black alertness than we have right now. And yet, this is the time when a great Caribbean scholar left St. Thomas and St. Croix, went out to Africa to find his African relatives. Not only found them, but found the condition under which they were enslaved. His name is Edmund Viltmont Blyden. Blyden went back to Liberia, where he became president of Liberia College. And in his famous inaugural address, 1881, he called attention to some of the tragedies we have not finished addressed ourselves to, to today. We strive to be those things most unlike ourselves. We feed grist into other people's mills and don't take care of those things that belong to us. He said, this is our, he said, nothing comes out except what has been put in. Then this, he said, is our great sorrow. So now, at the middle of the, ni uh, of, of the um, 19th century, we're facing an ideological conflict. The independent church is getting underway because we want to distinguish ourselves from African people we stopped calling ourselves African people, and though when we found the independent church, we called the independent church African. African Methodist Episcopal, African Methodist Zion, African Cutter, African, but African. And our comedians were called the African rascals and the Ethiopian clowns. We were not afraid of the word African. Now we began to use the word color, which could mean anything or nothing. And later on, the word Negro, which is not a word for people at all. Some lazy Spaniard or Portuguese took a descriptive adjective and made a noun out of it, slapped it on the people. When you answer to what you are not, you become what you are not. Richard B. Moore, in his little book, uh, The Name Negro, Its Origin and Evil Use, said, slaves and dogs are named by their masters. Free men name themselves. So the proper name for a people must always relate to land, history, and culture. And any time anyone calls you by a name that hasn't got Africa in it any place, they have called you out of your name. And you are offended, or should be. Now. We are solving some of these problems and we are creating new problems. But we are, all, we are looking on while white people have an argument, and we've done this before and we're still doing it. Like some blacks said, our astronauts. We still hear conversations among whites, and we assume that they're talking about us. They ain't even thinking about us. The Constitution, the Constitution said we were three-fifths of a man. And nobody ever said that we are not. What and why must we pay taxes if we're not even full human beings? 
we can make a good case for not paying taxes. Because I don't think we're ready to test it. <laughs> One day some wild man who don't care much for God or the devil <laughs> is going to put it to a test. You don't care what comes after just as long as it's tested. I make a good case for blacks not having to pay taxes. Besides, you collected it already. All those 300 years, you didn't give me no salary. You got your money. <laughs> All right. Now, on the eve of the Civil War, slavery is an emotional issue. The Douglas-Lincoln debates the talk with Frederick Douglass himself, still alive. Slavery is an issue and a debate. But the real issue leading to the Civil War was not slavery. These northern city slickers who came here with a little money and the southerner didn't come here with nothing, not even a decent rag on his body. I have said before, Europe dumped its human garbage can into the so-called New World. The worst of that garbage can was dumped into the United States. Now, in the South, debtors, prisoners, women from wash houses, nobody. Marrying Anglo-Saxon women whenever they would, so they can call themselves Anglo-Saxon, looking for a social status from some place. Slavery and cotton took them out of their degradation so fast that they were dressed up and didn't even know how to use a fork. Didn't know what to do at a banquet. Now, these Southerners that had grown rich on our back <clears throat> now had a conflict. The Northerners wanted the Southerners to become furnishers of raw material for the North. If the Southerners asked, and rightly so, Inasmuch as the cotton is here in the South, why not put the textile mills down here? The New Englanders say, oh, no, we got mills up here. You send the cotton up that wheel, John. We'll take care of the furnishing, the finishing. You just take care of the producing. Some of the great forests were then in the South. A lot of the wood the building materials were coming from the South. The South was a furnisher of things. The embryo of American industry was just getting underway. Most of the coal was coming from the South. And the South wanted a share of the wealth of the country. And when the northerners, liberal types, underwrote the work of the Quakers trying to take the slaves away from the southerners, the southerners said that you are northern hypocrites. You sold me the slave, made money from it, and you used part of that money to try to take the slave away from me. I said, no, I'm no, not going to do it. It was not that the South was more principled than the North. It was not that either, neither, neither one of them had any principle. They have none now. <laughs> it's just up South and up down South. The country is basically the same. But the moneyed people who sell in the United States, escaping persecution, 
so-called, their words, generally settled in the New England states. The poor whites of Europe generally settled in the South. Now they got a footing out of slavery and the exploitation of a lot of white slaves too, especially Irish and Slavs and some Germans. Slavery has gotten them out of the barrel. And now they've found a voice. So this argument continues until some hot-headed Southerners files at Fort Sumter. Now look at the South. This is this, this, look at the whole situation because really this is a family fight between whites and whites. It's not much of a civil war because now the Southern candidates, cadets at West Point, had the choice of choosing to fight for the South or to fight for the North. Most of the Southern cadets decided to return home and fight for the North, fight for the South. Now, the South fought like hell in the South, gave a splendid account of themselves because they had no place to go back up against the wall, fighting an industrial part of the United States that could outproduce it. Now, people began to make opportunities out of this wall. Several families began to sell to the North and the South and laid the basis of their fortune selling to both. And among those who made fortunes was the former governor of New, United, of, of New York City, Herbert Lehman. Herbert Lehman's family. A lot of families, a lot of people sold to both sides. Now, the South did not want black troops. The North didn't want them either. But things got so difficult, the South began to have black quartermasters, I mean laboring troops, wagon masters, quartermaster just to deliver food and keep the supplies. He's a few were fighting men, but only a few in the South. But in New England, they raised several regiments, grew in the famous um, um, black regiment from Connecticut and the, and the like to distinguish itself, distinguish itself so well that in one battle, that regiment won 16 Congressional Medals of Honor. It has never been done before or since because America decided that blacks, even if he was brave, he, he would not be warded that way ever again. To the extent that an order went out that no blacks would get the Congressional Medal of Honor during the Second World War. And nobody got it. It had nothing to do with bravery. If you were to get the Congressional Medal of Honor, then your commander must write you up and recommend you for it. And no white commander would dare inasmuch as a secret order had been circulated in the army against the idea of giving blacks Congressional Medals of Honor. And this is why. There's a little known stipulation in the Congressional Medal Award that any Congressional Medal 
of honor winner can on demand ask to address the combined houses of the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives. No one ever did it, but they fear that if it was ever going to be done, <laughs> maybe a black will get up there and speak his piece. <laughs> and there's nothing in law they could have done to stop it because that is part of the stipulation. And then in the, in the war in Korea, most of the blacks who got it, got it posthumously, I mean, after they died. In the war in Vietnam, three who got it, most of them were crazy. One was in the medics. He went to see Eisenhower. I saw him on the news wheel. He said that I didn't win this medal for my country. I didn't win this medal. I didn't win this medal for my company. I didn't win this medal, you know, for, uh, for my country myself. I won this medal for my country. <laughs> he said, I said, that fool, that fool ain't going to be no harm to nobody. <laughs> Another one went back to Detroit, having won the medal, and blacks razzed him so, said, what you over there killing those little brown people for and getting a medal? You think you big stuff. No Vietnamese ever called you nigger. What you killing them for? And just to prove he was brave, he started holding up grocery stores until finally one man beat him on the draw and he went on to meet his maker. So those that did get it didn't turn out to be much. All right, now back to the Civil War. Because a whole lot of blacks fought in the Civil War, fought exceptionally well in the Civil War, won medals, saved companies. And Abraham Lincoln himself said, and this is in... Um, one of Lincoln's uh, diaries, except for the blacks on the Potomac, guarding the Potomac, the Southerners would have taken Washington. Blacks guarded that capital and guarded it well. Guarded it so well until one night Abraham Lincoln was coming home and for some reason didn't have his stovepipe hat. So he challenged the president at the gates of the White House. Who goes there? He said, President, president of what? <laughs> <laughs> he said, president of the country. You don't look like no president to me. Where's your hat? <laughs> Turned him back. Finally, the captain of the guards came and identified Lincoln and led him in the White House. The next morning, Lincoln, thinking that this soldier might be punished for such treatment, Lincoln had literally recommended he be promoted for doing his job so well. Lincoln said, if he stopped me from going in the White House, I know no spy can get in here. <laughs> so Lincoln ordered him to be promoted that next day. But... Uh, Blacks gave a splendid account of themselves, not only in the war, but there was another side of the war. Blacks served as spies and agents. Among those was Sojourner True, I mean, uh, Harriet Tugman, who had gone into the South and freed any number of slaves and never let a slave turn back. You things get rough, they want to turn back and go back to the plantation. She said, I'll kill you right here first. Ain't nobody going back. I'll kill you and bury you right here. She followed the stars in the skies until she got them. And 
And so, when the war was over, Lincoln was reluctant to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Wrote several drafts. Finally, it was signed. He freed the slaves in states where he had no control, but he didn't free them in states where he did have control. He freed them as a tactic to weaken the South and hasten the end of the war. He had said if he could save the Union and free the slaves, he would do it, and if he could save the Union and hold the slaves, he would do it. We were not an issue. Our, our freedom was not an issue. Now, he issued his Emancipation Proclamation, wasn't even popular with his cabinet, wasn't popular with the country. Where would these slaves go? In parts of Texas, they did not even get the news to the slaves, and they did not become emancipation, emancipated until June the 10th. This is why you've got a, the only black holiday in the United States that is celebrated is Juneteenth in Texas. If you want to get drunk and curse out a white man in Texas, do it on Juneteenth. He lets you get away with it on that day. That's your emancipation day. The rest of the week, you straighten up. <laughs> <laughs> but now, we were facing new problems and some old ones. Some of us could vote now. After Lincoln was shot, there was some wonder about what would happen to us, had, what would have happened to us had Lincoln lived. <laughs> Lincoln had a plan of getting us out of here, and he said that he did not believe any of us could behave in social company equal to white. So if you want to know what would have happened had Lincoln not been shot, and I'm sorry he was shot, <laughs> but he would have at least tried to get us out of here because he didn't think we were suitable to the new climate in the United States. And I'm not talking about the physical climate, I'm talking about the political climate. And after the Civil War when he address some Southerners to show how he was still a Southerner at heart, the first thing he said was, let the band play Dixie. Now, if you want to know who made Lincoln a great hero, you did. You were the ones who hailed Lincoln. White caricatured him and spoke of him lower than they speak of dogs. You hailed him as the great emancipator and you, as a, you joined the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln and, you know, and followed Mr. Lincoln's party, you know, and were under, not going to deviate. And one of our great orators, Roscoe Simmons Conklin, all of you must be too young to remember the great Roscoe Simmons Conklin, world's greatest orator. I thought he was the greatest showman. He always ended his speech and said that I have but one party. It is the Republican Party. I have but one race. It is the human race. And having hailed Lincoln, he would sit down amid great applause, frock tail coat and all. <laughs> great Roscoe Simmons Conklin. But we hailing Lincoln as the great emancipator gave Lincoln 
a presence as a hero in America he otherwise would not have. And the first person to write a favorable book about Lincoln was an Englishman. John Drinkwater wrote a favorable book about Lincoln. Now the ambulance of books about Lincoln as a folk hero began to flood the country. But after he was shot, unfortunately, a President Johnson, who was almost impeached, except for one vote, he would have been impeached, he was so inept, couldn't understand anything, misunderstood Lincoln's instructions, and he would have done us in, but he didn't have any, enough intelligence to even know how. So he continued some of the programs already on the book, not knowing that they didn't believe in those programs in the first place. Now the Freedmen's Bureau was set up, a bureau for the freeman, Freedmen's Bank. For 11 years, we enjoyed pseudo-democracy. We had congressmen, 23 in all, and males, probably more males for one time than we got right now. Not that any of them of any value to us. Symbolically, yes. Males, Gavesta, Texas. Males in the Deep South. Blacks were head of treasury, I mean treasurers of state. In North Carolina, they had a majority in the House for a brief uh, period. We made the mistake that we nearly always make when things are partially good. We don't plan for the time when they won't be good anymore. Now the blacks united with the poor whites in the South and they introduced some of the best legislation ever introduced in this country because the blacks had no money for private schools and neither did the poor whites, they introduced the basis of the American public school. And we know, what did these black legislators do? The Southerners maligned them, so they came into the legislator eating peanuts and, you know, with a flask of corn liquor in their pocket, which has never been proven to be true. The whole birth of the nation bit. But these were some able men. George Eliot, Brown Eliot was an able man. I mean, there were some great, not only some great legislators, some great orators, and some great thinkers come out, came out of it. Out of this same menu, out of this same atmosphere came Pinchback, who was Lieutenant Governor of New Orleans, Louisiana, and briefly governor of Louisiana. I mean, some able, able men. Out of the same group came two senators, both from Mississippi, best known Blanche Calsco Bruce. Bruce, after he was no longer senator, then he was register <coughs> of the treasurer and going home on a Jemco train, but they, they hadn't broken, the Jemco starts at Washington. And so he was in Washington, and they, they hadn't broken the cars down, so blacks would be in one section, the whites would be in the section. So he was sitting there, and incidentally, his old slave master was talking to another old slave master, I wonder what happened to that little young slave I had named Bruce. Smart as a whippersnapper. Well, no, didn't know what happened to him. Had a little education, too. Don't know how he got it. Bruce sitting behind him. Bruce took out a dollar and showed them. That's what happened to him. He's now Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> <laughs> 
ended the mystery, ended the conversation. But we were so busy celebrating this pseudo-integration, this experiment in racial democracy that a whole lot of people didn't mean. And this could come about because the, the Southerners who were in political power during the Civil War, who brought on the Civil War, were now barred from political office. Barred from political office, this gave some poor whites and blacks an opportunity they never had before. And together, they began to make the legislation that would change the South. Then certain black and white organizations began to emerge on the eve of the time when the old God Southerners would be permitted to return to public office. The Colored and White Farmers Alliance, that's what frightened them. Just like Martin Luther King's Poor People's March on Washington, taking both white and black poor, frightened the nation, and they ended up killing him. Now blacks were, were, were advocating a union between poor blacks and poor whites, and the poor wh whites were going for it. What could they lose? They were poor. That status wasn't much better than the slaves. Now a political thing would happen. During the election campaign of Rutherford B. Hayes and Tilden, horse trading would take place and an exchange for the Democrats the Democratic vote, the re radical Republicans turned conservative and said that if you vote and throw the election for Hayes, we will pull the troops out of the South and let you handle the Negroes as you see fit. They elected Hayes and the horse traders kept their promise. They pulled the troops out of the South. They gradually began to dismantle the Freedmen's Bureau and the Freedmen's Bank. The promise about 40 acres and a mule was withdrawn. We were on the edge of some dark days in this country without any friends, any place. In the midst of this, we had to build institutions. We had to get a college education. We had to literally borrow teachers from New England, the New England school mom period. This is the period when a group of white women in New England, the first educated white women in the New England states, White men in New England, mostly non-college graduates, didn't know what to do with a college-bred woman, didn't know what to say to her. Can't chase her to the kitchen, because all he thought of a good the woman was good for was the kitchen, the church, and the bad children. Now, these educated white women began to retreat, move to the South in large number to teach in the new schools established for blacks. Sometimes the Ku Klux Klan burned down the school. Some of them persisted. Some of them gave up, married Southerners, and became Southerners. But this was a period that tested us as we've never been tested before. This is the period 
when we had a dynamic ministry, a more dynamic church, the period when we gave up old troubles and took on new troubles. And I'm saying the caliber of black man and woman that came out of that last part of that century called the nadir or our darkest hour speaks well for us as a people, speaks well for any, any people. And if we in the 20th century knew what they were up against and how they fought and won some battles, losing some, Odds we never faced, odds we could not even believe. But these were the valid men and women of caliber. Or not only in this country, but in the Caribbean island and in Africa. No TV to expose them, no, no, nothing, no help. No press releases against all kinds of odds. They gave this people the strong shoulders and the ability to move down to the end of the 19th century and the ability to enter the 20th century. These were our men and women of valor. And in the period after the Civil War, this was our finest generation. Thank you. Dr. Clark will, as, uh, uh, as is customary, um, take questions. Um, we'll give him a chance to, to rest up. And while I take the opportunity to, to make some announcements, um, those of you who have questions, uh, please line up early because just in consideration for Dr. Clark, uh, I do kind of arbitrarily cut off the questioning and, and people always, people always entitled AIDS and the African American community. I always find that AIDS is, is for most of us, for most people, a exciting topic when it is here, sit here. Sit, sit. Okay. that AIDS is an exciting topic when we're talking about it within the framework of uh, Dr. Welsing and, and uh, bad blood, and many of you know much of the, the, the literature and the, the rumor that is circulating in our communities about the management of AIDS and the like. And we get very excited about AIDS in that regard when we can point a finger and talk about the conspiracy that exists. May or may not be true, I'm very familiar with a lot of that material. And I believe a lot of that material. But as uh, Dr. Amos Wilson said several weeks ago from this same podium, now that that's our belief, now that we, we understand that there may be a management aspect of AIDS, what do we do about it? It is still here. Well, our health division is addressing that problem from a what do we do about it perspective, from a management perspective, from, from a perspective that, that sets aside the origin, but says we have a critical condition in our communities and we must deal with it. And it is at that point that I notice the interest seems to abate. Somehow, when it comes to what we can do about it in detailed ways, in learning the facts, somehow or another the interest seems to wane. And so I am imploring those of you who are interested in this crisis, in your communities, to take advantage of the um, the uh, lecture conference next Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at the House of the Lord Church. 
and that will be the next in the Timbuktu Learning Center series. Additionally, I want to remind you that there is no Dr. Clark lecture next week, but in connection with how he ended his lecture today, on October 15th, Dr. Clark will pick up the series with the fourth in the series entitled Emancipation, Reconstruction, and Betrayal, those years from 1865 to 1895. So we, we, look forward, we look forward to that. Additionally, I want to remind you of the leadership training seminar with Brother Charles Barron and uh, Brother Paul Washington to begin October 19th at 730. Those of you who are interested in that, even if you have no registration fee to put toward it, express your interest to any of the APCO people around the room, particularly in the back. Um, Sister uh, Linda Price would be more than happy to take your names and, and get you started with the involvement in the leadership training seminar. Um, now, for those of you who have questions, um, please I'll meet you over here with the mic and we can continue. Let's welcome back Dr. John Henry Clark. I find it difficult to believe that we don't have questions. I mean, I, I can always ask about five or six myself, but I always try not to take advantage of the fact that I'm the one holding the mic, so. Dr. Clark, thank you for your lecture. Um, I have a friend, uh, he's in the military, um, and whenever he gets out, he comes to the lectures, um, he studies, but it seems to me that he has a problem of what to do because he can't really be himself in there and they've just ran a, a program last week on NBC the blacks future in the military and they were saying how we won't have any more generals we won't have any more top officers in the military in the next century going into the next century and they say that it looks bleak and my question to you since I know you've been in the military yourself um, maybe you can explain for everybody here what maybe might be the future of, of black people in or involvement with U.S. military, and if they are involved, are there any applications for us as African people that we could help ourselves with, with that learning or training? Well, that's unfortunate because America made up its mind, just like they made up its mind that there will be no. Uh, that Congressional Medal of Honor winners in the Second World War, the Marines have announced long ago that while there might be black generals in other branches of the service, there will be no black Marine general. See, now qualifications had nothing to do with it. That's a decision that they've made that Marines will not be led in battle by a black general. And what you have to understand that this is a part of the sentiment of this country is turning against us. The gun law in Florida is partly really against us. And that the tide is rising against us in this country. And if we had it together and if Pan-Africanism meant anything, we would go and serve in armies in Africa and be generals and be whatever we need to be, and captains of industry too. And I'm not talking about capitalist exploitation of Africa. I would be against that no matter who's doing it. I mean, exploit Africa for the sake of African people, to build schools and to build facilities in Africa for Africans. Let them get the benefit of all that, that wealth. There was a book uh, called Who Needs the Negro? A lot of people didn't read it. But they, uh, what the book was saying is that they consider us obsolete in this country. We, come to, we were brought here to do some labor. The labor was over. 
They can manage without us now. They didn't bring us here to give us democracy. And we don't seem to be, to be able to realize that. The country is not relaxed if you are a part of it in the true sense. But then where are we going to go if we don't stay here? There's not a single country in Africa told us to come home. That's the tragedy. We have not built up the kind of relationships to break through all the propagandized minds in Africa so the Africans could see what a great value we would be to them. But all the basic technical knowledge we have, we could revolutionize and industrialize Africa. In a little while, Africa will be producing everything it needs. No one has made this idea work uni universally. Now, when I, I was in the Army four years, two months, 26 days. <laughs> no. But as a clerk, a chief clerk, a master sergeant, a personnel sergeant major, I made the army serve black people. And if I was convicted for all the different things I did in the army, all the different laws I violated, I'd still be in jail. <laughs> But I had no illusion about it. Some colonel asked me in the army, because my men were the cleanest, neatest, best dressed, less venereal disease than any company in the whole Eighth Corps area. Some grinning colonel come congratulated me, said, Sergeant, how do you instill such patriotism in these boys? <laughs> <laughs> well, know what I told them? I went, I didn't call them in formation and told them, went from one bag to the other. I said, you walk this earth like kings because you are kings. You are too proud to carry disease in your body and, and, to, and to give it to one of your women. So don't do this for your company. Don't do it for your country that has betrayed you. Do it for yourself because you are a king and that's the way you walk the earth. And if you are a king, your women must be queens and they must subsequently be treated like one. He wants to know how I steal such patriotism in these boys. First place I told them, don't bother about being patriotic. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Clark. Um, in listening to your lecture this evening, I was most interested in finding out, you spoke of when uh, Afro-Americans first stopped identifying themselves as Africans. What I would like to know is what was going on in their psyche that caused them to stop identifying themselves as Africans? the bad image of Africa in the geography books and in the press of that day, if you, or the, the bad caricature of Africa, plus the fact that we had not made the connection with Africa that would make us welcome. The blacks who went to Liberia went with the announcement that they were going to civilize their heathen brothers. So therefore, we had a bad attitude toward Africans. They had a bad attitude toward us. And we haven't cleared it up to this day. Otep, uh, you talked about the, Mar the Maroons yes. in Jamaica. I want to know if the Maroons were also in the United States and in other parts of the Caribbean, and what were their roles in these other parts, if they were there? No, there were maroons all over the whole New World. And uh, Herbert Aptek has written an essay on the maroons in the United States. There's a good book by uh, Faulkner Watts on the maroons of Haiti. 
But the most colorful of the Maroons were those in Jamaica. There were Maroons in Guyana who brought off the famous Bob Beast Revolt. The Maroons all over. The uh, revolts in Brazil was led by Maroons. The word Maroon just means runaway slave. It's no big deal. <laughs> mean, so any slave who was runaway was, uh, was called, uh, could be called a Maroon. A lot of people think only Jamaica had Maroons. Jamaica had the most publicized Maroons. But there were Maroons all over. In this country, they were in the mountains of Ke For a people to be truly independent, they must have an independent educational system. If they are dependent on another people's educational system, <coughs> they are dependent on another people's information. No other people feeds into another people that kind of information that gives that people the ability to dominate them. Therefore, I have often said education has but one honorable purpose, one alone. Everything else is a waste of time. The role of education is to train the student to be a proper handler of power. In the African people's journey in the United States and away from home that has been a forced journey into exile, they have had to depend mainly on other people's curricula, other people's concepts of education, other people's concepts of religion, and other people's images, including the image of God. The proliferation of independent educational institutions, independent approaches to culture and religion, harking back to our African beginning, looking back at the curtain behind slavery began again on the eve of the civil rights movement and continued through the black studies movement and now through the pan-African movement and the African nationalist movement so a new educational institution is a continuation of this same move toward total independence for African people 
away from home. This kind of education means sacrifice, it means planning, it means careful budgeting. It also means that you must have in force an information apparatus to convince a larger number of people to support the institution and to assure its continuation. Africans living away from Africa and Africans living in Africa itself and in the Caribbean islands are in a battle to develop independent institutions, especially educational institutions that will reflect the world in their favor as against the world in favor of the people who dominate them. This means new curricula, new books, new teaching methodology, and it also means looking beyond the slavery curtain at what happened to African people before this catastrophe in history. Maybe we have put the wrong emphasis on slavery. We need to emphasize this event in history as one of the many things that has happened to us. We also need to study the fact that for a thousand years before this event, we were bringing independent states into being, one after the others. We have been everything in the hard drama of human life from saint to buffoon. Slavery was only one of the many events that has occurred in our existence. And we need to look at this catastrophe and remember that this is a catastrophe that has touched every life of every people on the face of this earth sometime in its history. We need not brood over it forever or assume that it happened only to us. This kind of teaching can only be done in an institution that is free of outside dominance where we control the curricula the flow of information, the conduct of the students, and while we find the means of financing the independent institutions that teaches our students again that the only proper education is the education to handle power, that the world is ruled by those who prepare for it and who can handle power and authority with some kind of skill. We are in the enviable position of being able to claim all that is ours by right of God and man without taking anything that rightfully belongs to other people. I believe our mission for restructuring our lives, regaining what slavery and colonialism took away will start with independent educational institutions designed by us, for us, 
and run in behalf of our children and generations to come after them. As African people, we're very concerned about the education of our children. And I often attend conferences which are designed to deal with the educational issues that we must resolve if we are to appropriately educate our children. However, one of the, the things that I often find is that these conferences assume a definition of education. They often do not debate what education means to African people. And to appropriately talk about education, you must first begin with a discussion of what education means to us. We must understand that words have a political history. And the word education, as used under the present circumstances, and as used by Europeans and others, is a, is, is a word that has a political history that has a definite meaning for them. Blacks have been educated in this country since the very first days we arrived on these chores. We were perhaps among the first people in America to be given what may be called on-the-job training. We have received a special education from Europeans from the very beginning. The education that we receive today, no matter where and under what circumstances, as long as it is under European um, guidance and power, is special education. By that I mean education that is designed to serve the special needs of Europeans. And the needs that Europeans have for African people is a need for African servitude. So the education of African people, no matter how sophisticated, no matter where undertaken, whether in the public schools, in the private schools of America, in the institutions of higher education, Harvard or Yale or anywhere else, is an education for servitude. Too often we, as African Americans, assume that the purpose of education is to prepare ourselves for jobs. We do not ask why is it that we are not being educated to create jobs for ourselves. We assume that those jobs will be offered to us by other people. So immediately our education is colored by a need to serve and by a presumption that we will always serve. Any education that operates on the presumption of servitude is an education that cannot function in the interest of our people. To appropriately talk about education, then, we must ask the question, education for what? We must recognize that the, that the primary function of education is to advance the interest of a people. That education is not primarily for jobs. Education is for survival. For if we are educated for jobs, if we are educated to be computer engineers or accountants and so forth, and yet we cannot secure our survival as a people, then that education would have been for naught. Every culture engages in education, no matter how so-called primitive or how so-called advanced. When a young child is taught, let us say, to fish or hunt, or to carry out the, the rituals of the group, or to cook, or to sew, or to do any of the tasks of a society. It is being educated to maintain that society, to sustain that society, and advance its interest. When we as African people in America then look at our situation today, we must ask ourselves, first and foremost, how we are being educated to sustain our very biological survival? And are we being educated to liberate ourselves from the conditions in which we find ourselves? This is the function of an African-centered education, to secure the liberation of African people. 
a good education is not measured by the institutions that we attend, nor in terms of whether we are integrated with another people, nor in terms of whether we are receiving so-called equal funds, but in terms of the degree to which that education secures our survival as a people and solves our problems as a people. You begin an educational curriculum and you begin educational curriculum planning by first asking what are the problems our people must resolve. For we must be educated not to solve the problems of other people first, but to solve our own problems. And to do that, we must know what those problems are. Once we, we agree on what problems we must resolve as a people, and we must recognize that the problems that African people have to solve, the problems that our children must solve, the tasks that they must undertake in the future are not those of white children. Therefore, the education given to white children cannot be appropriate to, uh, for African people. One of the primary problems our children must solve is the problem of our being oppressed. That is not the problem of white people. We must resolve the problem of feeding our people and enhancing their well-being, of building our capacity to survive and to defend our interests against incursions by other people. Once we ask the question then, what problems must we resolve as a people? We must ask the question, what kind of people must we develop to resolve those problems? And once we look at the, that, that issue, we must ask what kinds of institutions must be developed and what kinds of social relations must we build, build uh, among ourselves so that we may solve the problems that confront us as a people. Then we must ask the question, what educational experiences must we undergo in order to become the people we need to be? to build the institutions we need to be, to build in order to resolve the problems we must resolve. This is the basis upon which an appropriate educational curriculum is built. We must then look at the psychology of ourselves and the psychology of our children and design an educational experience which matches their developmental experiences and growth rates. We have demonstrated in our past works that the development of black children is not a duplicate of the development of white children. Our children grow at different rates and so forth. Therefore, an appropriate education must match their developmental rates with the kind of educational experiences they must undergo. This is in essence what an African-centered uh, educational curriculum involves. The matching of the readiness of our children based on their development with the appropriate educational experiences necessary to build the kind of people we need to solve the kinds of problems we have to solve. The education of our children must be based on the psychology of African people, a psychology grounded in the history and experience of our people not a psychology transferred from or borrowed from a people with a completely different history and experience, therefore a different psychology, and from a people who have a completely different intentionality, that intentionality being to maintain the domination and exploitation of African people. We must recognize that the experiences Africans have had under the domination of Europeans has been one that has shaped our psychology. And to a great extent then, the educational experiences that we must provide for our children must be one that re reorients that psychology, but must confront that psychology in its reality and therefore appropriately educate our children in terms of it and in spite of it. An African-centered education, then, is an education that is based on an African-centered theory of learning. In what way do our children learn? 
How has uh, their learning orientation been, uh, been changed by the experience in America? In what way do we wish to change their approach to learning? And for what reason? Do you need then a theory of education that takes this into consideration? And once you look at the theory of education founded on the psychology of our people, founded on our intentionality as a people, you then must build a theory of pedagogy, that is a theory of teaching. How must our children be taught given their psychological orientations so that we can become the people we need to become and ultimately a people who are a powerful people in the world, ultimately a people who will overthrow white domination and a people who are in a position to not be dominated by any other ethnic group and a people who can function independently in the world. If this is to be achieved, it is, primary, it is of primary importance that we have institutions that are directly under our control. That these institutions provide appropriate atmospheres so that appropriate learning can take place. That our children be put in an atmosphere where their minds will not be invaded by pernicious foreign influences. Therefore, it is imperative that African people build schools and educational institutions where the African message and the, the African future can be securely uh, given to our children. And it is important then that we uh, economically, spiritually, and culturally support those institutions which are designed and are being designed to provide an African-centered education for our children who are building an African-centered future for our people. Thank you. I looked at the whole one second mm -hmm. because I want to change back. Go on. A lot of times we say things like um, that we need an African-centered education in order to achieve liberation. But what I found that many young people don't understand what liberation is. They, can, they will say to me, what do you mean by liberation? Ah, it, freedom, but aren't we free? I mean, can't we go and do what we want to do? And what they don't understand liberation and freedom. So mm -hmm. if you would explain that for us. Okay. I would see the essence of liberation and freedom, of course, as uh, self-determination, the ability to determine one's own destiny. When we say we are free as a people, under the current circumstances, we are free to the extent that other people determine that we are free. We are not operating under the influence of our own laws. We have not uh, determined the nature of the government in which we operate. We are a dependent people. We must ask other people to secure our livelihoods, our jobs. We must uh, follow their rules and their directions. This can in no way mean uh, freedom and liberation. When uh, We must ask other people permission and we must ask other people to, to provide us with special protections, to provide us with special laws, to pass special legislation in our interest, when we must plead in their courts so that we may um, socially interact with them, or when we are prohibited in various ways by the rulings of the, their courts, their legislatures, and so forth, we cannot count ourselves is free. We mistakenly also identify freedom with doing what we want to do. However, freedom is not doing what we want to do, particularly when our wants have been determined by another people. When we look at the TV sets, when we listen to our radios, when we read magazines and so forth, 
we see a whole host of media trying to determine our desires, telling us what we must buy, what we must wear, what we must eat, what to do here and what to do there. That means those people who control uh, those media are literally then creating our desires. They are creating our wants and our needs. And consequently then, when we say freedom is doing what we want and what we need, when those wants and needs have been determined by another people, we are not really acting freely. We have been manipulated. We have been manipulated in the purchasing of material items and in the purchasing of uh, resources and in the pursuit of certain uh, pleasures and things that when we really look at them benefit only other people because the other people own those resources. We should ask our question, why is it that everything we want is owned by somebody else? And why is it that whenever we get what we want, a strive for what we want, everyone else benefits materially, socially, politically, and culturally. And why is it the more we buy what we want, the more impoverished we become as a people? You measure uh, freedom then in terms of the degree to which your so-called free activities benefit you as a person and as a people, socially, economically, politically, and otherwise. When your pursuit of your freedoms leads then to impoverishment, to joblessness, to injustice, to the other kind of things we talk about every day, you have a concrete measure then that what you call freedom is not freedom. When you have to depend on another people for your livelihood, when you have to ask their permission to move around in the world, when you have to get what you want from another people, then you are not talking about freedom. You are talking about servitude and slavery parading as freedom. How, about, how, how might a free people, African people, how might they world look like or the environment mm -hmm. look like if mm -hmm. they had real freedom? I think the freedom of African people, of course, would be defined in terms of the traditions of African people. A people who highly valued a harmonious relationship with nature and with reality. A people who did not see themselves as enemies of nature. That means then there would be a people whose legacy will not be the pollution of nature, the destruction of nature and the destruction of the atmosphere. A people who work harmoniously with nature and first and foremost, a people whose freedom, our so-called freedom, is not based on the unfreedom of other people. A people who operate not to exploit others, not to enslave others, not to degrade others, but to enhance others, to, to provide other people with the same kinds of privileges, the same kinds of respect, that we ourselves would like to receive. It will be, we will be a people who will meet our very basic needs to be materially satisfied without being materially destructive. A people who recognize this, that uh, man is fundamentally spiritual in nature and therefore will, will uh, feed the spiritual needs of mankind, will not see spirituality as an enemy to uh, our economic, political, and social interests, but as central to our interests. We will provide an atmosphere so that human beings may develop their full potential, may uh, develop their full character in positive ways and be supported in that development rather than oppressed and distorted in their efforts to be human beings and to be full persons.
Now, I want to the um, the nature of the mind. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us an insight to the ability of of the, the physical here now to somehow be in contact with that which has gone before us, this mystery that we don't seem to understand, looking at what happened to that young girl and that slave girl. We have to recognize that to a very great extent, our being shaped uh, by another people has only been made possible by alienation by alienation as a people. And what I mean by that is, as I've often said, we cannot be the oppressive uh, subjects of another people if we were truly an African people. You see, to be the psychological uh, subordinates of another people means that we would have had to been alienated from our African selves, you see. It is only when you're alienated from yourself that a new identity, a new set of desires and orientations can be implanted in your psyche. In order for us to, to work for another people and to wish to identify with those people, particularly people who are our enemies and our exploiters, means that we would have had to forgotten, have forgotten who we are as a people. Alienation implies then the separation from one's originality, a separation from one's original identity, and the acceptance of a newly created identity. We can only work for other people the way we do today because we have been separated from ourselves. A people who are at one with themselves can only work for themselves. In a sense, I've said that we have been alienated so that we may work for aliens, you see. To be alienated, when you get a people who can only spend their money in the interest of other aliens, it's because they have had an alien personality implanted in their psyches, mm -hmm. you see. And that implantation can only occur when we, you have been separated, when we as a people have been separated from our African past. Therefore, it is crucial that we, we be reconnected to our past, that we become again one with ourselves. Now, that past has not been uh, shut off from us, we have not been completely separated from it. It merely has been repressed in us. As long as we are black as people, as long as we are carrying our African characteristics, we have not been truly separated from our Africanness. When we talk about, for instance, as I often tell audiences, our color, our color is not an accident. It is not a mere uh, decoration that the creator decided as if he were painting Easter eggs or she was painting Easter eggs that uh, she'd give one set of people color and another set this color and that color. Our color as a people reflects the history and experience of our people over hundreds and thousands of years. When we talk about the, our bodies as African people, our physiognomy as African people, we are talking about a, an historical phenomenon, you see. When we, talk, and, and when we say that our genes, for instance, are responsible for determining our physical characteristics and to a certain degree our psychological characteristics, we're not just talking about uh, chemical packets that are contained in our cells. In our genes represent a capsulated history of African people. We carry the history of African people in our bodies. We are the endpoint of African history. 
Our children, in carrying the genes within their bodies, are carrying the totality of the history of African people. Therefore, we have a racial memory. That racial memory is implanted in our bodies and in our very souls. Therefore, it is the, due to the fact that we have not accepted that racial memory. When we refuse to accept our color and love our color and refuse to accept our bodies, when we refuse to make the history that has made us, then we fall victim to alien influences. Often then we need certain types of props and experiences to reconnect us with our bodies, with our experiences, and with our histories. To bring from the unconscious into consciousness our history which has been suppressed by our experience as people. The kinds then, the things that, uh, the kind of props and by that I don't mean disrespect, but the kinds of objects and rituals that Elmina and other things represent, it's very important in catalyzing or stimulating the movement of repressed materials into consciousness. This is one of the reasons why then you see an overwhelming emotional reaction that uh, takes place under those circumstances. I have often said that to be oppressed is to be ruled by emotions. You see, the reason why often many of us behave in terms of feeling and not merely in terms of logic is because when you are oppressed, you are oppressed in terms of feeling. You are oppressed in terms of fear, in terms of anxiety in terms of seeking to avoid pain and hurt, you see. And therefore, the avoidance of pain and hurt and displeasure becomes the chief motivational factors in your life. And consequently, feeling becomes the most important things in determining the way we behave, you see. We repress then those feelings which would motivate us to act in terms of our own interests. Because to be oppressed is to act against one's interest. You cannot be oppressed and act in terms of your own best interests because the whole essence of oppression is to act in the interest of your oppressor. Mm -hmm. Therefore, those things which were motivating you prior to your oppression must be repressed, must be suppressed, must even be seen as alien must be seen as an enemy to your existence. What happens then when one revisits historical sites, practices historical uh, rituals, reconnects with the historical soil, is that the repressed memories and feelings are empowered and they overcome the repressed mechanisms they make a lie, all of those things that we had before held as truth. And we become transformed. And we become at one again with ourselves. And that oneness with the self is extremely liberating and freeing and empowering and cleansing and healing. It releases the mind, it releases the intellect, and it releases us again to be free and to relate differently to ourselves and to the world. So it is very important if we as people are to break the mental shackles that bind us, that bind us today, that we ritualistically and otherwise reconnect ourselves to our history, for we ultimately are our history. And if we are to change our future, we must change our history and we must use our history because the future is but history renewed. And if we are to renew our history under our guidance, we must reconnect with that history 
And we must use then those instruments that have been important in our transformation to be subordinated to others as means now to break that subordination and regain control of ourselves and our destiny again. Mm -hmm. That, that, that the erosion of our Africanity has not, has not been complete. I mean, that, the fact that we come here and, and, and feel the emotional spirit of this place is evidence that that ancestral spirit is still touching us. Mm -hmm. If it had been eroded totally, we'd come through here and we'd play games and we'd, you know, we'd do little silly things and we'd, uh, and, and, and we'd go home and not be touched by this. Mm -hmm. The fact that we are touched by this is evidence that that spirit's there. So the process of, of us giving up the African for the European has not been complete. So you can't say we gave it up. You know, we've been eroded, it's like sandpaper. Mm -hmm. You know, you got, you got all this lacquer, this white paint on us. Mm -hmm. You're gonna keep rubbing it and keep rubbing it before you get down to the real ebony wood. Mm -hmm. And so that's all, this, they just painted some stuff over us. And if, you do, if I can use that analogy of the spirit, they just painted over us and coated us and so our bodies don't breathe right. You know, our texture, the skin doesn't, doesn't perspire right because we've got this, this crud on us. Mm -hmm. There's another spiritual system, it's not even a spiritual, it's another system that uh, affected us. And that's what, and that's what we're doing now, we're, we're, we're working through that and, that, and, and our, our spirits are breaking out of this, of this long history of confusion, confusion uh, that, that came about from this place. And you just think, if you think about it and try to imagine what it was like, and we came down on a bus, it took us a good while to get down on the bus, some of us were, were screeching and talking about we were kind of uncomfortable on the bus. But can you imagine being driven by, by, by beasts, by people who had given up their right to be human, by beasts with, with brutalization for days and days and days, and then getting to this place, and that same fog that you see now, sort of dull brightness of this fog, you, you come out of the bush in that same fog. Imagine the psychological rupture that was occurring. And when you're thrown through this place, and you're coming to this place, and you're gathering. Now there are a thousand other black men and women like you in this place, and they're moaning, and they're groaning, and you got these savages running around here. Think about the horror and the torture of that moment, you see. And so the fact that we're here, and are even, even able to walk and talk and think is evidence of our strength. That process alone should have killed us. This is the female slave dungeon at Elmino Castle in Ghana, West Africa. From one to 200 women would be packed in this holding pen. There were iron bars and gates. No one could escape. There was very little ventilation, only a hole about 18 by 18 inches was in the wall. It was always dark in this pen. There were no sanitary conditions or facilities. The women had to do everything in a bucket that were placed in each corner. The longer the women stayed, the more they died. They died from lack of sanitary conditions. 
no ventilation, overcrowdedness, and diseases. They were often here from one, two, to three months. Periodically, the women were let out into a courtyard. If there was a rebellious woman, she would be tired to these cannonballs and left to stand in the sun for days. The soldiers would stand on a balcony just above where these women are now and observe the women to choose which they would rape for the night. That woman would be sent up to them through a trap door just behind them. If she rebelled in any way, again, she would be beaten and tired to these cannonballs and left in the sun. These are some of the original iron bars, hundreds of years old. Watch the gutter, please. Go behind. This was the exit for the women to the ship. But these iron bars were put here recently to prevent accidents. There were steps from where they could get down there. The main captives were made to join the women down. Exit. Is the male dungeon. Two to three hundred men were cramped in this holding pen from one to three months as they waited for the ships to arrive. There was very little ventilation. This is the only ventilation. It was always dark, iron bars and gates on the windows. This is the passage that they would meet the women as they were led to the ships still in chains. Much closer. Oh. That's now receded. Oh. So when the ship came, it anchored some distance away. They brought small boats down here to take them, still in chains, before they were taken to the ship, then off to the far away places. Keeping them in a dungeon for one month, two months, or three months, and long walk from the hinterland to this place yes. made them weak and lean. Yeah. So when the ship arrived, here? yes, okay. they could pass through here. And while here, that was only ventilation. Only ventilation. That's why we came all the way down. Well, the, this, this fortress or castle was where it all started. It was 18, I mean, 1482. And it has been proven that a little known sailor, Christopher Columbus, was in the expedition. He had landed, now well dressed. They were trying to impress the Africans that they were people sent by the gods. And when the king, King Asa, refused to buy the Bible story that they're coming to civilize them, he was forced to buy the gun story. Mm -hmm. And they forced their way in. So first they were looking for gold. And almost for 200 years, this was the headquarters of the gold trade. This is why this part of Africa was once called the Gold Coast. People forget that Ghana still has a high quality, quantity of gold. But this is the first large holding station for slaves. The, uh, the Dutch have had it. 
Portuguese invaded, finally the British uh, took it over. The British were late coming into the slave trade, but they came in furious and they organized it and made it a business, almost like gangsters in a city. One, one group of gangsters, the west side, one or the east side, and they don't interfere with each other unless they want trouble. Once the British established themselves, they were the bosses of the whole slave trade. And they put slavery, slave stock on the British Stock Exchange. There are 46 of these folks, depending on who's doing the counting. And if 36 are in Ghana, that tells you what, what the headquarters of the slave trade was. Slaves were brought from all over West Africa to Ghana for resale. And then they trek from the hinterlands to the coast. Sometimes seven out of ten died in passage. This also indicates that you never get a correct statistic on what Africa lost, who lived through it, and who died in the midst of it. Maybe a larger number died than than went on the ships. An Edward Boyan in an article called The Impact of Slavery on West Africa proved that all of this was not necessary. But where we are, Cape Coast, the Cape Coast area, is the basic home of the Fantic people. They have always been the intellects of Ghana and the petitioners and the constitution makers. They're difficult with the increment, but the increment failed to recognize this. Otherwise, they could have helped a great deal towards stabilizing his government. Mm -hmm. But this is, well, neither here nor now, uh, now right now, but uh, once you understand the dimensions of this fort, understand that the, the luxurious apartments on top of it and that men calling themselves Christians lived in these apartments while the greatest misery ever inflicted on the people was happening right one, one flight below. If you look in the inside, you see a ladder going up to the quarters of the slave captains. That was called the ladder of shame. The virgin goods were paraded in the courtyard and any of the captains could pick one for that night to violate. And she came up that ladder to his apartment. Sometime if girls were pregnant before the ships came back in, they would let them stay. And therefore, around each slave fort, there was a community of mixed breeds. But to the everlasting credit of the mixed breeds and the descendants in Ghana, none of them ever turned against their mother's people in favor of their European father's people. In fact, one of them, Kisla Hayford, a descendant of that group, is the political architect of Ghanaian politics in the 20th century. And one of them, a descendant of a mixed breed, is now president of Ghana. But of all the games that has been played, he never played the color game. <laughs> And that's to his credit, whatever, not to his credit, that is to his credit. That you could have had a color fight here in Ghana, but you didn't have it because the mixed breeds never saw themselves as being any different from other Africans in, in this country. The Kwesi Brews, that family, still live in Ghana, and they were descendants of black slave trading family. The Randolphs, the descendant of German missionary family. But this is a historical place, and it's more than just an attraction to look at dungeons. I hope people here look at the door of no return, because uh, after they went out of that door, they never saw Africa again. And this was gone 300 years of slavery. We've been gone 200 years as colonialism. 
many people say the Africans sold themselves into slavery. Well, the Africans were in a bind. Africans were armed by European. The Europeans created a scare between one and the other. The Africans were naive enough to fall for it. Some of the Africans participated in the slave trade because they were corrupt. And some of them were told, either you catch a slave for me or you become one. While all this is keep repeating, no one qualifies this. No one understands the nature of slavery. No one understands it within Africa. It wasn't a slave trade. It was a system of servitude. And in the African system of servitude, families were not broken up. And in many times, an African in servitude to another family became head of that same family. So there's no comparison between the internal African system of servitude and the European slave trade. Because in that slave trade, in that system of servitude, nobody left Africa. Nobody was enslaved. Yes, some Africans did participate, but what assisted the Europeans more than anything else was the rapid fire gun, except for the gun. They couldn't penetrate the hinterland. And that's how they penetrate the hinterland. I think once the African accept his fair share of what he did, he, slavery was a three continent industry involving a revolution in maritime science, a revolution in economics, a revolution in navigation. The African did not have the equipment to bring off anything this big. In terms of your finally, uh, Dr. Clark, in terms of that um, that trade, that uh, the slave trade in building the industry of Europe, could you talk about that? Please? It it did more than just build the industries of Europe. It rescued the economy of Europe and gave Europe the means of expanding in the Americas into the so-called New World. It helped to lay the basis of the plantation system, which was a modification of the feudalism that Europe had known in Europe. Europe does not come to civilize. They come to bring their way of life, and they bring a way of life that, can, that they can use to control others. There was fierce competition between European and European, not only over the slave trade, but over geographic positions to trade. I mean, uh, Jamaica's changed hand three times, ending with the English. The several islands have changed, the French islands, Martinique, Guadeloupe, they've changed hands several times. So you see the fierce competition between the Europeans for that territory caused a war between them. But they didn't fight each other into, into extinction. Thank but you. the Africans fought all along. The DJ, DJ grabbed chances too. The British told them that if you can write a constitution that a civilized people can live by, I will consider leaving your country. They wrote a constitution that was so good, it was better than the British constitution. The British put all the conferees in jail, except King Gotti, who really was a missionary trained African named Johnson, the British gave him the name Johnson. But the kingship was weak. So one thing about African royalty, if, if you just being royal, royal, that don't make you they have the throne. If you weak and royal, they just make someone else royal, put him on. <laughs> so Johnson became King Gotti. And he led the uh, Fanti Confederacy, the unification of the Fanti, Fanti nations along the coast. The, the, the other petition started in 1844. Dunquart wrote an excellent article on that. I have all that in my files given to me by Dunquart, autographed by Dunquart. This is, um, Elmina has been virtually declared an international monument, so th this is world class. Mm. So there's going to be a lot of money poured in here, but the question is, mm -hmm. will it tell the story the way it should and be how told? Be used. And that becomes a question mark. We need simplified books telling the story that people can, laymen can read and understand, and also children can read and understand. We need to explain slavery out of with a, with a world background. There's a man named Blake, he's done a, I don't know what people don't need to do, a whole history of slavery as an institution. 
And that's what I'm going to try to do in, the, in this revised uh, book on, that I edited on. It's called Slave, The Slave Trade. I might even give it another title. But, but the idea is I'm going to bring together some little known aspects of slavery. Mm -hmm. This is why I will go both from you and uh, Scobie. And, Scobie. and also a Shashi, Dr. McIntyre. Shashi has already delivered her paper. Yeah. I already got Shashi's paper. I got something from uh, Clinton Cox, The Impact of Slavery on West Africa by Edu Boyan. And he said that he thought that would be more appropriate because in it he proved that the slave trade cheated both the African and the European. It wasn't that, wasn't that necessary, mm. which is the point of view we have. Oh, did Wade get back? Um, yeah, no, uh, Wade. Is this your first trip here at uh, Elmina? No, this is my third time visiting Elmina Dungeon. Mm -hmm. You mind talking about it, maybe remembering the first time you came here? And the first time I came here was in, was almost 25 years ago. And uh, when my wife and I came here, it was uh, not as developed around the, the dungeon. And so it was a, a different experience. I'm, I have mixed feelings about what's happening around the dungeon. It seems as if uh, this is becoming a, a tourist attraction as opposed to a, a pilgrimage to some sacred ground that represents the, uh, the rupture of, uh, of the African sense of being for those who ended in the uh, New World and in the diaspora. Uh, it is still a very difficult place to be. Uh, it is, uh, there are echoes in this place of the horror and the pain and the blood of, uh, of our ancestors that are still here. And uh, I find myself not being able to talk, and uh, I'm a talker. <laughs> uh, and so I try to not be in the, the treadmill of going around these rooms. Uh, it's just a very difficult place to be. You're a psychologist. Yes. Putting, uh, putting together uh, films on all these dungeons. Uh, and we're telling the story through the eye. See, the, the, uh, it's, it's hard for psychologists to talk about this because we're not immune to the, the same spirit that possesses all of us. When the Africans come back to this place, if you watch closely, you'll see that uh, we're, we enter the place sort of as tourists and, uh, and uh, with a tourist mentality. When you come into this place, something comes over you. And I think that what comes over you is that there's been the spirits of our ancestors that died here, not the ones that went through the gate of no return, but the ones who died here. Their spirits are still in this place. And, uh, and, and they recognize, as spirits do, recognize their children. And so you'll find different reactions to this place because people are being touched by their personal ancestral spirits, those that actually died here. And, uh, and so you'll find people who are very conservative and who are just here because tourists begin to weep, begin to cry. You find people who, who will uh, uh, just get disoriented. And it's because they're being collected up, if, if, you, if I can use that term. They're being collected up because the ancestral spirit does that. It reaches and collects us up. And so, this, so because we have lost a lot of our education, a lot of our training, on how to handle that, we don't know what is happening to us. But what is happening is that those souls that, are, that were killed here, that were murdered and brutalized here, reaching out and touching us. They're touching us softly, and, and, and they're touching us and, 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 and letting us know that that circle wasn't broken. That even though we thought the circle was broken, that when we were pushed through that, 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 that gate of no return and, uh, and beaten down those, these little narrow hallways and, and tortured or our, or our women beating up that ladder to be brutalized by some savage beast, that all those things that happened to us did not break the circle. And that when you're in this place, no matter, no matter how distant you are from the concept of the circle being unbroken, that circle reaches and grabs you and that the ancestors, the spirits that are here touch you and, uh, in many different ways. Uh, and I think that people who come here, the Africans who come here, when they leave, they're never the same. 
that, the, that they're never the same in terms of, even if they think they are, that, that their dreams will change, their, that their, their thoughts will change, that their dedication to work changes, that this place has to be explained. And it's important that we take responsibility for explaining what happens when you come to this place because it's rapidly becoming a tourist attraction. And people are going to be having, kids outside right now have trinkets that they're trying to sell. There's a tourist attraction. And we have to be careful not to allow this to become a tourist attraction. It has to be seen as a pilgrimage. It has to be seen as a point of no longer no return, but a point of return. Mm -hmm. The spiritual force is here. Uh, it is in the walls. As you just said, it's in the walls. It's in the, it's in the ground. It's in the, in, in the movement. It's in the rhythms of here. If you just quiet yourself and listen to that ocean, the voice of that ocean is exactly the same voice that has been there from the beginning of time. The sound of that ocean is what our ancestors heard over the weeps and over the moans and over the groans of their pain. They heard that same ocean that we're hearing right now, and that's speaking to us, and we need to make that connection. Thank you very much. Um, I was supposed to be here early, they gave me another assignment. They didn't pick me up to go to the assignment. I followed their instructions and waited at the hotel. I would love to be here when I can uh, be more fully in depth on this subject because there's a whole lot of illusions about Africa's relationship with other people in the world. There's a whole lot of illusion about our relationship to the religions in the world. And these belief systems that had its origin in Africa, all of them, and there is no exception, turned on African people. I said there is no exception. And there's one thing you have to get through your mind and keep it. Nothing that ever came from the European mind was meant to do anything but facilitate European domination of the world. And I said there's no exception. Everything that was brought into this continent, everything, every idea, every so-called religion was meant to dominate and to control. The Alps had no illusions about it. The Europeans had no illusions about it. You were the ones with the illusions. And yet every element that went into the making of every major religion in the world started in Africa. Why is it that you are so naive, you let people redress something that you invented, send it back to you, and enslave you through it? I'm saying that all organized present religions are male chauvinist murder cults, and I say there is no exception. Well, I wanted to be here early. I wanted to deal with our relationship with the people of the world and the fact that we created peaceful nations that had no word for tail because no one had ever gone to one. No word for old people's home because no one had ever thrown away grandma and grandpa. No word for orphanage. We did all of this and over half of human civilization was over before we knew that a European was in the world. Before he wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. Now Africa has always and still is the prize for the whole world. We as a people have always been the world's richest people, culturally rich, mineral rich. We have always been the prize because we have always had and still have something that other people won't think they can't do without and don't care to pay for. Because we have always been the prize, we have been under siege for over 3,000 years. Nothing that ever brought into Africa from the outside was meant to do the African any good. That means all other religions. Islam was the handmaiden of Arab imperialism. Christianity was the handmaiden of European imperialism. 
The Hebrew faith was the handmaiden of a concept called the chosen people. Now, if God is kind and God is merciful and God has no stepchildren, he won't choose one over the other. And to say he chose some people, you're making him a bigger. And to say that he endorsed enslavement of one people over the other, you're making him an assessment to murder. The Arabs used Islam to rationalize their slavery and their imperialism. The Europeans used Christianity to rationalize their slavery and imperialism. Who are you kidding about friends in the world? Damn it, if you want a friend, look in the mirror. There's a billion African people on the face of this earth. Why are you buying third-rate junk from third-rate people thinking you can't make it? Why don't you at least make a safe depend to hold your child's diaper together? Who has programmed your mind that thinking you can't make a car? The first man that made a car that had never seen one previously. <laughs> the Japanese bought cars, bought locomotives, broke them down and studied them, and had a Japanese technician produce each piece, put it together, and had a much better train than the one they copied from. All knowledge in the world belongs to everybody in the world. Yes. Who has programmed our mind in assuming that we cannot run a nation and run it well? The main thing imperialism did, slavery and imperialism, they removed African people from the respectful commentary of history. And they tell them something they are still telling them and all of the organized religions are guilty of this. I favor none of it because Africa didn't need any of it. I'm saying that African belief systems, properly understood, is 10 times better than Judaism, Christianity, and in Islam. <laughs> and better for the Africans. So you might have some romance with one of these religions. I have no romance with any of them. I have a romance with reality and truth. And the chips can fall where they may after I tell it. As for friends, you have had no friends. When they discovered you, they began to prey on you. Now let's look at our relationship with Western Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East. For 3,000 years, our greatest enemies came from Western Asia. They were trying to avenge the fact that they were once African colonies. You read a book called When Egypt Ruled the East, and you get some of the basic information on this. Now, the first visitors to Africa came in the 1700 BC. These were the people who would later be called Hebrews. Now, black people are ticklish on this because black people think that everything in the Bible is true. I question the intelligence of anyone who thinks everything in the Bible is true or supposed to be true. <laughs> it's allegory, told, stories told to illustrate a point at a time when there were very few people reading books. And most of what you went into the making of the Bible was copied from Egyptian texts. Now, if you want to get so duly eyed over the Bible, which is, which is a carbon copy of a carbon copy, why don't you go back and read the original Egyptian text? <laughs> then you see where all these stories started from. You see where the story of the Exodus started from. Now you can so do it, I do actually think there was an Exodus. These people walked into Africa. Why couldn't they walk out? Why did they have to go by sea? Nope. Why did sea at the park? If you read Egyptian literature, you will discover that the whole story of somebody parting the sea started with 
about 3,000 years before the Hebrew entrance. I should not use the word Hebrew entrance before the entrance of Western Asia. Now let's get one thing straight because black people are confused about all religions. Now I'm not against any religion. I'm a very spiritual human being. I just don't need a preacher to preach no Ten Commandments to me when he's a backslider going with some, sister, some other man's wife. I'm intelligent enough to pick from the Ten Commandments, we're not commandments anyway, but they were omissions of purity at the great school at Luxor, Luxor, the great African training school. All right, now, let's get into this Western Asia. I'm saying that the people who came from Western Asia escaping famine did not have any Hebrew faith when they came into Africa. And there's no record of a Hebrew faith before there. Why is it that when they left Africa in the so-called Exodus, they had all three, African culture, an African religion, and an African language. Now look at the origin of so-called people you now refer to as Jews. And you're mistaken using that reference because the word Jew is of European origin. And the people in Europe who call themselves by their name have no relationship to the biblical people of the Hebrew faith. And I'm saying that the people we now call Jews entered world history with their visit to Africa. And when Africa was invaded, 1675 BC, instead of joining the Africans who had been, been that been their beneficiary and saved them from starvation, they joined the enemies of Africa. No one has ever turned, returned any favors to us. As a people, we have always been hospitable to strangers, mostly the wrong strangers. And what we have to understand now in the period of superior brainwashing is that is no European answer for African problems. Either Africans find a solution to African problems or there is no solution. And if you don't find a solution soon, you go back into slavery. <laughs> we have to stop all of this nonsense about who belongs to what religion when all of them were imposed on us in the first place. We stop all this fight with, between Muslims and Christians when neither one of the religions are doing them any good or moving them toward, 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 toward independence. All of them are handmaids of conquerors. All of them are religions of conquerors. We were naive when we accepted their interpretation of something that we had all along. I'm saying we, have, we need to take a good look at ourselves. I'm not talking about burning churches. I'm not talking about getting rid of religions. Understand me well. I am saying that every single thing that touches your life, religious, socially, and politically, must be an instrument of your liberation, or you must throw it into the ash can of history. Yes. Develop a liberation Islam. Yes. And if you develop a liberation Islam, you have to turn on the supreme slave traders who were in the slave trade a thousand years before the Europeans, the Arabs. And most brothers who think they're Muslims are really Arabists. Forerunners, vanguards of Arab propaganda. The Arabs are not above joining the Jews against black people. In America, they're already doing it in Detroit. In America, they're already doing it in real estate. You got some do it, I think, but you got a friend. I still ask you to look at that mirror. And if nothing's staring back at you is friendly, then you've got no friend. <laughs> but this is why you start friend. All right. I'm saying something which you need to reconsider. I'm saying that everything that came into Africa, every people that came into Africa, did not come to do Africa any good. Everyone and every religion and every people who came into Africa declared war on African culture. They began the bastardization of African people. 
created confusion in Adam who didn't know whether he was to be loyal to his mother's people or his father's people. That confusion is still here. The fascination for the color of the conqueror and the fascination to go to bed with the conqueror. Now that's wrong and mean, but it's true. Now, sometime ago, a North African leader, Gaddafi, was sending some Libyans to study in Europe. And he told them what any good nationalist would tell students going to study. I'm not sending you to Europe to find a wife. I'm sending you to Europe to gain the technology to come back and make Libya a strong nation, a strong Islamic nation, and a strong Arab nation. And you cannot achieve any of this between the legs of a European woman. <laughs> when is somebody going to get strong enough to tell Africans going to school, you're going to come back home and pair up with a sister? But if you want to pair up over there, stay over there. <laughs> now, the one thing we have to look at, and I'm sorry I'm going to have to conclude on this because I've left out a body of information. At the university, I teach an entire course, semester course, on Africa's relationship to other people. And I devote several semesters to Africa before Europe, the consequences of the coming of the Greeks, who stole a lot that they think is their culture, stole a lot that you think is Greek philosophy. We've been the victims of propaganda. And yet, if you read the Journal of African Civilization, other works, we have lived in Europe, we've lived in Asia, we've lived in the Americas, the African people have already proved that they can get along with different people, amalgamate their culture with different people without one hint of a war between them. People who come into Africa immediately declare war on African culture, standards of beauty, standards of conduct, and change the African concept of theirs so they can rule through him. This was true of the Greeks who began the bastardization, again, the European bastardization of Africa. The Western Asians had began it 3,000 years before that. The Romans, a bunch of well-dressed thugs who could write well but couldn't think, <laughs> who borrowed practically everything. They laughed at the African's concept Christianity. The African was practicing and not giving it a name. This is why you don't know, know nothing about the African origins of Christianity. This is why a whole lot of people will not read Ben Yarkinen's The African Origins of the Major Western Religions. Africa, mother of Western civilization, a black man of the Nile because he's telling it like it is, but you also will not read white radicals who identified Africa as the origin of the great religions of the world, especially Alvin Boyd Kuhn in his work, Who is this King of Glory? and shot up the third century. We have the death of John Jackson, another radical black historian, with man, God, and civilization. We let some of our great scholars die in hunger, die wanting for friendship. Now, having devoted my greater portion of my life to scholarship and teaching and digging up information on African people and trying to make African people face reality, I have often said a point that I wish you to consider. I didn't have to do it. I chose to do it, and if I had to do it over again, I would do it better. But, I 
have a lot of talent other than the talent to teach and to research. I've never met a rich man who had a better mind than me. So if I wanted to succeed as a rich man, I could have done that. I never met a crook who wasn't a fool. I could have been a good crook if I chose to be a crook. I chose to be a teacher of African history. I chose to look in the Bible where I couldn't find my people. I started looking for them in the world, and I didn't stop until I found them. And I know why they are left out of the Bible. I know why all the angels are wiped. You mean to tell me God is merciful, God is kind, and not one little brown or black angel sneaked in the hell? I ain't buying that. Now the Bible that you get so dewy-eyed over is one of the greatest pieces of propaganda ever written. If you want to read the Bible, why don't you read the Bible one day and read Mein Kampf the next day and see the comparison? That's hard on your mind. Because you think if you don't have Christianity, Islam, or Judaism, you don't have that spirituality. I've got more spirituality after I put all of them down. And I've got more religion after I put all of them down. All right, now let me conclude something that has no conclusion. <laughs> we have to look at the impact of Europeans on Africa. All impacts have been negative. The Romans laughed at the Af early African Christians. Finally, for political reasons, they stopped killing Christians and became Christians. I'm saying the Europeans became Christian for political reasons, as the Arabs became Muslim for political reasons, and the, as the so-called Jews became Hebrews for political reasons. People use organizations for political reasons, and what we get so dewy-eyed and think we're dealing with all the truth. If you look at indigenous African religion, belief systems, if you look at the idea when Africans had no churches of any consequence because these fools came here and said, this is the house of God, and the African looked at that church and said, if God who made the wind, the spring, made the ocean roar, and you won't tell me he can fit into a little thing you call a church? <laughs> that is no house of God. So some of them had the common sense enough to, buy, to move away from it, and some had the common sense to burn it down. I'm saying that you're closer to God when the further way you get away from organized religions that are all handmaidens of conquest. The Roman Empire <laughs> developed during the early period of Christianity. Remember, the Roman Empire started in Africa. It rose in Africa, it fell in Africa. A lot of people need to stop reading some religious books and read some straight history without fact, fable, without supposition, without myth. Read straight history. Read the Mediterranean world in ancient times. She's a racist, she's a bigot, but her chronology is good. And it's a good history of the European trying to move out of Europe into the Mediterranean to find something to eat to put on that gosh darn awful European food. <laughs> he has solved his problems at the expense of other people. The slave trade liberated Europe from the depressed economy they had created with the so-called crusades and through the famines and the plague. Europe always solves its problems by preying on people outside of Europe. They are in a position right now that they have betrayed true socialism, which was not of European origin in the first place. And some people are confused between Karl Marx and Groucho Marx. <laughs> I think a lot of people are Groucho Marxism instead of Karl Marx is. They're funny people. <laughs> and if you think that that system started in Europe, no system as humane as socialism could have started among a bunch of icebox people who pay on their brothers for their breakfast. <laughs> Read Carmen Coulson's work. 
the history of the modern world, especially the early chapters. Now, the evidence of Africans in the New World, the evidence of 1,000 years of civilization before slavery, all of this I'm not discussing because there is no time. But when the Romans disgraced themselves in the mismanagement of Christianity, they created a vacuum. Islam moved into that vacuum. The Africans thought that Islam would get the Romans off of their back. They were right. Islam got the Romans off of their back, and the Arabs jumped on their back, and they're still there using Islam to justify it. Now, the African military man, because we are the greatest fighting machine in the face of the earth, if we ever discovered this, people are going to start running. Under proper leadership, proper inspiration, properly equipped, the black man is the greatest human fighting machine God ever created, if indeed God created it. I think the gods of Africa created it, once you lose track of your heritage, you lose track of your liberty in this world. The Europeans doing the slave trade not only read the African out of history, they colonized history, they colonized information about history, they colonized image. They colonized the image of God. Who told you Christ was what? He was born in that part of the world, predominantly occupied by non-European people. So you should not get into the argument about what he's white. All you have to say, was he a Greek? No. Was he a Roman? No. But these were the only people partially white in the area at the time. If he wasn't a Greek, he wasn't a Roman, he wasn't those other people. You don't have to argue about the shades of color. So far you concerned, once you establish he was not a woman, he was not a Greek, your conversation is over. Yeah. Now, if somebody else wanna argue about his shade, well that, that's their problem. Then if you got a problem with color, then you got a problem with your mother and your father. You have insulted your mother and your father if you don't like what they gave you. I wear mine like a badge of honor. I dig it. I wear it well. All right. Love it. I'm saying in closing, and I am closing, <coughs> that what you have to do is take a holistic look. Not, at, not only at your position in the world, but your potential in the world. You have to learn how to convert everything into an instrument of liberation or leave it alone. You have to realize there were no Greek fraternities and sororities until they were introduced to secret African society. People get all dewy eyes over something that was imposed on them in order to control them without understanding that. That's another impure effort. So it bothers me and although I have good personal friends who are Muslim, not a single Muslim scholar have dealt with that 1,000 years of African independence before slavery and how the Arabs from the north systematically destroyed these nations. They actually it did not occur. 1591, from Morocco, an army was launched against these great independent stations, independent nations in inner West Africa. These were great states and because of poor communication between African and African. There was enough armies in these, uh, in these states to march down to the coast and to drive every slave trader into the sea. But the communication between African and Africa was so poor. Even today, the East Africa is not too clear about what's happening in West Africa. And nobody knows what's happening in North Africa because the conspiracy to hold on to Africa is happening in South Africa and in North Africa. So the whites in North and South Africa are willing to play a part and the pseudo whites in North Africa are willing to play a part. In all this world, 
You have no friends. But if that a million, a billion of you on the face of this earth scattered all over the world, what do you need but the friend other than yourself? Why can't you turn inward on yourself and say, I will wear no clothes I don't produce. Start with your underwear. I wear no shoes that's not, that's not made by a brother. You're creating a shoe factory, employment at once. Start buying aeroplanes, break them down and study them, later on make aeroplanes. What this whole thing is about is the restoration of confidence. It has been the role of these handmaidens of colonialism to destroy your confidence in yourself. You don't believe that you can look like a god. You don't believe a black father in your home is to some extent a god. That doesn't make the black woman less than a goddess. Because we produced the first human society that recognized and respected the female god. We produced the first human society that said you can't be a king unless you got a queen. You can't be a god unless you got a goddess. So you can see all of these social ills that people are defending now, none of it started in our countries. I defy anyone alive, and those who want to come alive, come back and prove me, I invite them too, to show me one single case of sexual deviance, a mild adjustment, any place on the African continent for the coming of foreigners. I defy you to show me one case of teenage pregnancy, one case of ill treatment of women. We got confused with someone else's ideas, someone else's concept and definition of us. What we have to understand is that faith has not spared us for an idle reason. A whole lot of people who've been hit less than us are extinct. What is there in us that made us strong enough to take this heavy blow? 500 years of slavery, one way or the other. Slavery, neo-colonialism. What made us strong enough to survive? What has faith saved us to do? And inasmuch as we gave the world its first humanity, faith has saved us to give the world its last humanity. <laughs> What we have to do is to believe it, to believe that we are worthy of it, and to believe that we are capable of it. What black studies should be about, what black religion should be about, is the restoration of the confidence, and the restoration of the confidence that we must rule the state again. That is not an imitation nation, that not a, an independent nation in Africa, or the Caribbean island. They're all imitation European states. And what we have to understand is that the nation state is stagnant. The African did not live in a nation state, they lived in a territorial state. The African learned something very basic. Cultures have to be fertilized by cultures. People have to be fertilized by the interaction between cultures and cultures. This insecure European tightened his borders, you know. You got a passport to come here? The word passport is not in any African language. The things he invented to restrict himself, he imposed on other people. Once we gain confidence in ourselves, and once we look at that person staring back at us from that mirror and like what we see, and don't move from that mirror until you like what you see. Then, in coordination with other African people throughout the world, we will give the world a new lease on life. We will turn to all of our people and not one part of them. 
because we came from a matrilineal society that respected women to the point the lineage came down to the female side. We must answer the call of the great African-American poet, Margaret Walker, who said, let the dirges end. Let a new peace begin. Let us write a new covenant for the freedom of ourselves in the world. African men throughout the world need to step forward and answer Sister Margaret and say, Sister Margaret, we have heard your call and because we have never been a society that excluded women, with our women at our side, we are ready to pick up the challenge. We are ready to start a revolution that will change the world. We won't get ready tomorrow because tomorrow's things are left to tomorrow. We will start our revolution right now and we will start it with ourselves. Thank you. Since we have run over our time, I'm not quite sure what I should do since we have run over our time, but I know that there are some people who, who think, and we will try to have maybe just two or three um, questions. I see a hand. Dr. John Henry Clark. Let us give him a slave ovation. Dr. John Henry Clark. How you doing? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be in another one of my intellectual homes here at the Slave Theater. Now, I pushed the health button a little too hard and had to go to one of those places called a hospital and deal with some weirdos called doctors. Then, I really wanted to be cured after they finished with me. So I went to some real doctors, my family in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my sisters and the nieces and the nephews and all the family pampering and catering. I began to get it back together again. And coming back to New York City, I had to realize that I wasn't going to change the world in a week. Might take a month, even a year, then I might not be the one to do it. It's difficult for ambitious people to understand that whosoever God is, it's not them. <laughs> I can't make a hurricane, and I can't stop a hurricane. 
I think we, as a people, overdo the God business. We overload God. And he has equipped us with two feet to run the hell out of the way of things. Eyes to see what's coming. Senses, and we shouldn't call in on him so much because, after all, he must make spring in one side of the world and winter in another part of the world and fall on another part. He must have ice in one part and rain on the other part and watch those fishes in the sea. He must watch that sparrow who don't know what limb he wants to light on or what song he wants to sing. <laughs> so why can't you do something for yourself with the equipment that he's given you. Now, my notes for tonight deal with the African world under siege. We are the most potentially powerful people in all the world, and yet we have not used our power we have let people develop something called a new world order without consulting a single one of us. Not knowing that the great mental wealth comes out of a continent that is ours by every law of God and man. And if we were united within Africa, if the organization of African unity had some unity, they could say, there will be no new world order until you consult me. You'll get no diamonds, you'll get no gold, you'll get no manganese, you'll get no cobalt. You'll get nothing out of this continent. And we can pull Western industry to its knees without buying a shot. And we don't have to call this a boycott. Just call it selective buying and selling. We'll be selective about who we buy from and selective about who we sell to. And when we can control commodity markets based on the essence of power, we will be respected in the arena of power. The essence of power no matter what the government is and no matter what the time is, the essence of power is the ability to include and exclude. That's all it boils down to. Who goes here and with whose permission? No matter what kind of government you live in, you, have to, you stop at this gate and give an account of yourself or you move no further. Throughout the whole world, our enemy has either been at the gate, in the house, or in the bed. Because we have not been able to control our enemy. Because we have been hospitable to strangers. We have not asked the stranger, what is your mission in my house? We have not done what the old black father used to do when the father was truly an image in the house. When you come to call his daughter, on the third visit, the daughter don't show up. And the father comes into the living room and looks you over. Says, son, what's your intentions toward my daughter? If you don't give him an answer, the daughter continues to be late. And you don't come there anymore. Now, what we got a whole continent never been defended militarily. People been able to just walk in, take what they want. Why haven't we asked these strangers, what is your intention in this house? And if I'm attacked while you're in the house, Whose side are you going to be on? And I, if I'm not satisfied with your answer, the door is over there. The one that lets you in will let you out. Now, I want to take a holistic look at African 
people under siege, not just in Africa, but all over the world. I want to take a look at the propaganda against our mind that makes some of us think that we belong to a separate race that fell off of the moon. <coughs> we are all one single people. There's only one single African people, though some of them might live on some specks of dust in the Caribbean Sea, and some of them might live in Georgia, and some of them might live in Africa. There's only one African people, and we have one enemy. And that enemy has one intention, to control us and our mineral wealth, to control our show line, and through propaganda, control our mind. Now this thing started in the 1700s BC. It continued through the invasion from Western Asia, 1675 BC, for 2,000 years, the enemies of Africa came from Western Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East. And what did they do? What was their collective impact? was to take away from the African's mind through propaganda the concept that the African could control a state. And when people take away from you the idea of controlling a state, they take away the container of your culture, your aspirations, your hope. They take away the gift you have to give to your child and their children in turn. You are motherless and a fatherless child politically in the world when someone takes away from you the cover, your clothing, your cultural clothing, your political clothing, the idea of controlling a state all by yourself. And you forget that half of civilization Half of history was over before anyone knew that a European was in the world. And what makes you think you need him so much? He's a pauper in the world and a thief and a robber in the world. What makes you think you need him? Now to break the siege of African people, we have to stop playing games with each other. We have to stop identifying with our oppressor and our colonial master and identify with ourselves as an African people. We have to take our nose out of the air and stop boasting about our Dutch uh, 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 Scottish grandfather and uncle. We have to stop saying we are British horse. England don't want you as anything other than servant. America don't want you as anything other than servant. Because all of these colonial masters you've had want you only servant after they've had you as slaves. When you identify with them, you're identifying with the people who raped your grandfather, grandmother, and you are demeaning your children still to be born. Today you have a fight between the Francophone African and the Anglophone African. Who is superior? They're both talking about French culture and English culture. They're both talking about an oppressor's culture. They're not arguing about African language. Now who speaks Wolof, who speaks Zulu, who speaks Ashanti? Who speaks French and who speaks English? And they both got their nose in the air looking down on each other over a foreigner's language. It's not their mother tongue. Who in the hell cares about either one of it?
Language is a utility. Learn as many languages as you can. It's an employment calling card. But don't get so romanticized because thank you, because you speak French. You are French. <laughs> and because some Scottish man raped your grandmother, don't think that you are Scottish. You are the victim of a Scotsman. You are the victim in as much as he infused his blood into your family against your will. Now, the question is, how do we break this siege? But let's stop playing games with each other. What Reverend Sullivan is trying to do can be marginally, marginally beneficial if you handle it right. But you have to understand the difference between pan-capitalism and pan-Africanism. Pan-capitalism is American corporations dominating the wealth of Africa. Pan-Africanism is African people throughout the world controlling the wealth of Africa. In every country in Africa, without any exception, all of the wealth-producing resources are in European or white control. Recently, on a trip to Ghana, I discovered that the Ghanaians are selling the gold mines to South Africa. The open hand, not selling it, has finished the sale. Their commercial bank, a system of commercial bank, carefully built by Western trained Ghanaians, going to be sold to National City. They devaluated the money while we were there. Now, if you can't make a decision about the wealth of your country, a foreigner will decide whether you pay the soldiers whether you pay your civil servants, they devaluate your money when they get ready, and sooner or later, they're going to demand your land as collateral. And when people take your land, they take away your nation. Land is the basis of nation. This is why I have not gotten so dewy-eyed over Nelson Mandela. Whites own 87% of the land in South Africa. He has not asked for the return of the land. A small minority of white. This one thing we have to get it through our skulls. We will share in Africa only to the extent that someone shares with us in Europe. And if we think we're going to go down the NACP route, we just got to have one near us. If we're going to buy this bag of worms called integration before we integrate into ourselves, there's not enough head examiners to set us straight. I'm not interested in Africans sharing with foreigner who was an invader in the first place, uninvited in the second place. In the South Africa, in the rest of Africa, I'm interested in African rule. Now, if anybody lives in Africa, and this includes the Arabs, who cannot live under African rule, show him the nearest airport, a transportation going to tell them to find some other geography to live. Because nobody, but nobody came into Africa to do Africa any favors. And everybody and everything that was brought into Africa from the outside did Africa more harm than good. 
Now this might break a whole lot of people's hearts because you've got some romance about these different religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam was a, was the handmaiden of imperialists, a conquered belief. What made you think you needed it in as much as if you read St. Augustine in his interpretation of the conference in Nicaea, he said, these people are trying to give us the religion we had 3,000 years ago. And if you read John Jackson's Man, God, and Civilization and Pagan Origins of the Christ Myth, you will discover that had Christ rose 2,000 years before, he could have read his own autobiography. The Jews took him up and placed him inside of an already existing myth copied from Africa. I'm not saying the Bible is not good. I'm saying it's a series of teaching tools and teaching lessons through mythology and supposition. It's an illustrated lesson, but if you think the illustration is true, then you need to examine history. Right. Then you need to ask some questions. Right. How is that Noah can plant grapes one day and drink the wine the next day. It takes three weeks to ferment the wine to get ready. Ferment the grapes to get ready to make the wine. He got his wine the next day. What makes you think that a people have to leave Africa by the sea, pardon, to let them out, when there was a 16 mile land bridge, they walked in, why can't they walk out? You need a dramatic, somebody needed a dramatic story to dramatize the myth of their slavery in Africa. When they were actually guests in Africa's home, Africa saved them from hunger. And when they associated themselves with the conquerors of Africa, the Africans said, now you got to go. Now they're going to dramatize and say they were slaves in Egypt. And anytime anybody said he was slaves in Egypt, ask them what period and under what administration. The period when they were supposed to be slaves was the period when Egypt was conquered from the Western Asia. If they were slaves at all, then I doubt this. They were slaves under foreign domination, and we are not to blame. People can accuse you of being, having them enslaved with one breath and say the Egyptians were white in the, in the next breath. Now come on, get your lie together. I'm a Bap former Baptist Sunday school teacher, and I still have absolute respect for the Baptist church because it's closer to Africa in its ceremony than any other church. I'm also brave enough to admit that very often it is loud and wrong. And I also like to admit being loud and wrong and sometimes corrupt, they can outsing any method who ever lived. <laughs> now, Back to work because we suffer today over a lot of things we haven't looked back at. We are imitating people who are imitators. We follow a people who don't know where they are going. Look at Europe today. If we had enough army, all we would need to conquer Europe was shoes. Europe is laying awake, open for conquest. If the Africans who invaded Spain in 711, when they march to the door of Paris, then changed their mind and went back to elect a new caliph, the head of their faith, when they came back to Spain, they changed their mind about conquering Europe. 
Africa could have conquered all Europe. They had the army to do it. Why don't we kick people when they're down or take advantage of people when they're in a difficult position? We have the humanity not to do it. Why didn't someone spare us? Because they lacked the humanity not to do it. <laughs> Just this day, because I'm writing the text for an illustrated history of slavery, I was dealing with the motive behind slavery that we have not looked at, the contradiction that we have not looked at, and what they deprived us of was the concept of the state. Now, the Greeks put this process in motion, then the Romans, and then the Romans were so corrupt, they created a vacuum, and a camel boy began to grumble. He asked for reform. Didn't get reform, he asked for a new religion. That religion was Islam. It's a pity most of the moderns haven't even studied, they haven't even read the Quran too well. Because the African thought that the, the Arab would get the Romans off of their backs. They were right. The Arab got the Roman off of his back and replaced the Roman on his back, and he's still on his back. The Arab was in the slave trade before Islam. The Arab was in the slave trade a thousand years before the European slave trade. People will not deal with this because they will not deal with honesty. All religion, all fraternities, all everything that touch your life must be an instrument of your liberation or you must throw it into the ash can of history. <laughs> We have no time for ceremony without substance. We must be led back to where we fell from, the control of the state, all by ourselves, and not the imitators of our colonial masters or our slave masters. This is our crisis all over the world. Why then is it that all of the wealth producing resources of Africa, with no exception, is controlled by Europeans. They have convinced your mind that you cannot control the wealth of your own country. You cannot control the gold that comes from the ground in your own country. You cannot make the ships or manage the harbor in your own country. And so long as you do not believe this, you're going to turn this over to other people. And you need to study the history of the rise of modern Japan. When Perry went and kicked open the door, a great Japanese educator, Baron Tanaka, called the young people of Japan together and said, we will accept this humiliation and we'll work ourselves out of it, but it won't happen again. We'll send our children to all of our schools. And they did this. By 1905, they had mastered enough technique to take on Russia kick Russia's butt and people started to leave them alone. And they started a concept called the yellow pill, the danger from Asia. They were making the airplane, everything, and not a single Japanese came home with a foreign wife. Right. Now, someone needed to instruct the Africans coming to the West. that if you bring a wife home, she should look like you. These other people don't fit into our culture, don't fit into our society. 
And I didn't send you away to find romance. I sent you away to develop technique and to learn a procedure that will make this nation free of foreign domination. You trained in England, you come back, you're an engineer with a collar and tie on. Good engineers don't wear no collar and tie on the job after hours because good engineers do not just tell you what to do, they show you what to do. And if you got to lay a pipeline, they, they, they demonstrate with their own hand how to do it. Once you catch on, then he'll stand aside and look at you. Many times we go abroad and we come home, African bodies, foreign mind, and sometimes a foreign woman. But the foreign woman has a program. She's a spy in your camp and a spy in your bed. She's an element of control. Now, I've met a few halfway decent interracial relationships in my life, but this is not anything that I advocate. I do not advocate pan capitalism either because I know that Capitalism was based on the money and the resources they captured in the slave trade. I know the whole of the Western world, its might, was based on this. Because I've studied the history of Europe after the Crusades, the history of Europe searching for something in the East, sweets and spices, something to put on that gosh darn all the European food that they could eat it. The slave trade saved the economy of Europe. And the slave trade varied, but the slave trade is still intact. And because we have not listened to our greatest messengers, we are dependent on other people. And if they take a holiday, we don't know where to get a loaf of bread in our own neighborhood. But if we ran the stores, we'd keep some stores open. We have to develop a concept of making jobs for each other because we are being pushed out of basic jobs. I'm not talking about high tech jobs now. I'm talking about stewardship on the railroad. Bell captain, head waiter. Many black men educated a generation with these tips. And job these white people being a strategic Uncle Tom. There's a difference between a Tom and a strategic Uncle Tom. <laughs> See, a regular Tom, he just Toms for the submissiveness of it. But a strategic Tom will get something out of this action. He talks to the white folks, he's feeding them, talk about his boy at college, and finally he says, you know, I've got some suits for my boy, he's outgrown them, maybe your boy can like, you know, could use them. He talked himself up to a few suits, they ain't paid a nickel. You tell them how good the boy is doing, they're going to leave him. I'm going to contribute $50, you know. Meantime, go to the barber shop, he's brushing them off, you know, and complimenting them, calling them SOBs on his breath. <laughs> because you haven't studied anything, you, you just latch on the thing, you don't read no books about it. I have never met a black Christian who is a scholar on Christianity. I have never met a Muslim who's a scholar on Islam. I have never met a Muslim scholar, a Muslim period, who will admit that the Arabs were in the slave trade a thousand years before the European and they're still in the slave trade. 
I've never met a Muslim willing to deal with the fact that Africans are being killed in the Sudan right now solely because they're not them. The Africans are being driven out of Mauritania right now solely because they're not Muslim and solely because African Muslims are being driven out of the Sudan solely because they're not of Arab extraction. And nobody, absolutely nobody, is lifting their voice about it. I've never met a Muslim scholar who can deal with the collapse of the Western Sudan when Africa was invaded from Morocco and those states were destroyed in inner Africa. And this destruction facilitated the spread of the slave trade inland. Now while we're dealing with Africa under siege, will we deal with the fact that part of this siege is coming from North Africa as another siege is coming from South Africa? And that nobody came to Africa to share any power with Africans or to be ruled by Africans or to be ruled in, in relationship with African people. They came to take everything. They take away your belief system. They laugh at your gods. And they gave you a religion you already had and used much better than they used because you actually believed it. But you accept their concept of it. And by accepting their concept of it, you become a prisoner to the religion. I'm not saying leave Christianity, Islam, or Judaism. I'm saying develop a black concept, a black approach to it. And that black approach to it must feed into black liberation. And if anybody don't like it, tell them to go to hell. If a conqueror brings you religion, you use it your way, for your purpose. You have to respect your own culture and your own belief systems. The African tried to bring man in harmony with nature. And those fools out of Europe tried to defy nature. They think whoever God is, is one of them. When a hurricane hits, they sometimes wonder. Now, how are we going to break this siege? We must get back the main thing that was taken away from us. And that is the concept of the state, the ability to manage the state and manage it well. We must take some, some pledges. Our leaders must do some radical things. I once advocated that Martin Luther King should stand before a black audience and take off all of his clothes except his underwear and say, I declare from this day forward I will wear no clothes that my people don't make. Right. I will wear no shoes people don't make. I will eat what comes from my people's farm. And I will never ride in a limousine until my people make a limousine. Right. He could have revolutionized black industry. Now you know how well we like to see the pastor dressed up. Our best tailor will be on that needle and on that machine, making the pastor a suit, have more suits than he can wear. I'm not saying boycott, but selective buying. Not only patronize each other, learn how to be courteous to each other. You cater to custom. If customers are catered to, then let's cater to each other. A, we are a mismanaged gold mine. And everybody can come into our community and make a fortune except us. Because being under siege, our mind is under siege. Someone else's ice is cold. 
It's that belief in yourself. We have suffered a tragedy over and beyond that of any other people on the face of this earth. We have suffered a brain transplant. We use someone else's brain, someone else's thinking, wearing someone else's clothes. Suppose we said we will wear the shoes we don't, we don't make. Who do you think is making the shoes for flow shine? If black people can make shoes for flow shine to sell, you think under good management they can't make the same better shoes for themselves to sell? So it's not a matter of not being able to do it, but doing it under your own management and having your confidence. Now you got whites in the personal care business. Dairy Africans in this country use the word African in their advertisement. They gonna copyright a word in the dictionary? We don't see the contradiction in this? We could have saved Johnson products. His black wife sold it to a white company. We don't think about loyalty to each other, loyalty to the people. Where are our young executives going to be assured of a job? Where are our children going to work? They're going to be turned out of these white firms sooner or later. They're being turned out every day. People are employing East Indians. And sometimes they employ West Indians or Caribbean people. To all of the show that they have contempt for black America. One of the reasons why this move against black America, sometimes by Caribbean people and sometimes by Africans, is that they know one thing about the black American. Our oppressor has drained us of illusions. You might have illusions about being a British officer. You might have illusions about belonging to France. But this cruel white man has told us something that we remember. He has said, you don't, you're not wanted here. You don't belong here. You ain't got no damn illusions about being American because when you fight for America, they still don't want you. Now, Colin Powell might be able to get a taxi quicker than I can because he's a little bit on the light side. John Johnson of Johnson Publishing. He's about the same complexion and he's tall, so they can see him first. The last assessment, almost seven years ago, he had 200 million reserved. He can buy 10 taxi fleets. Let him walk out and try to get a cab at LaGuardia Airport. His chances are no better than mine. <laughs> And once we understand that, we cannot transcend this beautiful color that our ancestors and God was gracious enough to give to us. And we should not try. Because it's a badge of honor, so wear it like a badge of honor. And I like it. I wear it well. I dig it. I thank my mother and father. <laughs> Not to like it insults your mother and father. To call your hair bad is to insult your mother and father and such the continent that produced you. Because that coarse hair helped you against the sun on the continent that produced you. If it was soft and curly, you probably wouldn't have been here talking about it. 
There's no such thing as good or bad hair. Good is what nature gave you to cover you, what nature put you down. So we have to stop all of this nonsense. We have to stop all the ceremony that has no substance. Now, I'm not against any of the belief systems of the world, although some people in them get on my nerves. Because they're not going any place and they're hiding behind a lot of religious ceremony to keep them being in part of our struggle. Some people in struggle in, 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 in one of the religions, they, they, they don't vote, they don't do anything, they don't participate in the activity in the community. They're out of the struggle. And yet when I go to Ghana, when I compare 1958, when I went the first time, and when I went a few weeks ago, Ghana is a nation of Jesus freaks. They're scratching at Nkrumah's grave and not dealing with the fact that they betrayed Nkrumah and his dream. Because the dream was pan-Africanism, not pan-capitalism. Now, I know Reverend Sullivan, and I think he thinks he is sincere, and maybe he is. But if his plan succeeds, the cooperation and investors will take over Africa, and there'll be nothing for the Africans. But under pan-Africanism, Africans will come to their senses and say, if you sell a car in Africa, just sell me the parts, we'll assemble it. So that's jobs for the Africa. And sooner or later, the Africa will be making cars from scratch. He's assembling cars and he's studying cars. If you're going to make 10 locomotives, all you need is one locomotive. Just break it down and make the essential parts. Now, what I'm trying to conclude with is how do we break this siege? We have to stop talking nonsense based on our relationship with an oppressor. The black English have to go out of business. The black French have to go out of business. The black British have to go out of business. We have to understand we are one people wherever we are on the face of the earth. We have to realize that we have to con connect with the African people of the Pacific. The African people in India, with all of those people, and the people in Africa, in the South Pacific, in Brazil, in the Caribbean islands, there are a billion African people on the face of the earth. Now, who who do we need as an ally other than ourselves? Once we get ourselves together, it is not who we will have as an ally. It's who we will permit to associate with us and on what terms, and the terms will be our terms or no terms at all. then we would have freed our mind from dependency on slave masters and former colonial masters and realize that everything of worth in our country must be controlled by us. All wealth-producing resources must be controlled by us. And we wear no shoes that we didn't make. We wear no clothes that we didn't make. We eat no bread that didn't come from one of our farms. Once you become self-sustaining, you'll understand what goes into the making of the state. Then you will have to look back at your greatest messenger. See what Booker T. Washington had to say. 
Stop calling Booker T. Washington a Tom. Booker T. Washington, if you understand him, especially his Atlanta compromise speech, Booker T. Washington was one of the most unique black con men who ever lived. Black people couldn't give Booker T. Washington the kind of money to build and hold Tuskegee open. Read his Atlanta speech called the Atlanta Compromise. Compromise hell. Read it. When he was telling blacks it's better to own a truck farm than to sit next to whites at an opera. And whites, oh my God, he believes in segregation. You're booking some more money. You would have to cash down your buckets where you are. Then he told whites that in the South, we have not only fix your food and nurse your children, we have followed you with tear dripped eyes to your grave. Give Booker some more money. <laughs> Booker was calling those people out of millions of dollars. Carnegie thought so much of Booker T. Washington, he put a half a million dollars in the bank and told Booker T. Washington, go get the interest each year. The interest is yours as long as you live. Now, the interest on a half a million dollars, even 75 years ago, Booker died in 1915. Well, in as much as my age has been printed so many places, I. I I, just, I was born in 1950. <laughs> the interest was 20 or 30,000 a year. Now, Booker T. Watch did a whole lot of things we need to examine. He became literally the dictator of black America. But he was dictating an educational policy based on self reliance. If you wear shoes, Learn to make shoes. If you live in a brick house, why not own a brick yard? That's nation building. That's self-reliance. When he went to Europe and saw that the poor Europeans sometimes were worse off than the poor blacks in America, and he wrote a book which very few people read called The Man Further Is Down, he saw the connection between the poor people of the world and thought they had no right, no business fighting each other. And they don't really. A poor white person got the same enemy as a poor black person. That don't mean I'm going to invite him to dinner or go to bed with him. But that's a fact. They should fight to improve their condition. Socially, they need to go their separate ways. So again, in Booker T. Washington's speech, when he said that we can be uh, as divided as the fingers and together as the fists, and all things that make for social progress, why well, reach for the pocket again? Give Booker some more money. Other schools wanting money from whites had to go through Booker to get it. He not only built Tuskegee, he had to build Piney Wood School and other schools in the South. You call him a Tom? Did you do it? The schools are still there? Did you put it there? And then we got to look at Du Bois and stop all the nonsense about there being a fight between Du Bois and God in, 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 in uh, Washington. That was a difference of opinion. It wasn't a matter of needing Du Bois or Booker T. Washington. The matter was the same then as it is now. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. We need, du Bois, need Booker T. Washington for the education. We need Du Bois for the culture and the political. We still need it that way. Put the two together. Look what you got. They were both master teachers and major intellect. Du Bois coming from New England, Washington come from the rural South. They were both teaching nation building, nation reclamation, get back what slavery and colonialism 
took away. And after the death of Washington and Du Bois moved to the center stage of leadership briefly until the emergence of Marcus Garvey. Right. To broaden the picture now, right. let's reclaim out. Let's go home. Let's go home in our own ship, with our own sea captain. Right. It was a great and noble dream. Right. The money was lost, but nobody cried, nobody sued. He took us down Dream Street. Psychologically, we needed it. Newton Baker, the American Secretary of War, had told the black American soldier coming back from war, your lot will not appreciably change because you had fought in World War I. And to prove it, black children were burned to death on bonfires in East St. Louis. It was called the Red Summer. Garvey went to Chicago and rallied the people and told them, look, they don't want you here. You were kings and queens in Africa. You can be again. You were sea captains once. You can be that again. He was good for our ego, good for our spirit. And he built the largest black organization before our sense. We need to read what he wrote, not what was written about him, read that too. But first and foremost, read Marcus Garvey's fundamentalism. Most Gar Garveyites don't even read Garvey very well. I don't want to talk about Roy Ennis at all. That's a separate lecture. One day, I will discuss the bastardized mind, black mulatto, black in skin, and mulatto inside of their mind. Totally mixed up. If I was a dictator, and I'm not going to say I didn't, wouldn't like to be one, at least for a little while. Roy's execution will be before my breakfast while I'm having here. <laughs> my last word on the subject is that I wish his mother and father had slept through that night and not disturbed themselves. <laughs> And we are going to restore the idea of the state. We're going to have to raise a generation that will believe. Bill Cosby did something the other night that we need to pay some attention to. He just walked on the stage with a chair, sat down, and talked. He raised some questions about why aren't we talking about some of our children who made it? All of them are not shooting each other, and all of them are not shooting dope. Why don't we deal with men calling our women bitches? Why do we deal with people on the street selling T-shirts? 90% bitch and 10% whore. And black women wearing this shirt, demeaning themselves. Why don't we, when do we deal with TV shows when blacks call each other nigger and blacks laugh at it? He just raised some principal questions that we'd better deal with as a people if we're gonna survive. The media and mind control. And having dealt with it, he picked up the chair and walked away. Probably one of the finest performances I've ever seen him give. There's no planning, no script, no nothing. Just sit down and talk to your people. And people don't talk to us enough. We don't talk to our children enough. We don't have breakfast together enough. We don't ask enough questions. We don't ask about their teachers. 
and they cop out on us and get away with it. We have to come together again as a family and as a community and realize that all foreigners who came into Africa, those who came a thousand years before the Arabs and the Arabs themselves declared war on African culture, war on the structure of the African family. And we become so romanticized over a religion that they brought, we quite forget that they brought, they infuse into that religion a lot that is Arab culture. We also forget that the three major Western religions all taken out of Africa and rehashed and redressed and sold to us a male chauvinist murder cult. I'm not saying leave them, but stop imposing them on us through their concept. Develop a concept that is distinctly yours and don't care who don't like it. If it serves you well, use it. <laughs> we did not come from a society where women sit on one side, men sit on the other side. We never had a belief system that separated men from women. We had a culture system where the mother was a deity. We brought into the world the first system where women were God. The first system where women rode at the head of their armies did not send their armies into battle, but led their armies into battle. We created the first system where women headed a state. And even now in parts of Africa, when the woman is not the king, she is the king maker. We're imitating everybody except the best of ourselves. White women live, don't have the answer. You need a liberation movement for black women 10 times better than the one they have. But you need not imitate them because they are about something which you need not be about. You were never anti-man. A lot of these people are anti-man. And they boast about the strong black woman taking the manhood from black men, somebody else's propaganda. I decided to investigate this one day and I found a strong black woman. I said, strong black woman, what do you want? He said, I want a strong black man to help me get along. <laughs> What we need to do is to come back to ourselves, talk to each other again, stroke each other again, love and pamper each other again, draw strength one to the other. We need to start visiting grandma the way we used to. We need to tell the kids, if you don't behave yourself, I ain't going to take you to grandma. They know grandma got those cookies ready, the cake ready. Sometimes she makes a special cake just for the children. They can sit down and eat that little cake before the others get there. Grandmama supervision. They ain't going to miss all of this. They're going to behave themselves just to get the grandma's hugs and kisses and the cakes and the ice cream. Why don't we be like we used to be? Let us start by saying good morning to each other, at least occasionally. And we get accustomed to saying it all the time. Let us draw up a plan for our own salvation and explain it with some kind of simplicity to ourselves and our children. And let us understand that faith has not spared us for an ideal purpose. We gave the world its first humanity. 
faith has spared us to give the world its next humanity and to give to our children <clears throat> a program of salvation and liberation so that they can in turn give to their children and wait for the still more beautiful ones waiting to be born. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. John Henry Clark, let's give a big hand. <laughs> Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. Clark. And we lost our connection with Africa, which means this is why the Garvey period was so important, because he was restoring that connection. We didn't fully understand it then, we don't fully understand it now. For people to exist without a nationality, a, an identification with a piece of land. He is a legless man, not only part of his body is inoperative, part of his mind is inoperative, part of his psychic being is not there. Because for a human being to feel whole, he must identify <clears throat> with land and he must understand something that is the difference between being a subject and a citizen. It is in this period that we became confused between the two. Up until the end of the 19th century we knew we were not citizens of the United States, no matter what the paper said. We knew we were subjects. And because we knew we were subjects, we had our fighting spirit intact. And this was an international thing, not something applicable to the blacks in the United States. But those in the Caribbean were doing the same thing, understanding the fakery of their emancipation. We begin to understand the fakery of our emancipation. And the Africans had already understood the fakery of the change between chattel slavery and colonialism, a more sophisticated form of slavery. Now, in a book called The Betrayal of the Negro, Rayford Logan has a chapter called the Nadia, or the lowest period. Now, the preface to the Booker T. Washington era is the Nadia, the lowest spiritual period, the lowest economic period in our history in this country. All right. 1874, 1875, we had been betrayed. The southern troops, the federal troops had been withdrawn from the south, permitting the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the, white, the Knights of the White Camilla, and all other racist organizations. 
both the North and the South had betrayed us in favor of a vote for Tilton B. Hayes, the new president. Many of the safeguards had been withdrawn and no one wanted to talk about the promise of the 40 acres and the mule. No one wanted to talk about this anymore. Now, had we gotten the 40 acres and the mule, and had we not lost feeling for the land, we would be the feeders of America today because this came at a time before the immigrant, uh, immigrant migration, and it came at a time when whites did not want to farm. And had we mastered the land, we could have controlled what this nation ate. And we would have been moderately wealthy doing so, because that means we would be controlling some other thing. All right. It was a period of industrialization in the United States. This is the period of the Vanderbilt the rise of the Vanderbilts, the Harrimans, the railroad people, the Rockefellers, and the Carnegie, the, the steel people, Andrew Mellon and Carnegie. Now these men were rich thugs. Make no mistake about it, they were thugs. But these thugs now wanted respectability. And this white philanthropy, now they've been told that you get a better press by giving to the Negro. So they discovered us at a time when none of us had any big money to give to endow anything. We had already built the independent black church in large the large institutions. We have built more independent institutions than any African people living outside of Africa. Not because we are more industrial, and not because we've got more money, and not because we've got more brains, but because the kind of thugs who can, white thugs control the United States deprived us of so much, either we had to build it ourselves or do without it altogether. And so the church could not be just a church. The church was a community center. Part of the day the church was the school. And occasionally in trouble the church was the hiding place. And the church played a major role in the physical protection of black people because the one person that they would partly listen to was the black minister. All right, now, we're approaching this period now when white philanthropy want to know what to do with us. Bishop Turner has not only a role, but Bishop Turner is on the warpath. Bishop Turner has already made one of his back to Africa trips. Now he actually took people back to Africa. More, more people went under Bishop Turner than under Garvey. We've forgotten Bishop Turner. It's unfortunate we've forgotten most of our heroes Bishop Turner hated what the country had done to his people so much, he would mount an American flag in the pulpit before his sermon. And for 15 minutes, starting with the statement, this flag ain't nothing but a GD rag, <laughs> he would preach 15 minutes against the flag and the betrayal of his people in the lives of the country telling his people. Then he would calm himself down and pick up his Bible and preach a sermon. 
No. Bishop Turner was on the raid. White people wanted to know who is the leader of these radical people? Who can I communicate to calm them down? Not getting any answer, they decided they would create a leader. And they would anoint him. This is the beginning of the age of the anointed leader. But don't judge Booker too fast now because Booker ran as many games on them <laughs> as, he, as they ran on him and got millions for education while doing it and hated their guts. If you read Up From Slavery, this is not reflected in his book Up From Slavery. It's reflected in his personal letters, now 10 volumes of his letters have been published. Now whites decided to tap this young man and prepare him for leadership and they alerted the edit editors of all the white newspapers to start writing editorials about him and literally deliver him to us as our leader. That was an ex exhibition in Atlanta the Atlanta Cotton Exhibition. Booker D. Washington was going to be the keynote speaker. Though he was the keynote speaker, he had to arrive and come through a Jim Crow door and wait in a Jim Crow section until it was his time to speak. And when he started speaking, Though we were in the 19th century, when he finished, we were in the 20th century. In the troubles of the 20th century. This evening I've been trying to find the actual speech. I must have at least six copies in the house and couldn't find one. Booker T. Washington began his speech. His speech is all things to all people. And if you want to listen to a con game, <laughs> Booker T. Washington's famous Atlanta speech is one of the most unique con speeches ever made. He's catering to the whites of the southerner, and he's catering to the northerner. And he have his clincher. He's telling the blacks that it's better to run a truck farm than to do all of this stump political speaking. This pleases the whites. Get us out of politics. He's, he, he, he's padding both sides. That uh, it's best, he's telling the general blacks. It's best to make a dollar a day. A dollar a day was a pretty good salary for a black men in that period. Then to sit next to whites at the opera. He's telling the whites, we don't want social, social equality. All we want is a job. They like that. <laughs> now, Booker is tell, began to tell the northerner Build factories in the South. We will not strike like the immigrant craftsman up north. He called the foreigner who strikes and found labor unions an ingrate. The North lacks that. He tells the South, be good to us, we're your friends. We'll not only nursed your children, took care of you in days of old. Then his clincher, we even followed you with tear-dripped eyes to your grave. <laughs> he got the South now. Now he got the South, he got the North, he got part of the Black. If he continues the speech, 
His speech now is an appeal to all of them. And he tells a story about a man at sea shouting to all the ships that pass, water, water, give me water. And finally a ship shouts out to him, cast down your buckets where you are. But you sailed out of the salty sea, you're now in the Gulf Stream, and to clear, there's clear water all around you. <laughs> Just cast down your bucket <laughs> and drink the water. Beautiful symbol. Now he's telling both the blacks in the south, the northerner, invest in the south. Invest some faith you know, in the south. Then he glances widely over the audience. He had come through the exhibitions and said that the caliber of a race is known by what it displays and said that we have uh, on display here in this exhibition some quilts and some, some of our agricultural products and it shows how, how our um, how far we've come from slavery, and also shows how much we need from you. Now the white money men open up their pockets, and if that's all they can do, I'm going to give them a few nickels that they can do a little better than that. <laughs> now he tells blacks that if you're going to be a servant, be a good servant and get a good salary. Now what he's saying is practical and it was high politics for that day. Brilliant politics for the day. Finally, he finishes the speech, saying that if all these things are achieved, we shall have a new heaven and a new earth. Couldn't be better than that. Now, amid all these applause, black sitting in the balcony, You notice that some blacks are crying. Some black waving their hands. Oh no, book, it ain't that good. <laughs> Come on, knock, knock it off, bro. <laughs> and some of them came up, come up to him and start, and some refused to shake his hand. Why this went unnoticed? Black rejection of what he said because blacks knew it was partly fantasy. He was running a game that couldn't be that good. After Booker T. Washington's speech, many blacks began to vote with their feet, began to leave the South. And when you, any history of the migration of blacks from the South, it began in earnest after this speech. Because blacks suspected that something was going wrong. Now, white editorial writers made Booker T. Washington the leader of black America. They made him the leader of black America declared that he was, and white philanthropy began to filter all the, not just for Tuskegee, the money that any black got for education had to come through Booker Washington. He was literally the dictator of black America. Now, I'm not so much against dictators if something good is being dictated, and sometime he dictated something good. All right, Booker Washington, this was his era, it is starting now. But what you have to do is to look at what happened not only in black America, but what happened in the totality of the African world in the years between the time he made that speech, 1895 and 1901.
those brief years, 1896, a light-skinned person who could pass for white and who'd been passing most of the time, got on a train and got in the white section, sit in the white section. But the conductor who knew his family <laughs> wanted him to go to the black section. This is the Percy versus Ferguson case. After this case, the Supreme Court said everything had to be separate so long it was equal. It was never equal. And the intent was never to make it even, e equal. Now to show you the difference between the British and the United States, the British are oppressors with style. You're just as dead when one, either, no matter which one kills you now. <laughs> well, let's get that clear. They're both murderers. Only the British got style. Well, style won't bring you back alive if they kill you. <laughs> All right. The British said that not only justice must be done, but it must appear to have been done. <laughs> See, America won't even tell that lie. <laughs> See, they don't even try to cover it up with words. They're blatant about it. They say it must be separate, but has to be equal. And they, from then on, they began to make Jim Crow laws. The schools are not equal. Nothing is equal. The accommodation is not equal. In some places, there's no accommodation at all. In some cities where there is no black theater, there is no black school of consequence. And when you get the, when you've got a black school, many times those schools got the hand-me-down books from the white school. I know that for sure because I went to one. So nothing was equal. Now, most of the Jim Crow laws were passed in that five-year period between 1895 and 1900. There was a law in Mississippi saying that a black woman couldn't appear in any of the, on any of the main streets unless she had an apron and a cap on indicating she was a maid. And she couldn't go into any theater unless she was a nurse watching some white kid. So because this custom spread to other states, many blacks who wanted to see a given move at a white theater, they put on a cap and put on an apron and grab some little, <laughs> little white boy and say they're watching him for <laughs> winning the theater. <laughs> integrated a generation ahead of integration. But that's neither here nor there. Now, 1896 again, let's look at Africa. 1896 in Africa, the British are trying to move into the hinterland of Ghana. All they've got is the coast. They've been there over 100 years, but all they've got to control is the coast. They tried to, then they move in, level penalties on the then king, Prempe. Finally, the Akan people decide that they're not in a position to fight this war. Best to let the king go into exile and save the nation. So they bring the king comes out to genuflex to the British and go into exile. And some British sergeant grabs the king by the neck, nephew, a king whose lineage goes back further than the oldest king lineage of Europe, over a thousand years and traceable, pushes the king's face down on the shoes of the British governor along with his mother. Purpose, humiliation. 
And he turns and says in his language, O kinsman, is this necessary? And the British exile him to a dungeon in Elmina Castle. Subsequently, they sent him to Seychelles Island in the Red Sea. But this is the period of the exiling of African kings who oppose colonialism. The king of Dahomey was exiled at the same time. Sekatoure's grandfather, Samori, was exiled at the same time. Several of the Zulu kings were exiled at the same time. The politics of exile as we come close to the end of the century, they became more aware of our possibility claiming freedom than we did. Now the same year he made the speech, a young man from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, having finished this, was now at Harvard. One year after the speech, this young man was so brilliant, he wrote the first book in the Harvard series. And one of the first books published by Harvard, written by a student, named W.E.B. Du Bois. His book, The Suppression of the Slave Trade, to the, new, the African slave trade to the United States. Still worth reading. The statistics are good. And because we assume that the difference of opinion between W.E.B. Du Bois and Washington was a fight, we, we figured that we got to get on one side or the other. We wanted to fight at all. It was a difference of opinion. We can have difference of opinion without converting them into fights. Du Bois from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, growing up in a predominantly white cup uh, uh, town, community, thought he'd go to Harvard because it was, a, it was a socialist type of town. The town was incorporated, so everybody in the town owned the town. So 10 of the most brilliant young men from the town, high school, was automatically sent to Harvard at the expense of the town. W.E.B. Du Bois was one of them. They didn't send him to Harvard, they sent him to Fisk. But it was the finest thing that ever happened to him because up until that point, he wasn't aware of black people as a people belonging to him. But when he got down in Tennessee and had to ride Jim Crow cars and <laughs> eating Jim Crow restaurants, he saw the light of day and he said that he would devote the rest of his life to race work. He thought racial prejudice was based on ignorance. It's based on the containment of power. There's a whole lot of brilliant people who are as prejudiced as they can be. A whole lot of people graduate all kinds of schools, read all kinds of books, still prejudiced. It is based partly on ignorance, but only partly. All right. And we move to the end of this century in the Caribbean islands, the Caribbean radicals that were never tolerated in the Caribbean islands then or now because the Caribbean mind flourishes best away from home. Still do. <laughs> the Caribbean radicals were restless. In Jamaica, Albert Thorne, J. Albert Thorne, Robert Love, these were the people who laid the basis for the emergence of Garvey. It's about to be run out. 
Marischal was, was propagating in Grenada. He would later be one of the early advocators of independence in the Caribbean Islands. Then a young man in Barbados, H. Sylvester Williams had found the African, um, the Pan-African League near the end of the century. He would call the first Pan-African Congress. So the ideas of Pan-Africanism, the formal ideas would be coming from the Caribbean. The three best known Pan-Africanists all came from Trinidad. H. Sylvester Williams, who started it. George Padmore, who was the active theoretician of Pan-Africanism and one of its finest writers. C. L. R. James, still alive, living in London. Now, why is it that these three Trinidadians, fathers of Pan-Africanism, never could unite Trinidad? Because their theories at home wasn't that respected or accepted. Something which I have said before and have been saying through the years is that the Caribbean islands always produce men of vision whose vision of life is larger than the island that produced them. And in order to flourish, they've got to leave home. Because there's no space for those kind of large ideas. The British programmed you into a limited mentality based on dependency on them. America let your mentality flourish, then they frustrate it based on your dependency on them. Too many times we argue over the relative merit of oppressors instead of arguing against both oppressors. We start arguing, my oppressor was better than your oppressor. <laughs> now, Booker T. Washington is literally the kingpin of the lot in black America now. 1900, H. Sylvester Williams called his Pan-African Congress in London, W.E.B. Du Bois attends. Now the global importance of African problem is moving. And the Booker T. Washington program has spread to Africa. No matter what you might think of the Booker T. Washington program in the United States, his concept of training for self-reliance, for self-maintenance, was what the Africans wanted and needed and still do. He had the more practical program in education. And because he told us to go light on politics until we finish our houses and our streets and learn how to make our own clothes, we assumed that he was telling us to abstain from politics. What he was saying that once you own a house and once you own the brickyard that furnishes the brick for the house, and once you're making your own shoes, once you master the real estate in your own community, nobody's going to have to tell you that you got to be political in order to protect it. 
this thought is going to come automatically. So all he was thinking about is that Du Bois was premature. That Du Bois' idea was coming a little ahead of the readiness of the people to absorb the idea and work with them. That coming out of slavery less than 50 years, we needed basic things. Well, some of these basic things we don't have today. We still need basic things. We can create an industry making our shoes. We should start with a pocket handkerchief. I said, if you want to make a locomotive, start with a safety pin. If you can't make a safety pin, give it up. <laughs> but what Booker T. Washington was training for at Tuskegee, the point we missed then and now, was nation management. This is what he was really about beneath all of this. And yet, he was the only person that could go to the corporate in America and get large sums of money. Andrew Carnegie thought so much of Booker T. Washington, he would put a half a million dollars in the bank and tell Booker T. Washington to go each year and draw the interest. But he can have the, you leave the half a million there, you go each year and draw the interest. It started at $22,000. $22,000 in around 1900, that's about the equivalent of $100,000 today in buying power, maybe more. And all he had to do is to go there and present a note and pick it up. So quite a few people giving money to Tuskegee gave money to Booker T. Washington directly. So Booker T. Washington did have a private fortune on the side that he could manipulate. He began to buy up black businesses, especially newspapers. He established a spy system where if a preacher preached a sermon, an anti-Booker T. Washington sermon. The summary of the sermon would be in the mail on its way to Booker the next day. <laughs> and if you wanted a streetcar conductor job in Cincinnati, the whites wanted to know, is it all right with Booker? If it wasn't all right with Booker, you didn't get the job. And yet, he delivered a lot behind this dic educational dictator. Yet, the real opposition to Booker T. Washington did not come from Du Bois. The real opposition to Booker T. Washington came from a man in Boston that we call the Boston Brahmin. Mean high caste, high class. William Monroe Trotter. Among those Boston almost white blacks, I call the Light Brigade. <laughs> Born with money by virtue of having a white father. <laughs> Home, Harvard graduate, they're part of the time with Du Bois, personal friend, all the necessities. Then he married into the Light Brigade, and she had money. And yet he would exhaust most of this money in the struggle for black rights. He began his fight 
against Booker T. Washington in his newspaper, the Boston Guardian. He gave no quarter, he asked no quarter. He fought him to the day he died. He said that we need an alternative. We need not be locked to one man and one method. He had nothing against the educational policies of Booker T. Washington that was basically good then and now. But he thought the political views were terrible and that Booker T. Washington paid too high a price for what he got from the whites. For what he got from the whites, Booker T. Washington was silent on lynching, silent on a whole lot of things. Silent on the mistreatment of blacks, silent on the famous Brownsville raid, but we come to that later. Monroe Trotter thought that this was paying too much. When Booker T. Washington comes to, come to Boston, 1903, to lecture in a church, Trotter starts, noise in the church, start a protest meeting right in the church, got thrown out and got in jail, came out and started picketing the next place Booker T. Washington spoke. Showed no mercy. Trotter was one of the most brilliant black journalists we've ever produced in this country. Along with Trotter would also merge another journalist too often forgotten, T. Thomas Fortune. T. Thomas Fortune supported Booker T. Washington and criticized him. Near the end of his life, he was one of the editors of Garvey's Negro World. Brilliant journalist. We had journalists then, the lack of which we don't have one today. We have regrets. If we had those kind of journalists, they would, they would be editorially on the case, especially about the housing condition, the boarded up houses, and the whole plan shrinkage when they literally planned to run, to run poor people out of New York City anyway, black and white. But they would be on these cases. But we don't have them. We don't have them anymore. All right, 1903, W.E.B. Du Bois would write, a small masterpiece, the a collection of his essays, Souls of Black Folk, still worth reading. You get a cheap edition because it's being sold everywhere. And not to have read Souls of Black Folks is a disservice to you as a person that uh, was a member of the African race. He followed with gifts of black folks. This man was a monumental giant, the finest intellect we have produced in the whole of the Western world. All right, now W.E.B. Du Bois would start his teaching career. He did not dislike Booker T. Washington. He, Booker T. Washington, had sent him a letter asking him to come to teach at Tuskegee. He wrote two books with, w, with Booker T. Washington. They're still in existence. But the people at Wilberforce had sent him a letter earlier, and the people at Wilberforce was offering him, please listen, for a year's work, $950 dollars and Tuskegee was offering him $900. So he went to Wilberforce, where he got into a little trouble. W.E.B. Du Bois always, uh, he was a religious man, but he questioned the overuse of it all and the misuse by people lacking sincerity. 
So he came into a meeting at Wilberforce, the student meeting, being the senior professor there, and one of the few adults there, one of the students announced that W. E. Professor Du Bois will lead us in prayer. He said, no, I won't. <laughs> My kind of praying will get the school closed out. <laughs> That was a Presbyterian school. It was a, it was a church school. He almost lost his job. He didn't last for two years there anyway. And uh, he writes about the professors were so smug, they would come to the table and speak to you in Greek or Latin. And if you didn't speak good Greek and Latin, you didn't rate there. Can you imagine some black professors coming <laughs> at a breakfast table conversing in Greek and Latin? <laughs> That's why he <laughs> a wool off of some African language. Greek and Latin. And if you can't do it right, you're probably not qualified to be a professor and your contract will probably not be renewed. He was, although Du Bois was a, was a snob himself, he thought that was taking it too far. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, now he goes to Atlanta to begin his teaching. And some white woman who had given some money to, to Atlanta in his second year, they had a great black president, John Hope, Blonde, blue-eyed, black man. There was quite a few around during that period. The Walter White type. And she was going to give so much money to Atlanta with the condition that he fired Du Bois. And he said that, well, keep your money. I'll keep my professor. So John Hope became Du Bois' defender and First president. And du Bois uh, had remembered that uh, at the time he needed some defenders because when he found, when they had found the Negro Academy with Kumel and other black. came into the meeting, first place you want to know why you dare find a, 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 an academy without women membership. They, they were willing to let her in to shut her up. <laughs> and so after she got in, and she said, you're talking about poetry and she, Keith and, and Shirley and all these other poets and they're, they're lynching people wholesale in this country. I want you to Sign my call for the end of lynching. Who well, naturally did not. Because she was a woman with some money, she hired whites to join the Ku Klux Klan and to take down the name of the member and give them to her. And she published them. <laughs> And every time it was a lynching, she had a white spy to go to the lynching and tell her who was there. And she published a, little, a book called The Little Red Book on Lynching. Then they drove her out of the South. She went to Chicago, opened up a newspaper there, married a black man named Barnett. And she had to tell him that her name is Ida Wells, Everybody knows that I'm your wife. I respect this fact, but professionally, I am Ida Wells. He said, baby, I don't care what you call yourself. <laughs> so long as it is clearly understood that you and I go together and nobody else. <laughs> it lasted the rest of her life. It lasted until the day she died. So that one must have been a pretty good one. 
Her daughter is still, uh, no, her uh, daughter-in-law is still alive. All right, now, what we are up against now is a changing temperament and the, the, the awareness in the United States of the great change in America. 1905, W.E.B. Du Bois discovered that his friend Monroe Trotter is in trouble. And he goes to uh, the Boston to see what he can do for his old friend. He's been protesting again, leading, mar leading uh, picket lines again. Whites threatened to kill him again. He just came out of jail again. He's exhausted most of his family money by now trying to hold together the Boston Guardian. And if you could ever go to a library and even see it on microfilm, read some of those editorials. Like, blacks don't write that way anymore. Just don't, don't do it. Don't think that way anymore. We've lost something in the 20th century that we brought into the 20th century, held for a few years and lost it. Spirit of challenge. W.E.B. Du Bois and some other radicals call a meeting, go to the to Niagara Falls and couldn't get hotel accommodation, finally go to the Canadian side and get a hotel over there. And they call that movement the Niagara Movement. This is the forerunner of the NACP. All right, now, they begin to hold meetings every year. But 1906, a monumental year for black America. We need to pause here. Called 1906, a major turning point in white reaction to black resurgence. 1906, a riot in Atlanta. W.E.B. Du Bois trying to get across Atlanta to contact some of his good white folks to stop the riot. On his way, he, just, he goes to a black community. The whites have closed down all the stores, cut out the lights, cut off the water. And he goes to the, a, a black community where the black ruffians, pool room types, open up the stores, giving away the food, women and children, preface given to pregnant women. Blacks climb the telephone poles until they find out the lever that they can turn on to get the lights back on and get them back on. They don't have those spikes on that, you know, the other men use to climb the poles. They just climb with that normal feet. Just spit up that pole. <laughs> turn those lights back on. They fish them out in manholes until they find out how to get the water back on. So when Du Bois sees this, he sees a bravery he's never seen in black folks. And these are common, ordinary street people that I call the Bo Diddley syndrome, the Bo Diddley type, pool room kind. Du Bois develops a respect for ordinary people he never in life had. Now he's beginning to discover that his so-called talented tenth, the educated black, not only have no talent, have no nerves either. <laughs> but down there on the street, with Bo Diddley and his friend, you've got a fighting force. And you've got nerves and skill, and that street education has some value, and they're using it. They don't care what the whites going to do when they come back and find that all the food in their stores has been given away. They ain't worried about that. You close the store, we need stores, we need groceries, 
we open them up and give the grocery away. <laughs> the B.E.B. Du Bois is learning. 1906 again, Brownsville, Texas. They assigned 3,000 black soldiers to a post in Brownsville. <clears throat> the whites began to grumble. They don't want them there. There's only about six black families in the town. And their rough huge survey proved it was maybe no more than four or six single black women that they could ask the obvious questions when the obvious feeling comes up. <laughs> <laughs> they now assume that these questions will be asked to white women. And now they're going to try to get the blacks out. Bunch of white hoodlums blacken their face and shoots up the town so that the blacks could be blamed for it. Now when the black soldiers hears about this and accidentally a stray bullet hits the bartender and he dies. When the blacks at the post hears about this and hear that they are accused falsely, they said that if they're going to accuse us for shooting up the town, we might as well go there and shoot it up for real. <laughs> <laughs> now they got little houses. I mean, a house is small as a small cannon. They got all kind of pistols, all kind of shotgun, rifles. So they go and shoot up the town. They don't kill nobody. Knock off windows and, you know, hinges off the doors. And that's a mix in the buildings of that town today. See that little house, he would knock a corner out of a building. Powerful little cannon. Generally, you see them riding behind a small vehicle. Or I guess most of you know. As military as I am, old, old farmer soldier. But a Hauser is a is a very effective small weapon. When you unload a Hauser on a house, you can you know it's been hit. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's what the that's what the blacks have. All right, now they start a trial. <laughs> And uh, the um, many of the blacks were sentenced to 99 years, some sentenced to be hung. But uh, being sentenced to be uh, hung for something they didn't do, they began to appeal. Some of these blacks are the same blacks who had fought with Teddy Roosevelt at San Juan Hill. He was a famous rough rider that opened the way for Teddy Roosevelt at San Juan Hill. And they write, he's been president. They write him, he no response. And he signs an order that puts him in jail. 99 years for most of them, he were hung. All right. The appeal is now to Booker T. Washington and Du Bois. Here's what both Booker T. Washington and Du Bois did wrong. Both of them asked for clemency. You ask for clemency when the person has committed a wrong, you ask people to forgive them. That's almost a confession. When they could have asked and should have asked for justice. Now, Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois' opinion of the Brownsville raid was about the same and wrong. Booker Washington took no public stand 
he did take a stand because we have the letters that he wrote to Roosevelt reminding him that these are the men who saved your life in the Spanish-American War. But why he never said anything public? Booker T. Washington paid a terrible price for all that money he got from whites. He never took a public stand against them. We took a lot of private stands, and now we got the, all the, doc, the documents are available. W.E.B. Du Bois, Monroe Trotter still continue to meet with the Niagara Movement. A white woman named Mary White Overton asked to attend the meeting. And she peeped the whole thing, wrote down what she wanted to, getting the ideas together. And in um, 1909, there was a terrible lynching in Springfield, Illinois. And she called for white radicals and liberals to come together. It was mostly white liberals and mostly Jewish families with, with legal families, lawyer families. Now you see now with the making of the NACP. If you think it's yours, you think again. In the last copy of the crisis, which I just read today, there's a long article questioning the wisdom of the continuation of black schools. Because now that we have access to the mainstream. A people must have institutions that they control. <laughs> we don't control Harvard, and we, no matter how many of us go to Harvard, we will never control Harvard, or Yale, or Columbia. All right. Booker T. Washington, continues under attack by Monroe Trotter. Finally, a meeting is held at Harper's Ferry where John Brown made his raid. Mary White Overton has copied as much as she wants now. She has the basic program for the NACP taken verbatim from the Niagara Movement. And she called liberal whites together to underwrite the establishment of the NACP. Then she invites blacks to join on her turn. Du Bois becomes a member of the board. And she invites so many members of the former Niagara movement to join. Monroe Trotter is now against both W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker Washington. <laughs> he tells uh, W.E.B. Du Bois that these whites are going to have their organization no matter what we do, so let them. But we need an all-black organization that we finance and that we control, that they are not forever watching over and directing. And you need to bring your considerable talent and your name into the creation of an all-black organization. W.E.B. Du Bois rejected the plea. His rationale was that they were going to make him editor to the Crisis magazine. It hadn't had a name then because he gave it the name. They're going to give him research money, and he could continue at Atlanta as a teacher. So because this was attractive to W.B. Du Bois, 
he turned down Trotter's offer, we would have been a different people in the United States had W.E.B. Du Bois listened to Trotter and used his talent to find an all-black finance-run organization that the whites could not influence and could not touch. Now this man from Boston had nothing to gain. He had nothing to gain by being in black struggle. His problem was partly solved. He was almost white <laughs> and he had money and a Harvard education and access to a decent job. He didn't have to come into struggle at all. But his explanation is that faith dictated that I would play this role and take over this mission. 1909, the NACP has gotten, get well on the way. Booker T. Washington stands astride black life so well from 1895 when he made his speech to 1950 when he died, that the social history of black America is the history of our reaction to one man, Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington <laughs> thought that the finding of the NACP would offend some whites and spoke against it. But there was a brilliant black woman, Mary Church Terrell. She was married to a black judge in Washington. There had been a play on it. It was on TV. Oz and Ruby played it. Very good. Mary Church Terrell was one of the forerunners of the black women of protest. She was picking in the White House and turn of the century. Picking anything. <laughs> now here again was a person from the Light Brigade that didn't have to be in struggle. She, that was the, the daughter of Robert Church of Tennessee, a black millionaire. She'd gone to finishing school in Switzerland went to Germany and spoke German like a native. One of the best educated women of her day. And when she married Taro, and Taro tried to discourage her from uh, attending the first meeting of the NACP, mainly because Booker T. Washington had sent Taro a letter telling Terrell he's up for a higher position as a judge in Washington and if his wife, if he didn't control his radical wife, she might do him more harm than good. And so when Judge Terrell had to face his wife, Mary Church, she said that this was the period of the suffrage at the period of the woman's fight for vote. And she said that, um, see, she didn't like Booker D. Washington personally because Booker D. Washington said to her dinner table and, and, and told black jokes. And she didn't consider that funny at all. <laughs> you know. And so she had a dislike for a minute. And she, too, like Trotter, thought that we needed an alternative to Booker T. Washington. And so when Judge Terrell brought up to her about this meeting, the question whether she should attend it, she told him, I am your wife now. The laws of this country are so restricted where women are concerned, you can reduce me to a slave. If you order me not to attend the meeting, I will not attend it. 
But from then on, I will not be your wife or act like your wife. I will act like I, what I am. I am a slave and that's the way I will act in this house. And so he says, all right, Mary. <laughs> you go to your meeting. You go to your meeting and I'll see if I can explain to Mr. Washington. <laughs> she went to her meeting. She was also social associated with Susan B. Anthony, the suffrage, one of the women fighting for women to vote. Of course, the fact Susan B. Anthony was also a racist is something we don't have time to talk about now. <laughs> White women who live today are racist. It has nothing to do with the liberation of black people. Are black women or men? All right, but um, that's neither here nor there. But, 1911, and this is really the turning point in Booker T. Washington's career. 1911, Booker T. Washington came to New York City on a, I mean, from a speaking tour, he stopped to, to see the then Secretary of Treasury of, of Tuskegee, a white man. The man lived in the 80s. The man had not gotten Booker T. Washington's letter, so he was out. Booker T. Washington went into one address in the 80s and thought, well, maybe it's the next door. He went in the next door and started looking in the mailboxes. And a white ruffian named Yurik came out and beat up Booker T. Washington and went into court and accused Booker T. Washington of coming upstairs and looking at looking through the peephole at his wife and calling her high sweetie. <laughs> now he wasn't even upstairs at all but the court didn't pay much attention to him and Booker T. Washington suddenly awakened to the fact he said, my white friends in the South wouldn't have treated me this way. He is right, they wouldn't. He was a piece of property. He was doing that bidding and he was containing blacks to keep blacks from, from cutting their throats. They were gonna protect him because they needed him to protect them. No, they gave him a special car. He didn't ride no Jim Crow car. A special railroad car for Booker T. Washington. They just attached it onto the on the on the train. <laughs> no, he didn't ride across this country on no Jim Crow car. <laughs> Booker was special. Now he gonna fight Jim Crow. His personal case is taken care of. Now this Eureka case knocked some sense in Booker Washington's head. And he realized that light skin and catering to whites ain't going to make you white. And that when it comes down to power, you're just one of us too. Light skin and all. And so Booker T. Washington began to call in <laughs> different blacks he had been trying to destroy through his spy system. Call one who wouldn't even come. The great Caribbean radical, Hubert B. Harrison. Pity we don't know much about him. That was one of the most brilliant men to come out of the Caribbean. Didn't even go to the sixth grade in the Caribbean. His man read so many books was so brilliant. He taught at Columbia University. And Columbia didn't want to admit that a man of this caliber was teaching, so they paid him as a janitor. Paid him as a handyman. 
taught at the Henry George School, wrote a book still worth reading, When Africa Awakes, wrote several books, started and developed the concept of speaking from a street ladder in Harlem, came to the United States, uh, 1903, he died in 1927. When, when he worked briefly at the post office, and someone in the post office discovered that he had said something against Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington wrote the postmaster and said that I think another Negro would appreciate this job a little more than Hubert Harrison. Hubert Harrison lost the job. That was the last job he tried to hold on any kind of full-time basis. From then on, he was a tutor, a teacher. He just did peace, we peace work and survived as best he could with two children, too, wife and two children. There's a PhD thesis written about him at Columbia. But among the great minds from the Caribbean who could not have ex ever existed in the Caribbean during that day or this day, the great Hubert Harrison. Some place, in, if he was alive today in the Caribbean, I'll just stone him to death. He advocated total independence, total self-reliance. And what Booker T. Washington seemed to know that a lot of the things advocated by Hubert Harrison were the things that Booker T. Washington was teaching at Tuskegee. Take care of yourself. Now, Booker T. Washington began to retrench. Although whites were still giving him money, he was moving closer and closer to his own people, trying to come home, trying to belong, trying to settle his uh, confusion inside of himself. A lot of people haven't given him the credit he's due, but remember, he was a man in torture doing a lot of good things, making some errors. But there's a whole lot of people in this world who haven't even have enough gumption even to get in torture and work themselves out of it. There's a whole lot of people that haven't been able to gamble and fall down and get up. Don't take no kind of chances. Well, he's ahead of all of them. He not only built a great institution at Tuskegee, he inspired a, a, an educational system that was copied in Europe, envied in Africa and copied and hoped for. Now his name gradually would reach Jamaica a young man is going to hear about his school and say, mm, this will be good for Jamaica. He would hear about it before when he returns from London, 1914. He would write him, he would write Booker T. Washington, 1915, with the hope that he would get enough money to come to New to the United States and raise the money to build a school like Tuskegee in Jamaica. This is Marcus Garvey. W.E.B. Du Bois has visited Jamaica before then. W.E.B. Du Bois has met Marcus Garvey and had some admirable things to say about him on his meeting in Jamaica. But he would change later because 
Marcus Garvey was something W.E.B. Du Bois always wanted to be and couldn't be. Marcus Garvey had the personality chemistry to be and was a great leader of people. W.E.B. Du Bois stand before an audience, he was a supreme scholar. Wax mustache, frock tail, coat, sometimes cane, you know. Yep. <laughs> he was a prisoner to his class. He was a prisoner to his background. He just couldn't get out of it. Well, Marcus Garvey developed a technique of communicating with ordinary people that Du Bois never had. And Garvey had a magnet about him that Du Bois never had. And Garvey was not in the habit of rejecting any single human being with a black face. I mean, he all came and conversed or spoke, uh, you know, and nobody of his own kith and kin was unwelcome in his presence. Now, World War I would come. Once more, as we all want to do, because in this country, we want so much to be accepted as citizens. We fight for the right to fight. <laughs> we wanted to get in. Oh, let us in to do our part. <laughs> so they let us in, the labor brigades. To pick up the dead and bury them. The quartermasters bring up the supplies, truck companies, drive, but not in combat. Jim Pershing, the American commander, did not accept a single black soldier in combat. No black American fought in combat in the First World War under American officers. None. The French said that we'll take all you can give us. The French were accustomed to these great Senegalese soldiers, these African soldiers, and the French knew their performance in the field of battle was magnificent. So the French said, mm. They just call them American Senegalese. Send them over here. <laughs> they fought. All kind of medals, too. When Henry Johnson captured 56 Germans, almost by himself, set up three machine guns and tied strings on them, so uh, they could all be firing at the same time, and the Germans thought that there was a whole lot of people out there firing at them. Then <laughs> he started making noises, you know, and talking back to himself, you know, as though he, his buddy said, let's get them now, let's, you know. He was there all by himself. And when the Germans came forward surrendering, and he, he picked up his machine gun, he wanted to well the rest of them, he said, I'm the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> He would later marry one of our greatest poets, uh, Georgia Douglas Johnson, who wrote a classic poem for him. I want to die while you still love me. It was her own one and only romance. And Seemed to be all she needed. The rest, and when he died, the rest of her life was devoted to this community and humane causes. And he had lost all interest in, 
and men after that. She said that that was her marriage and saw it ended so soon, but she wasn't going to spoil, spoil the memory of it by even trying another one. They named some lodges after him because he was a mason, among other things. So, Booker T. Washington has made a change, but not enough for Monroe Trotter, who's on his case. Still on his case in the Boston Guardian. W.E.B. Du Bois would publish another book, Neglected, still be, should be read today. It's called simply The Negro. It is the first overall survey of the history of African people throughout the world, not United States or Africa, but throughout the world. An excellent small survey. It's been republished like most of his books and it's in paperback, like a great deal of his books. So 1915, again, Booker T. Washington dies. There's all kind of rumors. It's pointless to get into them. But the death is still a mystery. Booker T. Washington was a very healthy man. He rode horses. He ate good food and lived physically good. Lived materially good. I mean, So doctors, but he had brought a farmer slave carver to Tuskegee. He had made Tuskegee one of the most useful schools for blacks ever built. His famous cooks and bakers school was so good that the army sent their cooks to Tuskegee for training. And as a sergeant in the army, I inherited some of those Tuskegee cooks. A little man named Slaughter, you never forget him. I don't know how he had enough weight to get into the army. Slaughter must have weighed 110. <laughs> but he could cook. Jesus Christ, he could cook. <laughs> <laughs> He could cook biscuits as light as a feather. You have a hard time not putting a whole want in your mouth. You can't bite off. You just can't bite off of one of his biscuits. You just had to put the whole one in. <laughs> Tuskegee had a training school for orthopedic uh, shoes and for general shoe, shoe repair, shoe design. Home economics, a strong thing. His school of veterinarian medicine is still one of the greatest in the world. It rates over the leading white veterinarian schools in this country right now. There are whites as well as blacks waiting in line to get into Tuskegee's veterinarian school. And once you get in there and graduate, you are assured of more jobs than you have time to take care of. So he left some good behind. After Patterson took over the school, after Moton, it became more liberal arts. Now Tuskegee is a university. I thought that was a mistake. Tuskegee should have remained an institute a training institute, an institute to train people for reality. All of us are not going to work with computers. All oh, this good that some of us work with computers. Some of us need to be good layers of tile in the bathroom, 
A man who can lay a tile in a bathroom right now makes more than a college professor. <laughs> and a plumber makes more than they. So Tuskegee had courses in plumbing. Most of the Sutton brothers went to Tuskegee. Oliver, Judge Oliver, who Oliver Sutton, who died on there a few years ago, he studied plumbing. Then he studied law because the South wouldn't give black plumbers enough to do. So he studied law. Joined Pressy and studied law. Starting studying through the mail. I knew so many of them because I was in in the army in Tus in San Antonio where most of the family lived. And uh, a very very uh, committed family. Father was the principal of one school for fifty years in in, in San Antonio. Dr. John Henry Clark, elder statesman, esteemed historian, African scholar, world, Dr. Clark. And while we're applauding, let's give brother and sister Herb Boyd a big hand. Amsterdam News. Herb, brother and sister Herb Boyd of the Amsterdam News. <laughs> all right. All right. Let us certainly, uh, Dr. Clark, needs no introduction, and, and we're just so pleased to have him here tonight with us, the UAM family, as we celebrate this joyous occasion, this historical event, this great night, and certainly the person who can give us a great interpretation of where we have come from and to where we are headed is our African griot, our African historian, our African scholar, our esteemed elder, Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Most of my life, I've been devoted to studying the position of African people in the world. I have used up all of my supply of tears and cannot cry anymore because of certain things we have failed to understand. There's a basic thing we have failed to understand is the difference between movement and progress. And when you fail to understand the difference between movement and progress, you fail to understand 
the proper use of energy and the strategic use of energy. And sometimes you think movement is success. One of my last books is called Who Betrayed the African World Revolution and six other major speeches. And we have engaged in one of the most magnificent revolutions in human history. And if we are in a predicament over and above that of other people who are ahead of us and have not engaged in any revolution at all but political chicanery, and we have misunderstood the difference between movement and progress. If a cork is lighter than water, is thrown in the ocean on the other side of the sea, by virtue of being lighter than water, floats by virtue of the waves across the sea and ends up 6,000 miles away, that is movement. If a car had a heart, a soul, and energy, and human feeling, and swam across fighting all those sharks and the fishes, that's progress. <laughs> and we made a mistake in looking at our own revolutions, some of the greatest in history, We have mistaken motion for progress. We're like a person lucky in a crap game, gambling with a monster. We win the pot, but we're afraid to pick it up. Too many times we have won, but we're afraid to pick up our winnings. My talk for tonight is a question. What happened to the African World Revolution? With the independence explosion in Africa, with the Caribbean Federation movement, with the concept of Pan-Africanism starting in the Caribbean, with some of the finest minds talking about African unity and African awareness coming from the Caribbean, and you cannot find any of that sentiment any place in the Caribbean, with Marcus Garvey coming from the Caribbean, and you can't even go to the Caribbean Islands now and get a decent conversation on Marcus Garvey. Nobody's teaching Marcus Garvey in the schools of the Caribbean, not even in Jamaica. He's a national hero. His own people in the island don't even seem to know very much about him. The concept of Pan-Africanism was started by three Trinidadians, George H. Sylvester Williams, George Padmore, and C.L.R. James none of which are known in Trinidad. Nearly every radical in the Caribbean island was driven off the island. And the United States and black America became the beneficiary of these great radicals. T.A. Marishaw, one of the few who lived and died there, 
Buzz Butler, who was the father of the trade union movement in the Caribbean Island, lived and died there, but he was in jail most of the time. Here, an independent people in their appearance, beautifully African, with a color fascination that's downright sickening, just love themselves some white folks. And yet, when they look at their own revolutionary heritage, the revolutionary heritage of the Caribbean people is the greatest heritage away from home. They fought longer and harder. And the two priests who brought off the Haitian Revolution, Bokman called for an African heaven. So if he, meet his, if he met his slave master in heaven, he's going to slay him the pearly gates. And in his famous prayer, he, uh, he said, get rid of these white angels, get rid of this white Christ. You ain't got rid of him yet. An illiterate slave couldn't read, but had enough intelligence to tell you, you cannot worship one image, be oppressed by that same image, and be free. <laughs> Let's look at the beginning of this revolution in the 19th century and see what happened to it in the 20th century. If we look at this revolution, we're supposed to be not only free now, but need to go beyond surviving. Cockroaches survive. Ain't no achievement in surviving. We have to prevail. That's what we have done. But what have we done with prevailing? In the 19th century, early in the 19th century, when the Africans understood that chattel slavery was now being turned into the colonial system, a more sophisticated form of slavery, they didn't petition, they didn't go to Whitehall, they went to the field with spear and shield and out general some of the finest military minds of Europe. For a hundred years, they did this. They didn't argue the point. They fought out the point. A young reporter called Winston Churchill, after the Africans had driven the British out of the Sudan and had defied the British right to move into the hinterlands of South Africa, wrote a book called The River Wall about how the British reconquered the Sudan. Wrote another book about the patron saint of, the, uh, of Somalia, Muhammad bin Abdullah Hassan. He said that he out Somalia all of the Somalians. This was a revolutionary Muslim. There was a revolutionary side of Islam, not an Arab oriented Islam. The Mahdi in the Sudan was anti-Arab. And when the Egyptian Arabs came into the Sudan, he was a devout Muslim. He told the Egyptians, you are a bunch of dogs. You come here with the British trying to subdue your own people. And he beat the living hell out of them and chased them out of there. (laughs) 
This was revolutionary Islam. Wasn't that Arab stuff which is back at that? The Arab never left the slave trade. And he's still in the slave trade. Right now, he's driving people out of Mauritania who are Muslim because they're not Arabs. He's, driving, he's killing people in the Sudan because they're not Muslim. In northern Senegal, he's back in the slave trade. In the Muslim, do you come into my, this is the black man's true religion. You got in the damn sense? You mean to tell me the black man had no true religion till 700 A.D.? You think I don't know history? But now, at the end of the 19th century, the Zulu Wars were coming to an end. The Ashanti Wars were coming to an end, led by a woman. Yea, Ashanti War led the last one. The wars led by Muslims along the coast of East Africa, of West Africa. Second Touré's grand, great grandfather, Samari Touré, has stretched across French e equatorial Africa, disputed the French movement inland. He fought the French so long, the French took one of his sons to France and trained his son. The son came back in the French uniform, fighting his own father. Old man came out of the bush and stood in front of his son's cannon. So the French have given you a new tongue, given you a new uniform. Let me see if they gave you any courage. Let me see if you got enough nerve to kill your father. <laughs> Son broke down and cried. Went back to France and drank himself to death. <laughs> With men of courage like this, what are you cringing? I'm just dealing with Africa right now. Early in the 20th century, in Ghana, you began to produce men like Kaysla Hayford, African traditionalist. Kaysla Hayford was the mentor of John of Don Qua. Don Qua was the mentor of, of Nkrumah. In South Africa, ANC got started. My main point is we have been continuously in revolt. We have never not been a revolutionary people. Why have we not told our children we have not been cringing cowards? We have stood up to this monster and made him cry. What has happened to that revolutionary spirit? If we did it once, why can't we do it again? What happened in the interim? In the Caribbean islands where you had the most successful revolt because you had African culture continuity and African connection. Eighteen oh seven, the British understood that slavery was an unwieldy labor system. Now they got quick reputation as abolitionists. The British were never an abolitionist. They were changing the system of chattel slavery into the system of colonialism. The Caribbean people understood that now that they are free, they have no place to work, 
They have to go back to the same farm, same sugar mill. Now they got to support their families. Now they got to buy their own clothing. Economics, some of them were better off as slaves. The British are getting that labor practically free. This led to the revolted Marat Bay in Jamaica. These revolts again asked for reform. The mulatto group in Jamaica wanted to make a deal with the British that they would protect the British against the blacks. The British would not accept the deal. Then the mulattoes decided to join the blacks. Now the British understood and began to feed favors to the mulattoes to the point where they produced separate job categories for them, separate communities for them, separate little petty commission jobs for them, to the point where they became almost a separate race into themselves and they ran the color game on them to the point where in Jamaica they are still basically a separate people. And they have enjoyed over a hundred years of privilege based on color gradation without ever collectively saying I'm against these privileges because I'm one of the same people. Unlike some of the coloreds in South Africa who told the South Africa apartheid government, I don't want to be separated based on uh, colors. I'm in the same struggle as the rest of them. I want to be classified the same as the rest of them. Some denied this, this classification. Coming down to the end of the 19th century, a Jamaican uh, a Trinidadian lawyer, H. Sylvester Williams, found the Pan-African League and subsequently called the Pan-African Congress. I want to show that we were always aware of our condition and we were always revolting against this. This was the revolution, the civil rights movement in the making all over the world that this was not a local American thing. This was part of a world revolution of African people. Did it affect Africa? It affected the Caribbean? It affected those in the United States? until we stop playing these separate games based on geography where those slaves should put us down. <laughs> and concentrate on where the slave ship took us from. Until we stop playing this separate game between men and women, there was no separate auction block for the black woman. There was no separate slave ship for the black woman. She came over on the same slave ship. So we got to look holistically at our history in the world. In the fact that our life in Africa and away from Africa, since we made contact with the European, has been a continuous revolt. And that different ones of us revolted in different ways. All right, early in the 20th century, Ghana is producing a literature, a political literature. Casey Hayford's work, The Truth About the West African Land Question, when he's proving that land in Africa can neither be bought or sold because of his understanding of the land tenure question. He saved West Africa 
from the large white settlement in East Africa, where the Africans did not understand that once he was giving Europeans the right to lease land, he was not selling it. The Europeans interpreted that as a sale. And in South Africa, the African was also giving the Europeans the right to use land. And now, in South Africa, the Europeans have 87% of the land. The African was not selling land in the first place. He did not have the right to sell land. In African society, no individual right has the right to sell land. Land is the collective property of the entire people. <laughs> Traditional African societies operated on a socialistic basis, not only before Karl Marx was born, but before Europe was born. African society did not have to wait till Europe came to introduce socialism, to introduce Christianity, because Africans had all of these things. They did not dogmatize them. They did not beat other people over the head with them. The mistake the African made and the mistake African people still made, he accepted somebody else's interpretation of what he already had. Now when St. Augustine heard about the European interpretation of Christianity, he said, these people make me laugh. They're giving us a religion we had 3,000 years ago which indeed we did. So if African people read more extensively in their own history, they could understand that they are worshiping a picture painted by Michelangelo 1,500 years before Christ was born. They understand that the early Madonnas in the churches of Europe were black. And some are still are black. And that the European, especially the British, they would not only colonize history, they would colonize information about history. And that the most disastrous of all of their colonization, which cripple you and your children today, is the colonization of the image of God. When you look in old African languages, there is no word equivalent to G-O-D. I didn't say the African didn't have the equivalent of God. I'm saying he didn't use that word. I didn't say he didn't have any religion. I'm saying he did not use that European concept. And there was no separation between man and woman. While the woman's role was different, was equal in importance. There was no word for jail. Because no one had ever gone to one. No word for orphanage, because you didn't need one. No word for nursing home, because you didn't need one. You copped out, start buying all of this nonsense from abroad. Someone convinced you what you had wasn't good. You got to take what he had. His ice was colder. Now, when the European began to educate the African, he's not going to educate him according to African tradition. He's going to laugh at African tradition. He's going to laugh at African clothes. He's going to laugh at African values. So when this African comes home, whose values 
He's coming home with. He's coming with European values, European concept, European religion, and sometimes a European white. He don't eat European food, African food anymore. He wants French bread or English bread. White, white, white bread. Now they've captured your mind. You don't respect your sister anymore. You've fallen for all those images. You enter the O.J. Simp Simpson syndrome before O.J. is born. <laughs> You're all mixed up. And yet amidst all of this, great revolutionary thinkers are emerging, causing asking for the return of African traditions. In the Caribbean islands, the greatest thinkers are generally sent to the United States. Hubert Harrison couldn't have lasted in the Caribbean islands a week. One of the finest thinkers to emerge from the Caribbean islands. Taught so many different subjects. Self-educated man. Taught at Columbia University because Columbia did not want to be known that he's a man who didn't even have a high school education. Teaching at Columbia, doing it well, he was paid, paid as working in the mail room. He introduced Garvey to his first audience in New York City, Hubert Harrison. His book, When Africa Awakened, published in 1922, going to be reissued next year still up to date in what he was saying, especially about education. Great cadre of Caribbean revolutionists also was coming to America, A.J. Rogers. Fifty years of research in the role of the black personality in world history. The Caribbean people now involved in constitutional fights cannot carry on the Pan-African Congresses. Now it switches to Du Bois. There's no fight between us. Understand that. When the, when the Calvin switched the holding of the Pan-African Congress from H. Sylvester Williams to Du Bois, there's no fight between black America and the Caribbean people. One is more conveniently located than the other. One has some facility that the other one does not have. This Congress did not switch back to them and the Africans until 1945 in Manchester, England. Now look at 1945 all over the African world. This is the beginning of the turning point because when you look at 1945 in the Pan-African Congress in Manchester, England, remember, all Pan-African Congresses before 1945 were rehearsals. All Pan-African Congresses after 1945 were fakes. That was the turning point. Because in 1945 in Manchester, England, young Kwame Nkrumah, the great mind of George Padmore, Amy Ashwood Garvey, Zeke of Nigeria, Peter Abrahams of South Africa, Johnstone Kenyatta, later Jomo Kenyatta, planned the future independent states of Africa, planned the structure of future independent states of Africa. It wasn't a Caribbean affair or an African affair or an African-American affair. It was a unified affair of African people from different parts of the world coming together, not fighting each other. After that, when they went to Tanzania, a bunch of fools arguing over different shades of Marxism. Hmm. 
Well, the Karl Marxes and the Groucho Marxes <laughs> got things mixed up. We still can't tell the difference between the two. I think the Groucho Marxes took over the meeting. Been confused ever since. But the great contribution that came from Nkrumah's mind on African solidarity, at the organization of African unity, putting the African world together, holding a first conference of independent African states, the conference that led to Bandung, all of this came from the mind of a great Trinidadian George Padmore. And when Nkrumah stopped taking his advice, started taking the advice of those mixed-guided Marxists, Nkrumah was going wrong. I see nothing basically wrong with socialism so long as you take the African variety of it. I see something wrong with the European concept of socialism, Christianity, and everything. I am boldly and unashamedly anti-Europe. Very clear about that. I do not believe that there are any European solutions for problems the European set in motion. And all of this led us into World War II. We went into it with some kind of reluctance and misgivings too many of us had read about how blacks were treated in World War I when the Secretary of War said to black, your lot will not be changed because you have participated in this war. And they were burning black children in bonfires in East St. Louis called the Red Summer of 1919. Marcus Garvey went to Chicago and began to rally the blacks and tell them, see, they don't want you here. Not only let's get out of here, let's get out of our own ships and get out of here. He taught us to dream again and to hope again. Now, Garvey was at the center stage of leadership until his arrest and subsequent deportation after his deportation, the depression set in. We had a revival of Garveyism during the Italian-Ethiopian War and a revival of interest in Africa throughout the whole of the African world. People who brought into being the Ethiopian World Federation initially were mainly Caribbean activists. Then black Americans brought into being friends of, American friends of Ethiopia, Willis Huggins. And Krumah was a student at Lincoln and used to visit the old Harlem History Club. All of this was on the eve of protests asking for equal pay for black teachers. The fight for equal pay was developed into a fight for equal education. This was also extended into a fight for equal housing. Now we see a universal fight for some form of equal equality equality at home, the Africans who had fought in this war 
They had been trained to kill white people for white people. Now this African coming home and looking at himself still being ruled over by white people said that if I have been trained to kill white people who are treating others with, with injustice and you're still treating me with injustice, what's wrong with killing you? Now you see the African Revolution. In the Caribbean island, the fight for federation, the fight to consolidate the efforts of all of the islands as against having them as separate entities, what stimulated this fight was the land question. The British put so much land called reserve land and so much land called crown land. And the people who live there didn't even have enough land to grow their food. And the British had so much land in reserve, absentee land law, despite over land accentuated the fight for independence. What happened to this magnificent effort in the Caribbean islands? How did they cop out and cringe and became almost professional white behind kissers? What happened to their mentality? <clears throat> what happened to their memory of their revolutionary heritage when they had brought off some of the great revolutions of the world in the Caribbean islands and some of the most successful ones? Why didn't they teach this to their children? Obviously they didn't. You can't get an African conversation almost no place in the Caribbean islands. England is our motherland. <laughs> England has made it plain that you, you don't become a citizen of England by virtue of being born there. Mm -hmm. Had the concept of federation been successful, there could have been an economic union between all of the islands, a common tax structure, a common currency, a common defense. There'd been no invasion of Grenada. There'd been no invasion of Panama. There'd been a common educational system. Such rich parts of the Caribbean island would have been more developed. Jamaica would not be pawn in the hands of the World Bank that it is in the International Monetary Fund that it is. People kept, wouldn't have gone in there right now and devaluate your money to the point where it take almost a barrel full of your money to get one American dollar. Become pawns in the international game when among themselves they could have fed each other. In the Virgin Islands, land that used to feed people now golf courses and places for condors. Parts of the Virgin Islands they have to send to Up Island. I never knew there was such a thing as Up Island to get people to do ordinary work because the local men can make more money roaming the beaches and serving the unfulfilled, socially inclined white women on the beach. I wish this was not true. And some of the rats Rascals are becoming rascals.
in the same profession. I don't know whether Africa's in the direction of some lady's leg. I never heard it being in that direction. <laughs> Nor have I heard of a revolution being fought in that area. We threw away our great opportunities. 1954, the Supreme Court decision against segregation in schools. We didn't believe it then, don't believe it now. <laughs> we were rather cynical about it. What did give us a little inkling of hope? The Montgomery bus boycott activity around the mud of Emmett Till, the rise of King and SNCC and Core, Freedom Rides, the challenges, the sit-ins, our youth, getting their heads banged, going to jail, wearing blue jeans, living on $10 a week, the spirit of these young people, that was revolutionary hope. Then the anti-poverty program came along and a bunch of anti-poverty pimps began to buy into that and tone that down. By the 60s, the end of the 60s, the movement was a form of hustlerism. Coups and counter coups began to overthrow some of the governments in Africa. Africans had been naive in thinking that the Europeans would let them take over all that gold, all those diamonds, all that manganese, all that platinum. Sheikh Anta Diop had told you that there are five or six river, river valleys in Africa that not only could feed Africa, but could feed half of Europe. That Africa didn't need nothing but itself. You cultivate the valleys of these rivers and you can not only have enough to feed yourself, you have enough to feed half of Europe. But Africans went abroad to study. What did they study? International man, man such esoteric subjects that Africa don't need at all. Somebody need to sit these Africans down and tell them, if your land faces the sea, you need harbor managers. You need airport managers. You need people who can build a railroad system, a, a, road, a normal road system. You need schools. And so when you send people out to school, you send them to study what you need and not what they want. This is what the Japanese did. And the Japanese were fortunate. The Japanese never let people take them physically from their historical geography or destroy their concept of God. In Japan, the Buddha is Japanese. In Indonesia, the Buddha is Indonesian. In China, the Buddha is Chinese. Everybody paints the deity to resemble themselves except us. Inasmuch as Michelangelo and other Europeans took it upon themselves to give you a white Christ, and we got a lot of painters, good painters, why can't you take it upon yourself to give a black one, put some stained glass black one? Is he less? Inasmuch as much none of us knew how he looked. 
And he was born in that part of the world predominantly of African people. He wasn't European. The European has been successful not only in destroying the effectiveness of our revolution and buying off our revolutionists for pennies and a grinning woman sometimes. <laughs> They've destroyed our hope, our aspiration, our possibilities, and our imagination. For people to be whole, they have to look holistically at themselves and the world and how they relate to the world. We have 100 times more than the Japanese started with. We have more land, more resources, and more people. How is it they could recover from the loss of a war, two atomic bombs, and now their enemy is begging them for commercial space in the world? How is it they can achieve all of this without one demonstration and one leaflet? Once they make up their mind what they're going to do, they systematically go about and do it. What you have to understand is that we as a people have to stop dreaming. There are no givers. We have to stop celebrating non victims is. You have to be strong enough to take back what has been taken away from you or stop talking about it. <laughs> Nobody gives you back freedom. It's never secure that way. This is why you are dreaming if you think the end of apartheid means the end of white dominance in South Africa. They took that country in blood. That's the only way the African is going to get it back. No, no. Nelson Mandela is an interesting figurehead. He controls nothing that relates to power. He don't even control his chauffeur. We have to look at reality. Sometime next week, the Phelps Stokes is going to give me the Agri Award for my contribution to clarity in education. I have written I have written a small book for the occasion that I'm going to expand later to a larger book for education for a new reality in the African world. We have to stop dreaming and look at the world the way it is and not the way we hope it will be. We have to look at the potential and we have to admit that had we trained our children right, given them the right information, they wouldn't be killing themselves or killing each other. We fail to give them the right direction and the right message. We fail to say, after you get the integrated hamburger, then what? It was our job as adults. 
to prepare them for the next logical step. And what was the next logical step all over the world? Nation management, nation maintenance. So therefore, in education, we have to educate them to do everything that gives them the ability to rule nations correctly, to defend nations, to support nations, to educate nations, to make their clothes. All this time, a generation away from independence, a revolution inside of our own minds. We need to give up something to get something. We need to stop wasting so much energy and argumentation among ourselves. <clears throat> so we need to learn how to respect each other and keep promises to each other. We need to realize There's not a single African nation in Africa. They're all imitation European states. We need to build real African states based on African traditional values. There should be an African language spoken in the parliament of every single African nation. If the foreigner don't understand it, so too bad. You don't change your French when I go to France. And I don't change my Wula or Zulu when you're in Africa. If you want to learn it, we can show you where the books are. And if that disturbs you, we can show you where the airport are. Yeah. <laughs> I say one of the main reasons why our great revolution got away from us, we had too much ceremony and not enough substance. And when our enemies discovered, we shouted black power before we learn how to handle power, period, black or otherwise. When they discovered that we shouted nation time and did not know how to structure a nation, how to negotiate for a nation, and how to defend a nation, they knew that a lot of us were pimping on our liberation and they didn't have to take us seriously. They'll take us seriously once we are organized enough to organize the wealth of Africa, the show lines of Africa. Because wherever we are on the face of this earth, no matter where our bodies are, of a cultural and political heart beats in Africa. So long as we recognize this, we can go to the ends of the earth so long as we know that our cultural heart beat is in Africa. We're not less a part of other places so long as we know there's a historical place that gave us our original birth that we have some loyalty and commitment to. And there's no use shouting about being black and beautiful. White folks know that. They knew that all along. They'll make cosmetics to make you more so and get rich. One of the reasons why they fear you is that not only are you black and beautiful, you are natural like the seasons. And you don't have to put on any makeup 
to prove it. Because God, your mother and father, give you a sufficient amount. Properly counted all over the world in the Pacific, in India, and other parts of Asia, Caribbean islands, South America, in Africa itself. There are a billion African people on the face of this earth. All the Jewish people in the world are less than one half of the black population in the United States. They have more political power in the United Nations and in the world than all the African nations in the world put together. They got their political thing together. We don't have ours together. They make you cry over their six million. You can't make you him cry over your more than 100 million. Because you do not know how to play the political game of victimship. And they have mastered it. Now, what you have to do is to first settle all these differences between yourselves based on geography for you did not ask to be put down. And all of us, irrespective of accents and geography, come together as one people and make it be known that all of us have an African commitment and make it plain to the Africans themselves who sometimes need their heads screwed on right that continent is the homeland of every African who walks the face of this earth. And all of us have a commitment to making it secure not only for our children, their children, the more beautiful ones waiting to be born we gave the world its first humanity. We might give the world its next humanity. The fortunate position we are in is that we can regain everything that belongs to us without invading other people's country, without violating other people's women, without taking anything that belongs to other people, and we can stand for our own sovereignty without impinging on the sovereignty of other people. The world will be better when we are in power. The world needs our imagination. The world needs our energy. The world needs both our laughter and the wrath of our thunder breaking the chains of injustice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. John Henry Clark. Just one small matter, one brief presentation, and then we're out of here. Some of you can continue to stand. Let us give a round of applause to Michael Graves from the Guardians Association. Oh, Ted. Okay, let me say briefly that I have uh, an award here from the uh, Correction Guardians Association to the United African Movement. We just want to uh, give a token of appreciation to the, the work that's done here consistently, also to the commitment that you have to the community, a beacon of light that you represent. 
This is uh, something you don't see anywhere in the country. You know, scholars, uh, worldly scholars like Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben giving this information basically for free. You know, there's an offering for those who can give whatever they can, and Alton makes do with what he can after the night is over. So certainly this is just a small token. From the Guardians Association to, uh, to the United African Movement, we want you to continue to be that beacon of light in our community. And I've always been concerned about the slave theater. I come here often, you know, so I'm not a stranger here. Uh, I've always been concerned. I've always thought what happened in January to Mars number seven was a dry run for the slave theater. So I think you need to be on your toes and be sharp and be aware and, and really sustain and protect that which you've created. This is the, the brainchild of, of automatics and others, and you better protect it. So uh, who's going to accept the award for United African Movement? Brother Alton. Very good. It reads as such. Uh, this is an organizational community award presented to the Slave Theater for educating the black community. Correction Guardians Association, Diane Cavalier, President. One more, this is for you. Um, thank you. And one more award. We understand that uh, we need some men in our community. You know, and this is in no way uh, disparaging with respect to our sisters, but we really need some men in our community. You know, when I think of commitment, I think of Alton Maddox. And when I think of leadership, I think of Alton Maddox. When I think of manhood, I think of Alton Maddox. See, there's a difference in the law enforcement community that's white and black. It's a big difference. See, I love Alton Maddox. It's crystal clear. I love Alton Maddox and I respect him. And it's therapeutic for me just to see him. I'm going to repeat that. I want you to understand that. It is therapeutic for me to see Alton Maddox. So I've been trying, I've been waging my little war for years within the Guardians Association to acknowledge him, to make a stronger stance. I think we've done a little bit, but um, we haven't done all we can do. I think we need to really push. Well, you haven't done all you can do either. We need to get Automatics' license back. So um, really, if, if, if uh, objective judge checked it all out, nobody has done all they can do. I heard that junk that Roger was saying on the radio about he wrote a letter for, for Alton. How you write a letter for a man like this? You get out there and do what it takes to get him his license. He wrote a letter, but he comes on the radio himself for Cuomo. They in person get you to vote for Cuomo, but it comes to automatics. They write a letter and send a representative to the courtroom. That's a, that's a shame and a disgrace. So we have an award for our attorney at war. He's our attorney at war, too. Automatics. And be proud. No, no, I have an award for him. That was to the Slave Theater. There's another award for the attorney at war. And be proud and secure him. I always, when I come in here, you know I'm very security conscious. We have a, a Charles Billups. Is he still here? OK, because he's the Sergeant of Arms for the Grand Council. So he's our security man. But I do my own little thing, too. And I check out everybody that's supposed to be securing the slave theater, and especially the close quarter people that surround automatic. I see, can I walk up here? Is this flank covered? It's not covered. It should be covered. You never should let anything happen to them, or the rest of your life you say, we should have did this. Don't let it, no, no, I don't need no applause. I want y'all to protect automatics. All right? 
Because I know what white folks think of Alton Maddox. And I know what white law enforcement think of Alton Maddox. They know he's a man. They know that they can't scare him. They know he won't bargain with them. They know this is a real man. So I know it's only one thing you can do with Alton Maddox. Well, besides take his life, there's only one other thing you can do to him, and that's take him out. This is why you have to protect Alton Maddox while he's here with us. Give what you can whenever there's an opportunity to give, given its due season, why you can, because you never know. This is an award, and the award reads as such. Presented to Alton Maddox Esquire. What does Esquire mean? Alton Maddox Esquire. For never backing down, always standing strong, Correction Guardians Association, Diane Cavalier, President. Thank you very much, Michael. I didn't want to take your award, too. Let me just say very briefly, and we're getting ready to leave, that I want to thank the Guardian Association for the two fine awards, one to the United African Movement and the other one to myself. What Michael did not say is that tonight uh, I was due at their award ceremony, and I uh, blew it, but he didn't blow us. And uh, we want to thank him for for coming out to the Slave Theater after the award ceremony was over with and presenting th these awards to us in the person of you. And so we want to thank him very much. We also want to make our final announcement, and that is on Friday night of this week, there will be appreciation for Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Yosef Benyakinen, and this appreciation it was November 11, 1994, at 7 o'clock p.m. The MCs are M. Hotep, Gary Bird, and Bob Slade. Music by Mighty Chalk Dust. And there's a whole avalanche of black folks uh, who will be there. And the list is long. Uh, but included on, list, on that list, uh, Dr. Arthur Lewis, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor James Small, Professor William Mackey, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, Attorney Alton Maddox, Reverend Al Sharpton, Khalid Muhammad, Dr. Carlos Russell, Earl From July 3rd to July 18th, 1987, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization held their fourth annual Ancient Comedic Study Conference and Study Tour. Over 1,000 African Americans attended this historic conference and study tour. The conference was held here in the Nubian Center in Aswan, Egypt. For 15 days, these African Americans and their Nubian brothers and sisters would travel along the Nile, visiting tombs and temples, monuments, statues, museums, murals, they would walk in the sacred places of their ancestors to touch and feel the awesome greatness they left behind. But most of all, they would celebrate the spiritual bonding still existing between the Nubians of today, who are the direct descendants 
of the ancient pharaohs and themselves. And they would realize that although time and circumstances have separated us, we are one people with a common blood. And in that blood flows a greatness of kings and queens. Come with us to the land of our ancestors. Touch the monuments and kiss the ground of the great gate. See the motherland, learn about our past, and mingle with friends. We began our study tour here in Aswan, Egypt, overlooking the now. Dr. Leonard Jeffries is the chairman of the African Studies Department of the City University of New York City. Dr. Jeffries, we have been taught that our roots, our culture, our, and our contributions are sub-Sahara. Well, that's unfortunate because the European so-called scholars uh, that discovered the greatness of Nile Valley civilization uh, realized they couldn't attach it uh, to African peoples and remain uh, with the approach that they're uh, inferior or to keep them enslaved, meaning the slavery of the mind. Once the Africans realize how significant this cultural stream is and how important it is to African peoples everywhere, uh, it liberates them, to, the liberation of the mind, to know that the greatness of a thousand miles of development in this part of the Nile and even developments thousands of miles further into the Nile were the great contribution of African peoples uh, to civilization. But 
But we have been educated to believe that Greeks and Romans are, are olive-skinned people with just a few Nubians here and there built the pyramids and the Sphinx and the greatness of Egyptian civilization. You mean to tell me that black Africans built all of this? And if that's so, why do some of the statues not look black? I mean, some of them don't have thick noses and, uh, and, and thick lips. No. Well, one of the things is that the prototype of the whole human family is the African. And so there is no simple uh, single prototype for the African. The African represents uh, this broad range of the human family. It's not just the broad nose, it's not just the, uh, the thick lip, it's not just the hair that is tight. Uh, the African is the prototype of the human family. Other people spring from him. When we understand the African origin of humanity in this Nile Valley, going into the heartland of Africa, the Great Lakes region, and when we understand that humankind moved out of that valley and peopled the world, and then it moved up this particular valley and began the evolution of society hundreds of thousands of years ago, coming out of that birthplace millions of years ago, and then when it reached this point 10,000 years ago, this became the zenith of that development. Why here? Here because this is an oasis. The Nile, because of its particular uh, richness coming from the African uh, interior, overflowed regularly. And with the inundation of the Nile, the, over, the flooding, uh, there was a period of, of uh, three or four months in which the land was fertilized. And when the people went back to the land after the flooding, it was so rich it could produce several crops. And so along this Nile is this beautiful, rich land on the banks. And it was from this harmonious, a beneficent environment and ecology that the Africans were able to harmonize with the laws of the universe because out of the sun and with the water came uh, the ability to produce surplus agriculture so you could have a settled community and that began that community began to increase and they began to develop uh, laws and morals and ethics to guide that community and then they began to pay an enormous homage to the God concept that was in everywhere and in everything and uh, so you had this enormous tribute, these temples and these tombs and uh, the pyramids representing the African paying homage to his God concept. The European, however, the northern factor, comes out of the caves, 50,000 years of the cave existence in Europe. Now that's not something that I'm saying, that's something that was in the American uh, Museum of Natural History uh, in New York in the fall. They had an exhibit uh, in 1970, uh, 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 in 1986, uh, about the thousands of years of the European presence in the caves. They called it uh, Dark Caves and Bright Vision. In fact, the November 10th issue of Newsweek had a caveman uh, on the cover, and it, the title was The Way We Were. But that's the way they were. They had spent these years in the caves, and the cave value system is the warrior value system, the greed value system, the murder, the pillage value system. That narrow ecology of survival that they had to exist on for thousands of years produced another value system, another mentality of fear, of aggression. Coming out of this sun and this valley that harmonized and reflected the beneficent of God, the Africans created a tribute to God, and that's what all this represents. And it definitely does not reflect the value system of the North or the Europeans or the value system of the sand people, uh, many of whom come out of the uh, Arab, Arab culture, because the Africans balanced things out. The male and female principle were balanced. That's why you see a, a temple to the male principle, a temple to the female principle together. They put the female at the center of their spiritual value system. Other cultures of the North put the male at the center, and they dismiss the female, and the sand people do the same thing. So these monuments, when you look at the values that they represent, could not have been done by people who come from the northern cradle because they do not reflect that male dominance. They reflect the harmony between the male principle and the female principle, which is what the Africans have always built their culture around. Are, are you saying, let me, let me be clear, are you saying that mathematics, medicine, architecture, science, all of these things that we have been taught, others created, came from our own genius, originated with our own people? Well, it is clear that the pyramids were built in the Old Kingdom almost 5,000 years ago. And they represent the highest level of technical achievement, scientific achievement, mathematical achievement, archaeological achievement, uh, astronomical achievement, 
cosmic understanding, philosophical understanding that the humankind has reflected. Those pyramids were built by African people. Standing in front of those pyramids is the image of an African with the broad nose, with the head shape of the prototype of what we want to call the African. And that's the image of the pharaoh who built the second great pyramid, the pharaoh Khafra. His father, Khufu, who we call Cheops from the Greeks, built the first great pyramid. Khafra built the second great pyramid. And his son, Menkere, built the third great pyramid of that pyramid complex. That African image on the Sphinx stands as a monumental testament to who built these pyramids. No one can take that from us. We have to take that back, hold it up to show everybody that the African stands at the forefront of the human family in terms of science, medicine, philosophy, art, culture. That is his contribution to the world. He gave civilization to the world as his contribution. Not just one or two things. While these enormous monuments to the God force were being built by Africans, Europeans were in the caves and a low level of barbarity involved in cannibalism. Read Omni Magazine, January 1987, and it explains what was happening in that cave existence with a low level of survival. That the Europeans were involved in eating their dead. That's not Len Jeffries. That's European scholars making an analysis based upon the bones and the, and the scratches on the bones that they discovered. So put together the November issue of Newsweek, November the 10th, the exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History on the 50,000 years of the European existence in the cave, put together an Omni article uh, November, uh, in January uh, 1987, and you have your package. That was the northern cradle. The problem was survival at the lowest level, which produced a greed, a, an aggressiveness, fighting over land. The southern cradle was involved in spirituality. Land is spiritual. The human family is spiritual. The birds and bees are part of a spiritual continuity. All of it had to harmonize. So the Africans created the concept of Maat, M-A-A-T, that there is a harmonious cosmic force in the universe that everyone seeks to arrive at. And it's a spiritual dimension of life. That's why these great things were built. If you look at the pyramids only in terms of its technical dimension, you miss, miss the enormity of it. If you look at the Temple of Karnak, which was generation after generation building to their God concept, the greatest temple complex in the history world, you miss what the Africans were all about. If you walk the mile-long sphinx that linked the great temple complex at Karnak with the great lodge at Luxor, the temple at Luxor, that was the great university center of the world where there were tens of thousands of people learning how you move from a low level of consciousness to the highest level of godliness within your human context. The arts, the healing arts, the scientific arts, these arts of studying the universe, music and whatnot was taught in the great lodge. It is the granddaddy and grandmama of the Masonic order, of the Rosicrucians. It is the prototype of the Temple of Solomon. It was built and enlarged 500 years before Solomon. This pillared temple along the Nile was the model that inspired the Greeks to build the Parthenon on top of the Acropolis 1,000 years before the Africans built that temple. The Greeks were inspired to build theirs 500, around 500 some, BC. You speak, of, you speak of Solomon, but there are, there are many people who would say that Christianity originated in, in Europe. Well, unfortunately, Christianity is credited to the Europeans, but Christianity comes out of this sun. Christianity comes out of this land. Christianity comes out of this Nile. And not only Christianity, Judaism comes out of this sun. Judaism comes out of this river. Judaism comes out of this land. The first Christian nation was within Africa, in Ethiopia and Egypt. You had the roots of Christianity, which later spread to Europe. People don't understand that. The basic concepts that are Judeo-Christian heritage came out of this land, Abraham, by the tradition of the Jews themselves, came from Ur in 1617 or 1500 BC. And he came with a remnant of families. And it was in this land that that remnant became a multitude, that they began to develop cultural values, that they began to understand concepts of law and ethics that they institutionalized around 10 commandments. But the Africans had within their cultural context 42 commandments. Before the 10 commandments, including the 10. Thou shalt not, I have not killed. I have not coveted another man's goods. I have not committed adultery. 
that is repeated twice because it's such a heinous crime that twice you repeat before the judgment of Osiris in the final judgment when you have died and your heart's soul uh, is being released to join the larger soul force when you are inheriting eternal life, you have to have lived a correct life in order to inherit it. So you go before the judgment of Osiris, who is the God of resurrection. You are led into that judgment hall by his son, uh, Horus, called Heru within the Nile Valley context. And that son leading you into the father's uh, presence. After you have passed the judgment scene where your life is weighed, your heart is weighed against the feather of truth, which represents truth, justice, and righteousness. That's shown in the drawings. It's shown in the drawings. It's shown in the temples. It is part of this culture. It's built into the architecture. This judgment that you have to live a godly life in order to inherit eternal life. Now, that was something that the ancient Hebrews came into, and they were able to take from and develop. That is something that the Christians inherited. That is something that later Islam in 640, when AD, when there was an invasion from Arabia here, that Islam began to understand the moral and ethical high principles of the Africans and be able to take that, move it into Islamic development, and then be able to spread like wildfire across the sun belt of, of the world from the Atlantic across North Africa through the so-called Middle East on into India, out into the Pacific, uh, into Indonesia. Let's break. Because it is here, mind-blowing experiences start. You know, when you say religion, religion started in this, in calculations. In a work I'm doing showing that the African use logic to create God as a concept in his mind. And that logic is no different than the logic he used to make the triangulation and the spher spherical dimension to figure out this, this, these pyramids and to use these to figure out the movement of the sun, the moons, the stars in order to, to give us a calendar and to make chemicals and to make medicine, pharmacology, all of it came out of this African mind here. But what about our young people who may say, you know, I'm not into religion, really, and I'm, I'm not into, I don't see why I should learn all this African history. I'm, I'm a math major, I'm into mathematics, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting a degree in law, or I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor. He's into history if he's into those fields. That's right. He's unavoidably That's right. practicing history. Anything Every older. mathematician who uh, uh, starts to work and writes down something that he calls the Pythagorean theorem, uh -huh. which was produced before Pythagoras was born, and not by Pythagoras, you know, is in, even though he may think he's practicing mathematics, he's passing on images of history that affect the images of the practitioners. And that is true of almost every field, whether it's a, if it's a medical doctor who raised his hand and took the oath of Hippocrates, <laughs> when we aren't even sure there was a Hippocrates, right. yes. when it was really this gentleman, Imhotep, who uh, designed the step pyramid, who is the true father of medicine. His name was termed Escalapius, so your physicians then all raised their hand and practiced history when they say, I swear by Apollo the phys physician and Escalapius. And uh, the very fact that many of them can raise their hand and take an oath to a person that they don't even know suggests that maybe they ought to practice both their profession and history at the same time. And the beautiful thing about that, that question of the so-called Hippocratic Oath, which many can say is the hypocrisy of, of understanding the domination of European culture, is that a living African genius, the uh, vizier uh, to the pharaoh, Zoser, in Hotep, became translated by the Greeks into to, go a god, the yeah. god of medicine, medicine and healing god. arts. Yeah. So the Greeks worshiped the yeah. Africans. And that's why it's important for us to understand this foundation in order to build for a future. Because art, architecture, medicine, literature, uh, astronomy, mathematics comes out of this culture built by the Africans and was passed on to others who raised it high. We have to do that if we're going to construct a true African future based upon African values and a mission in life dedicated to African interests, which all people have to do. And we can't expect others to do it. We have to do it for ourselves. You know, it's, it's unique because Gil, 
my bachelor's and master's is in civil engineering. And I got a law degree, and I practiced law for about two years. So uh, I had this thing about multidiscipline thing you had to have if you wanted to be a professor. Now, engineering came from here. Triangulation and everything, mathematics, pi, and all that came from here. The first numbers, one to eight, came from here. Uh, when we go to the, 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 the double temple at Komombo, Komombo, I will show you there the engineering, the numbers, the system, where it came from. So that pharmacology, they, there's nothing you could practice. Computer science, you can have computer without mathematics. Uh, logic, you know, every discipline that you could think of, that's what the statement, nothing is new. You make transformation, but nothing is new. Okay. Came from here. Let, Dr. Ben, the pyramids in the background, talk to me briefly about them. When were they built, etc.? The first one, you see the one with the cap on? Right. The, the white cap. All of them had that marble cap. The first one, which is the tallest, even yes. though it doesn't look so, this one in the middle seems to be tall. It's just smaller, but built on higher ground. The first one is of Khufu, the all the fourth dynasty. Khufu. The one nearest us. No, the, the farthest, one. farthest one that's from us. That's the tallest one? That, that, that's the tallest. the tallest. It's actually the tallest, and it is the oldest. That's built by the father of these, these three men. The one, Khufu. His son, Which the one is Khufu? The farthest yeah, from us. Far back uh -huh. the, the one with the top off. The one with the marble top on, the casing on, is the second, that's by Kafra, the son of the one farthest from us. And this little one here, the third in height, is Menkora, the son of the second one and the grandson of the first one. Now, the Greeks call the first one, Khufu, Cheops, Herodotus, when he came in, that's way later, in uh, 450, that will bring us into the, uh, the Persian period because the Greeks took over in 332. So the Persians were ruling from 525. So that means Herodotus was here during the time of the Persian rule. The second one is Kafra, the son. By the way, when we see the, uh, down there, the, 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 the uh, Sphinx, it is Kafra's face that you're gonna see. And that's the second one. And then- That's where Kafra is buried? Yes, uh -huh. uh, the, not necessarily the, 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 the mummy is there. They t it's rubbed and taken away. Mm -hmm. But that one, the Greeks call Shephren. And the third one is Mem Kara, the son of Kafra and the grandson of Khufu. Now, what about these little, the now, little ones in the foreground? Of the queens. Uh, they're queens and a few other dignitaries, but mostly queens and prime ministers are the best. But the prime ministers, for the most part, and other officers, are buried into what is called mastabas. We will show you. A mastaba is nothing but a rectangular shaped thing. The, originally, the kings were burying them, uh -huh. but then they start to go towards the pyramids. All right. W There's one other. You see, were you going to say something about the, uh, the boat? The boat house. That's very important. Yeah. What, what is the boat? Well, you, the you can see the museum. house near the pyramid at the, in the farthest distance out that there. Smooth the area that smooth yeah. area there. Yeah. Right at the base. That yeah. is actually a housing for a boat that is 140 feet long. That is, it's called Khufu's boat. It was buried in a, in a pit. A wooden boat, really? A wooden mm -hmm. boat. A royal barge. A, a royal barge, yeah. and it's 140 feet long. Now, by comparison, you have uh, uh, Captain Cook's ship, uh, the Endeavor that he was sailing on was 106 feet long. So you have a 140-foot boat in that, reconstructed from the lumber and uh, that was buried, that it was disassembled, and and uh, buried in this boat pit, and it's now been reconstructed so you can see what it looks like. All right. In other words, they used to take this boat, disassemble it, yes. pull it down, and then when they need, reassemble it. Yes. Not a piece missing. Wow. It run from 190 feet long to four inches long. Yes. Wow. Yes. Now, is this land pretty much the same as it was uh, during the time that these pyramids were constructed? Yes, sir. Aket, Aket Khufu, the horizon of Khufu except for the stones that they dug out and the wind that blows this sand back and forth it is as it was yeah. all right now. one thing though this is the west 
and everything yes. is symbolical west bank. in it. This is the West Bank. Yes. This is where you go when you die. The sun sets in the West. So That's symbolically, right. you go to this is the barren place where you uh, make your final resting place. But you're yeah. gonna, you, you will rise again. Uh -huh. and, and when you rise again, this will be, you will become, you, when you die, you're Osiris. But when you rise again, you will be Horus. That's Just right. like the sun rises again, but it rises in the east. That's right. So most of your living quarters, your temples, were built on the east That's side right. of the river. You're this living. is a cemetery. We are standing in a cemetery right, right now. Necropolis. So the necropolis. Cemetery, a necropolis is right over here on this side. Necro. Royal cemetery. And what you do That's not see thing. under the sand are tombs and temples. Yeah. Uh, Burial. Uh, burial places. It's an enormous thing. I, one evening I had a chance to go in and out of this. It's an extraordinary thing. But Gil, what is important is the concept that came out of this culture and civilization. They read the laws of nature. They were able to do what they did because they began to scientifically and systematically study the laws of nature, science, physics. And you see this development, East and West Bank, reflects the laws of nature. The rising sun in the east, the setting sun in the west, the renewal of the life cycle. And so the Africans, it was very simple. If you understand the, the laws of nature that they operated on, you can see why they built this culture. And you can understand, as we mentioned before, that everything was tied in spiritually and everything was related. There was no separation of church and state. Church and state was spiritually connected because you had to have spiritual development in order to rule. You couldn't eat without washing yourself. That's you right. Eat without saying a prayer. And what was beautiful is that the whole society was built around concepts of law and ethical and moral principles that everybody was accountable to. The high priests and the pharaoh everybody was accountable to these laws and these ethical principles and they're built into our culture which we don't understand today in terms of the scale of justice mm -hmm. in terms of the whole question of eternal Ma salvation in terms of the question of the ma'at in other words the justice holding you accountable to a plea yeah, out yeah, of the last judgment scene of, of the ancient Africans of the Nile. Yes, There's so much you. of the culture. In, in the tomb of a... We have a papyrus with the scale of justice on it. And, and it's called the scale of justice. Scale of, there, Dr. Ben, are these, do these pyramids have a plumb line? Are they true north, south, northwest? Not a fraction of a degree off. Like that day, somebody came and make a measurement, and they said it wasn't the pyramids off; the wall went off. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything. But better. Gil, that's why we have to restore and rescue, and certainly take back the pyramids. The pyramids are so important to understanding the opening of the culture of the Nile. The pyramids have to be restored to African peoples because they reveal the, the symbolically, because they reveal that strength and beauty that came out of this culture that laid the foundation that allowed the Greeks to rise, that allowed the ancient Hebrews to rise, that allowed other cultures to rise, that even inspired Islam to rise the way it did. Now when African peoples tap back into this cultural system, they will have a new day in history. yours at this point. And here is a, a, a view from a profile. The Sphinx have different kinds of uh, tales spoken about it. In the first place, the word Sphinx is a misnomer. Sphinx is a female statue in Greece. And when the Greeks came here, they thought they were looking at a sphinx, a female statue. But in fact, as you notice, this is the head of a man. In fact, it is the head of the second pharaoh that built the second pyramid that you saw there. The first was his father, Khufu. The second is this man, Kapra. And it's the head of this African and the body of a lion the wiseness of the man, and the strength of the And then there is the, right in front of it, you see an altar. Yes. And at the bottom of this altar, you equally see a stella, called the dream stella. Mm -hmm. It is supposed to be a stella put there by Thutmosis the fourth. When he was passing, the sphinx is supposed to be covered up by sand, and the sphinx cried out to him, if you clear me away, I will make you a king of kings. And Thutmose cleared the sphinx away, and yet he 
later he became the king of Egypt. He was the son of Queen Hatshepsut, the only queen king in history. But learn more about this thing, which the Arabs called Abu el Hal. When they came, they thought it was a kind of a devil, Abu el Hal. As a matter of fact, the street going down from here is called Abu el Hal Street, the Sphinx Street. It is said to be the nose was destroyed by Napoleon, who ordered his men to load the face off with cannon fire because they looked the Af like look at the African looks. And then again, there's a story that the Mamelukes, when they came, instead blew the face off. And then it depends on who's speaking. There are numerous stories of how they blew the face, but but all of them blew it off because they didn't look like its African looks. You could still see the lips. The nose is gone, the beard is gone, but you could still see the lips, who it is. Since they said that Africans got thick lips, of course, they're African with thin lips and thin lips, and, and thin nose or pointed nose, but there's no doubt that this largest of human sculptor, one piece is cut from that rock. Here was where the quarry was to get a certain amount of rocks for the building of the pyramids. And this was a pyramid. By the way, those three major pyramids you see, and the other two small ones, were not the only ones in this complex. There were 16. The Arabs, the early Arabs, used these stones for building a mosque and home of the wealthy. It was not until as late as and was that when it was outlawed, that you cannot take stone from the pyramid to build it, either mosque or homes of the wealthy. The Sphinx go back to the fourth dynasty. Kafra was one of the pharaohs of the fourth dynasty. What happened here is that these pyramids, at least the story of the Jews building the pyramids in no condition could they have built these because these are before the birth of the first Jew, Abraham. These go back to the, to the old kingdom. Before the coming of the Hyksos in the 13th dynasty, Abraham was born until the Africans here were already in the 13th dynasty. This is the fourth dynasty. This is what you see at the fourth end up to the sixth dynasty. There are 72 pyramids. The last were built. In the same dynastic period, Abraham was born. Therefore, the Jews could not have been slaves, been working on a single pyramid in all of Egypt, not one pyramid. And these are the folklore. But notice you don't find this in the Bible. You don't find anything about the Jews building pyramids in the Bible. The Jewish Bible, the book of Exodus says, building cities and things. These were not in the city. Of the Nile developed from the south as its major source. And in those 33 royal tombs, they found over 4,000 objects, many of them directly relating to later pharaonic development in Egypt. And one of them, particularly important, was an incense burner. A very small object, but on it was inscribed, incised, cut in the symbols of later pharaonic rule. Including the Let's take first dynasty. There not much was going on in the second dynasty. Not a lot was going on in the third dynasty. I mean, in the second dynasty. Then all of a sudden, in the third dynasty, uh, you begin to get this rapid expansion of things, which is where you get this pyramid here. You get this. Uh, pyramid at uh, uh, at Saqqara that we're looking at. Imhotep designed this pyramid. At any rate, this is uh, uh, one of the things about this particular designer of the pyramid, Imhotep, is he's also known to the Greeks as their father of medicine. They changed his name as they did the names of many pharaohs, cities, towns, places uh, from committing or Egyptian names to Greek names. And so the Greeks, according to Herodotus and others, changed the name of uh, 
Imhotep to Escalapius. And, and all your physicians today in the United States, when they take their Hippocratic oath, will swear by this physician who designed this pyramid. So he was a multi-genius in that he did uh, not only architectural design and poetry and uh, statesmanship. He was Secretary of State at the same time. And uh, so here you had a person who mastered many, many disciplines. So just as this building represents a state-of-the-art technology in the 2700 BC, uh, Imhotep himself represents the state-of-the-art in human thinking and has been seldom equal since that time. Now you said this was, uh, tell me a little bit about this period. Well, it's uh, four, five, six mastabas that you can see. And uh, they, this is the burial pattern in pre-dynastic time. You used to dig a hole in the ground and bury the body and then cover it with a slab of, of rocks called uh, by, in the Arabic, uh, mastaba, which means simply a, a flat bench, usually rectangular in shape. And this pyramid is indeed rectangular in shape. Uh, but you get the pyramid effect by stacking mastabas on top of each other. But you still have the same function, just as this pyramid has a burial chamber and uh, there were two sarcophagi inside the burial chamber. There were other uh, pieces of pottery, uh, very little writing at all inside the pyramid. Uh, and uh, I guess that's uh, most of what I want to mention what, at this what point. What year was this? It was 2700 BC, 27. in the 28th century BC. So this is one of the earliest? This is the oldest uh, pyramid in the world. It's the oldest stone structure in the world. Mm -hmm. And this whole complex then represents a type of architecture in stone that is um, unlike anything that had ever been seen anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And who were the builders of this? Where these, were the these were the native African people who built this because you remember that we're in the first 12 dynasty still. In fact, this is at the, in the third dynasty, so this is really in the old kingdom, uh, which would be the oldest kingdom in the world. And at that time there, this is pre-heroic Greece. You know, for example, the heroic age in Greece is somewhere around 2000 BC. And so this civilization will function for another 750 years before there will be anything resembling a Greek, even in mythology. And uh, so this, this places us well at the forefront of civilization. They were native people, they were black African people who did this work. All the carvings, uh, paintings, and everything will verify that. pyramids, really the great three pyramids. It is a pyramid, even though it's hard for you to see it. It has collapsed because of the, probably the quality of the workmanship and the amount of time that went into it. It's important because it contains the oldest literature in the world of a religious nature, and uh, it's uh, called the pyramid text. Uh, several pyramids around here had carvings on the wall of ancient religious ideas, thoughts, usually prayers, praises, things like that. Uh, these are collected together and they form something known as the book of coming forth from darkness into light, or as some people call it, the book of the dead. Uh, this was all during the old kingdom. We're talking about a period back around 2500 BC. A little later during the new, the, I'm sorry, the middle kingdom, uh, the Writings, instead of being on the walls of pyramids, because they stopped building pyramids during that period, the writings would be on the coffins. So there's a whole set of literature called the coffin text. We have pyramid text, coffin text, and then papyri, which together keep repeating the same messages, praises to, to God, uh, prayers for things, offerings to the gods, and spells, and so forth. And it's that writing again that forms together a body of literature that dates back to approximately 5,000 years ago. In other words, it was in place at the founding of the committing uh, first dynasty in uh, first dynasty in Kemet. So uh, uh, we have uh, not only the oldest literature in the world, but 
what could be called the oldest Bible in the world. And indeed, we remember that Moses, according to Acts, the seventh chapter and the 22nd verse, was an Egyptian priest, learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. And of course, that meant he would have had to know what was on the walls of these pyramids. Uh, if Moses knew what was here, then we shouldn't be surprised to find that much of what's in Moses is uh, exactly like what came out in the ancient Kemetic religion. Uh, the Ten Commandments are only 10 of 42 negative confessions. Uh, the uh, uh, creation story, you know, that would already have been found in the ancient Kemetic literature. And uh, virtually all the symbols that would later be used by both the Hebrews and the Christians were already in place uh, uh, before, in the case of the Hebrews, they're already in place before Moses, and they're definitely already in place before Christianity. So this then is the African foundation of the world's major religion, not just Christianity, but the, the foundation of all the religions in the world is centered right here at this spot. I'm mentioning here one type of literature, which is the uh, uh, book of coming forth from darkness into light, or the uh, biblical texts that are much like the Bible. There were other types of literature. There were several different genres of literature in ancient Egypt. And so it's the forerunner of all those things. It's the forerunner of the short story. It's the forerunner of the epic story. It's the forerunner of poetry. It's the forerunner of prayers and sacred praises. It's the forerunner of Bibles. It's the forerunner then of wisdom literature. Uh, and the wisdom literature that we're talking about would be like that that you find in the Bible, Songs of Solomon, uh, which imitates in Psalms, Songs of Solomon, imitates uh, such papyri as the sayings of Amenemot, uh, the teachings of Patahotep. You'll find both in terms of style and also in terms of content or substance that this, this uh, material is all found right here in the Nile Valley. It'll either be found here in some of these pyramids that we found on the pyrite, that we found on the coffin, or taken all together. And we have not even begun to exhaust that body of literature. How do you feel about the education, American education, now that you've been here in Africa? Well, I think it's in this, it uh, misses a lot of us uh, understanding about uh, relating to like us because it gives us a lot of information but it doesn't relate to us uh, this knowledge in Egypt does you know everything that uh, my ancestors studied was related to us but the stuff that they teach us in regular Western society the stuff that they teach us in school doesn't really relate to us. It's, you know, we don't get any real understanding about ourselves. And I think it misses a lot of, you know, a lot of important things. It's opened my mind to a lot of uh, different spiritual things. It's given me a, you know, pride within myself to go forth and try to do better for myself and try to help my people out in the future. And it's giving me faith in my people because I know if they did all of this at once, then they could do it again. And that, that gives me faith to go forth and do my best and try to help my people out in the long, you know, in the long run. Hold on. Young man, come here. How, how do you feel being here in Africa? What, uh, what did these things that you are looking at, what do they say to you? Do they say anything? Yes. What do they say? Um, they say that we have a great history. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So are you, do you, who built these things? Our African ancestors. And how does that make you feel? Hey, now, come on. Makes me feel that I have the same energy. Overwhelmed by the engineering feat that moved this marvelous structure here, but I'm also in awe of the creativity of the original people who constructed uh, these temples uh, with with the no, turn around, look at the camera. With the, camera. With okay. the uh, inscriptions, with the stories of their life and their culture and their belief. I'm also impressed with the deep 
yearning that each new people have for their spirituality, which they have superimposed over the spirituality of the people who came before them, but with the same great yearning to identify to a higher being, to a higher calling. I so much wish that our youngsters could see this and be made aware of the fact that for generations and generations untold, before their existence, people knew that they had to identify with worship and look up to a higher being, a cosmic spirit. Uh, our youngsters are so alienated, and I think if they could realize that not only are they powerless, but all of the people before them were powerless, even the great kings were powerless, and in their powerlessness, they sought the succor and the support of the gods, and they worshiped them, and they came to them with offerings in order to enable them to be the great leaders that they were. I think there's a very potent message in that for young people. Each one that we see is greater than the one before. Yes. Um, how has African Americans been robbed by the American education? Oh. How do you feel about it? Oh, I think we're walking that, along the shore. Uh, when we when we talk about the physical abuse of our people and the fact that America's economic base was built on the backs of African Americans and Europeans prosperity was built on the back of the prostitution of Africa that's only the physical part but when we realize how we have been robbed of our right to know the greatness of our people in terms of their intellect in terms of their engineering skills in terms of their genius that's it. even more it. thank you it. that is even more of a crime because you can get over physical defeat but to lose the sense of your potency and of your power intellectually I think is an even greater loss. And that's what has happened to our people in thinking that all of the greatness classics is Greek and Roman, and everything that we know is primitive and savage. The implications of that is horrendous. It's a, it's a worse crime than the Holocaust.